Okay then, so back to the program. 2024, of course, marks a 100th anniversary of Pashukanis's Magnus Magnum Opus, Lauren Max and the General Theory. The organizers of today's inaugural event thought it would be important to celebrate, but also to explore the developments of Pashukanian thought in legal studies and beyond. And in light of the resurgence of, though it's probably established now, Marxist and neo-Marxist approaches to law, along with the general temperament against, or at least unsettling, doctrinal and formalist orthodoxies in legal research, Pashukanis demands not just another look, but serious consideration as a formidable legal scholar worthy of its sustained interrogation and also inclusion in many of our jurisprudence modules. His rich, textured work on legal form provide an important departure point from stolid instrumentalist accounts of law prevalent among many Soviet legal thinkers at the time, thinking about the relationality between law and capitalism. His thesis of law as a historically specific form of social regulation bound both theory and history and sought to attach the form, not the content, of law to the ascendancy of the commodity form in emergent capitalist economies. Not only did his work say something about form, the state, juridical subjectivity, but also about laws withering away. And by necessary implication, that question that much of the legal left ask, can law be transformative? Can we have a proletarian law? Which we could say Pashakanis would comfortably answer in the negative. And with events taking place at the ICJ today, important though they are in holding potential violations of the Genocide Convention in Israel's 75-year occupation and settler colonization of Palestine, Pashukanis might, at the very least, offer a measured skepticism of an issue that fundamentally requires a political solution for Palestinian liberation. And I think for further treatment of this, Rob's work on strategy and tactics is instructive. Now, before I pass it on to Rob, to say a little bit more about Pashukanis, a few short comments about today and the year ahead. Uh, though Queen Mary and uh, Liverpool have organised this event, there were many other researchers across the UK and the world who uh, similarly wanted to commemorate this important work, and we thank them for their time. The idea, therefore, was for us and the um, Critical Approaches to International Criminal Law Unit um, to uh, organise uh, this inaugural event, and then having met with other scholars over the past several months, for those colleagues and colleagues elsewhere to organize similar events elsewhere in the world. And with the help of the Legal Form blog, of which myself, Rob and Ava are editors, we hosted a page which we hope will be a resource for all of the events that will take place on this important text. And to that end, if you do want to organize a lecture or a workshop at your institution, please do let us know. We know that there will certainly be two events that will take place this year on Pashukanis. One in uh, Lund, which will be on the 26th and 27th of September, uh, that uh, Carl, who is here somewhere, uh, is kindly um, uh, organizing with colleagues. And hopefully um, another event uh, in Sao Paulo, which our uh, fantastic PhD student, uh, Fernando, has helped to uh, organize. Uh, details of this and all future events uh, are on the Legal Form blog, uh, under a special page titled 100th Anniversary of the General Theory of Law and Marxism. Um, and also to all of the speakers at this conference and workshop, we would like to invite you to contribute uh, a piece for the blog on your presentation, obviously if time and energy permits, uh, and I'll chase this up via email. Okay then, over to you, Rob. Um, okay, can people hear me? Don't even if you use mic. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tanzel. That was really good. It was so comprehensive that you've made me realize I've got nothing left to say, but we should have planned that better. I will just very briefly say a couple of words, uh, do some personal spiel nonsense, and then we can launch on with the thing personally, well, properly. So um, Tanzel gave a very measured kind of like gestured kind of thing. I'm going to just say a couple of like, personal anecdotes, because I feel more of a, of, a, of a personal connection to a dead Marxist, Bolshevik, legal jurist for some reason. And essentially, probably 
if Pachacanis hadn't have existed, I wouldn't be where I am today. Like, part, I, I, there was a time in my life when I was, in fact, the second Google search result for Pachacanis. Those, those times have gone, alas. Maybe it, it's a good thing they're gone. It means more people are talking, but it was a nice thing to, to do. And, you know, for years, I had a kind of Marxist blog on legal theory, which um, was linked to Pachacanis. And that's part of the reason that I ended up getting my, my PhD. And so Pachacanis, I think, has been central and important to many, many people who accidentally decided to do law degrees and realized that their lives were over, but then were able to, through his work, understand the kind of political and economic interconnections between law and the kind of social formation in which we live. So, I mean, Tanzel has already given us a kind of insight into the basic um, like legal and theoretical moves that Pachacanis makes. And of course, I'm sure most people are aware that he was a kind of Bolshevik jurist who joins the Bolshevik party later like after the revolution. And he becomes really central in creating a set of kind of legal and political doctrines, which inform for a relatively brief period, the kind of Soviet approach to the law. And these necessarily, as many things did in the era, had significant political consequences as well. Because the thing that's important to say, and again, Tanzel has already kind of flagged this up for us, is that the kind of seemingly theoretical questions that Patrick Connors was asking had a direct and important relevance to the kind of organized political program of a, of a socialist transition and cashed out in that way. And it is indeed for that reason that at very many points, the kind of things that he was saying, well, got him killed in the end, but very importantly had these kind of directions of political struggles. So, as Tanzel has alluded to, what we are doing is celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication of the general theory of law and Marxism. Now, obviously, Pashikhan has published many things in his lifetime, some of them translated, some of them not, but it's widely understood that the general theory of law and Marxism is the kind of centerpiece of his theoretical development, which lays out his major kind of intellectual and political contribution. And as Tanzel has said, what Pashikhan is did here was to argue for a very particular relationship between the commodity form and the legal form. Now, I think it's worth pulling out a couple of dimensions of this, which are very significant in terms of like Marx's theory about the law and what is so important and distinctive about that. So the first, again, has already been alluded to, is that what Pashikhanis presents us with is a specific Marxist theory of law. Most Marxist accounts of law in varying degrees, have taken the existence of law for granted. They haven't tended to historicize it, to situate it, to ask what we might call jurisprudential questions. And that becomes Pashikhanis' important starting point. Right? He says, look, what we have to do is think about law as a specific social relationship that exists in particular historical circumstances. But indeed, he goes further and says it's a particular mystified form of a social relationship. And that's important, right? The second thing which Pashikhanis does, which is very important, is that he emphasizes really continually the kind of dynamic dispute-based nature of the law. Some people will occasionally come to Pashikhanis and think of him as being a very static thinker. But in fact, Pashikhanis insists and stresses that it's in the moment of dispute that law crystallizes and properly emerges as a form of social regulation. So law is not a thing that magically comes into being in a static way, but emerges in the context of these disputes and disagreements. Right. And all of this means that he can ask this big question. Under what circumstances does regulation assume a legal character? And it is these circumstances of dispute between people who have been, in some sense, interpolated as commodities. So there are some misconceptions, I think, or tensions in Pashikhanas, which it's worth flagging up now and which may play out in the context of this, this later discussion. In the context of the theory that Pashkanis outlines of the kind of relationship between the commodity form and the legal form, people often will criticize Pashkanis for having no theory of pre-capitalist law. It's worth saying, as people don't seem to understand sometimes, commodity exchange precedes capitalism. So on Pashkanis' account, it's perfectly sensible to have law which precedes capitalism too. But Pashkanis goes on to argue, as Marx himself does, the commodity form is to capitalism, as in a sense, these scattered legal relations are to the legal form. Not fully there, not fully systematized, and not realizing itself in that way. That also leads to a second important point, which is that very frequently what people want to do is say, oh, well, in Pachucanis, there's this mechanical connection between the growth of commodity exchange and then eventually law coming into being as being significant. That's true, but Pachucanis is also 
pains to stress, it's not just a kind of quantitative transformation from some commodity exchange to more commodity exchange and therefore more law. Instead, Pachikarnas is very clear on this. It's with the flowering of commodity exchange and the qualitative transformations that take place with the birthing of capitalist social relations as totality, that law moves away from the kind of residues and specific things and becomes this kind of much more abstract universal mode. And it's important to keep that in context. That also leads us up to another point, which I think is very important, which is that there's a tension at points between people who say, well, Pachikarnas has this very superstructural account of law. But actually, again, if you read him, it's much more complicated than that. It's quite clear that on the one hand, Pachikarnas is adopting this idea of law as a specific mystified form of capitalist social relations, which therefore does not mean, oh, here's capitalist social relations, here's law. They're different. Instead, he is talking about law as a form of appearance of capitalist social relations, which in many respects is constitutive of how those relationships go. And that's very important too. So those three things are important because they help us to understand that I think that Pachikarnas is kind of the vulgar account of Pachikarnas is often not great and not compelling in terms of what he's doing. But this also flags up, I think, what's a really significant point, which Tanzel has already alluded to, which is that there is an importance to having this specific Marxist theory of law, this account of law as a specific social relation. And that's because that has immediate and important practical consequences about what the future looks like, how things will go, but also what we do in the present day. And again, as Tanzel has alluded to, we've seen in the context of what's happening right now in the International Court of Justice, which I'm sure some people are avidly watching, to whom I say, just, just wait for the summary, guys, and it'll be okay. But we can see here the ways in which the legal form as a specific mystified form of social relations will end up generating its own particular modes of political action, which may or may not be useful for us. I mean, may not is mostly the answer to that. And it's important for us to keep that in mind in terms of thinking about what it is that we can do with law. Because the importance of Pachikarnas' theorization of the legal form, and why this isn't just something that can be brushed aside, is because it does not necessarily say you can or cannot use law, but it says what are the conditions under which it can be used? What are the sacrifices you have to make? And what does that mean to do to do so. So rather than, than just thinking of him as a kind of nihilist as people have done, understanding it in this context, right, shows us both the political significance, but also the kind of nuance that goes on. So that's just a couple of things on the table, but hopefully what we're gonna do throughout this whole day is have these kind of discussions, working things through, but also talking about lacunae and problems. And so I think now we'll just let the first kind of go on with it and I'll uh, sit back down. Thanks. Who's on the first panel? Yes, you need to come to the front now. Thank you. Hey. So we don't waste any time. I'll just introduce the Panelists, as they're getting settled, if that's okay, is that okay with you? Yeah, I'll take silence as approval. Um, we are here to talk about um, the historical and theoretical legacies of Patrick Harris, and we've had a, a, a quick introduction to the, the theoretical significance, which I'm sure some of our panelists will uh, be locating their contributions in. We have Bernard Bonfield from York, who, amongst other things, is the author of a critical theory of economic compulsion coming out in March. I thought I would just uh, promote the book before you, you do, but you feel free to as well, Anna. Um, thank you very much. Ah, yeah. I'm very sorry, I just forgot the golden rule, which is we all have to wear this because we're being recorded. Can everyone hear that through the loudspeakers? Good. Um, and a number of other books that Werner has made important contributions to the strong state and the free economy uh, comes to mind. We have Bill Boring on his left, who is uh, author of Law, Rights and Ideology in Russia, Degradation of the International Legal Order. And many of you will know his contribution and his work and also his, the way his work is rooted in Pashikanis. We have Carl Willen, 
who probably has written the most recent thing on Pachacanus, I guess, because it was published online in December, right? The piece in Capital and Class on why Pachacanus was right, which seems to be, I don't know if you're going to talk about that, but I think uh, we won't see much dissent uh, from, from, from that position. And Carl's also written Interpreting the Haitian Revolution as, as well as other key works. So all three of you, um, you're very welcome here. And I am going to propose although we haven't discussed this beforehand, that we go in the order that you're on the the um, the list as it stands. So that would mean Werner going first. If that's okay, then Bill, then Cal. Thank you very much. Um, it, you can stand if you like. The main thing is that you wear this. Okay. Yeah. I stand. Then I can see the problem. So it's working, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm not a lawyer, never studied law. That's my qualification, as it were, or disqualification. I um, have worked in the area of political economy. And in my talk, I will raise issues of political economy. So I will talk about dreadful concepts like production and surplus value, economic bondage, and things of that sort. But they are important because Pashikanis argues that law is not some universal historical concept. It's a concept that belongs to a specific society. It's a concept that belongs to specific groups, social relations. And for him, these relations are characterized by the commodity, by the commodity form of wealth. And with that, we are right at the start of Marxist capital, and it's therefore under, uh, on us, as it were, to refer to Marx's conception of law in order to understand Pashukanis better, but also in order to, as it were, show where future research, in my view at least, about Pashukanis can move. So I will talk a little bit about Marx, buying and selling of labor power, surplus value uh, production, and economic bondage, and what he calls the same old touch of every conqueror who buys from the conquered the commodities with the money he has stolen from them. That's the beginning of the chapter 24 in Marx's Capital. And I will end with a very brief last second, as it were, political conclusion. So for Pashukan is then, he characterizes law as a bourgeois form. And by doing so, he is clearly relating law to a definite material content. And he calls that con content in a commodity exchange society, or the commodity form. The form in which wealth appears in capitalist society is the form of the commodity. Yet, what, I mean, what really is meant by it is not so clear to me, at least not on my reading of, of Pashu Khan. You see, he mentions this, he goes into depths, but he never really, in my view, gets to it. And this point was also raised in the 70s by Tony Negri in 74 and a German guy called Oskar Negt in 1975. They accuse him wrongly, in my view, that Pashokanis locates the origin of law in the sphere of circulation, i.e. in the sphere of the market, in the sphere of exchange. And they say, no, no, that is wrong. It ought to be located in the sphere of production because it is production where wealth is in fact produced in the form of surplus value. It is the extraction of surplus value, they argue, that has to be the starting point of the analysis of legal form and not circulation. So what I would like to do is in fact look at production and how legal form relates to production. And what happens to legal form if you bring in surplus value extraction? What happens to the idea of legal form? This so pleasant, so splendid idea of equality before the law, freedom of property, freedom to dispose of your property, 
in pursuit of no other interest than your own. And equality means no racial discrimination, no gender discrimination, no discrimination at all in the best possible world. It is the Eden of human rights. It is the Eden of the innate rights of man. Man here is a capital M in terms of der Mensch, die Menschheit, das Menschlein, all of us. That's the idea of this equality. That's the idea of, a, of, a, of the idea of legal form. How is it affected? What happens to it if you bring in surplus value extraction? And a clue of how that might work is, I'm quoting you from Marx now, about the labor contract. The clue here is the constant sale and purchase of labor power is the form, he says. The content is the constant appropriation of the products of labor by the capitalist without an equivalent. So there seems to be appropriation of unpaid labor. There seems to be unpaid labor as a source of capitalist wealth. And yet, that unpaid labor manifests itself in the exchange relationship as an exchange between equivalents, between people who are equals before the law, who are in freedom, at liberty, who are, their property is protected and they exchange it in pursuit of their own interests. But underlying it, the form of wealth, is the idea of unpaid labor. So how does that affect this situation of the law? First, when Marx talks about the labor contract, and he refers there in that chapter explicitly, explicitly to the Eden of human rights, the historical presupposition is the existence of a class of laborers who are free in the double sense, free from the means of subsistence and free to trade as owners of properties. And what they exchange, their property, is the property of labor power. And he goes into this a little bit by saying capital and labor, money bags, the owner of money on the one side and the dispossessed doubly free labor on the other. They engage, as it were, as equals, as liberty, in freedom, each pursuing their own interests. These interests are opposed, but they find, as it were, a form of convergence in the form of a contract. Most importantly, their exchange on the labor market is an exchange based on an equivalence, equivalent exchange. The worker flocks his or her property, labor power, in order and gets for it what it is worth. It's not cheated. That's the assumption. The assumption of Marx to explain exploitation is the best possible world. It's the innate, innate rights of man, the Eden of human rights, where equivalent is exchanged for equivalent. He thereby determines the value of labor power as the socially necessary labor time required for the worker to exist and reproduce. In case you find the concept difficult, just think about the living wage as a sort of entry into the problematic. You need the living wage in order not to die, to exist, to reproduce, and to return on the labor market ready and able to work. So on that basis, then, he goes into the production process. Labor power has been exchanged freely, not coercion, not personal dependency. There might be economic compulsion, but that is impersonal. The labor contract has been signed. Worker and capitalist are treated as equals, despite their inequality in property. But beyond that, they enter now the production process. And the, bun, the one who buys labor power has now acquired the right to consume it. The one who sold labor power has relinquished his or her possession of it. The capitalist, therefore, has the right, has the acquired right to consume it. And he has the acquired right 
to consume it by transforming, as it were, into a werewolf, into a vampire. These are terms Marx uses in that context. For him or her, labor power has only meaning if it does meet the purpose for which it was bought, namely to produce extra value. So you put a certain amount of money into the pocket of the worker in terms of wage, and clearly you want that money back, and you want something in addition, since otherwise there's no need for you to part with your money. And this in addition, he calls surplus value. It is the value that has been produced during the total length of the working day over and above the value of the commodity labor power. That for Marx constitutes surplus value. Now, there's a fight, he says, in the labor process between two equal rights. The capitalist has acquired the right to consume labor power by making the worker work for surplus value, for profit. But the laborer him or herself has also a right, the right not to be consumed because the worker sold his or her labor power with the express purpose to make a living and not to be destroyed as a consequence of the werewolf hunger for, for his or her labor. Right against right. Right against right, Marx argues, the solution to that struggle between right versus right is the state who sets down the rules of the game. The rules of the game means a reduction in the hours of work during imperial Victorian England. That didn't make imperial Victorian England socialist just because it made a decision to restrict the right of the capitalist to exploit the worker for how many hours necessary or possible for the interests of the worker. Now, very quickly, simple reproduction. The worker received a wage. What does he do with it? He spends it. For what? For the commodities that he or she has produced for the capitalist. For the wage returns into the pockets of the capitalist, and the worker consumes the means of subsistence that he or she herself has produced. The capitalist is enriched. The worker has eaten and returns dispossessed again onto the labor market. In that context, Marx argues, the, the worker belongs to the capitalist before he or she has sold their commodity. He explains that as economic bondage. The worker cannot run away because of her freedom from the means of subsistence. So there we have the concept of economic bondage, yet, the Eden of human rights, the legal forms, the splendid categories of freedom, of equality, have not been violated in any way. In the next chapter, very briefly, I know it's only a minute and a half now. In the next chapter, he looks at accumulation. And accumulation means that the surplus value that has been extracted from the worker is reinvested into the into the capitalist process of production. So the worker produced an addition in value, which has been appropriated by the capitalist, and with that money, with that value, the capitalist buys another man with a capital M. And he says, but it's just the same old dodge as every conqueror who buys from the conquered the commodities with the money he has stolen of them or from them. So legal form then is a legal form of inequality. It is a legal form of exploitation. It is a legal form of economic bondage. And it is a legal form of the same old dodge as every conqueror who treats the conquered as an equal before the law while it's paying for their services with the money that has been stolen from them. So when, when Parkwani insists that the legal form complements commodity fetishism, that means that legal form mediates in the form of contract exploitation, domination, economic bondage. To conclude, 
The left now keeps fighting for distributive justice, ostensibly to make our capitalist reality to conform with the pleasant oath of its promise, freedom, equality, etc. This is not an argument against redistributive justice, inequality and pay and conditions, and the struggle against discrimination of all kind. Far from it. However, with Pashukanis, I have argued that inequality, exploitation, domination, discrimination, and economic bondage belong to the concept of legal form and its normative values. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thanks so much to Tansel and Rob for organizing this uh, brilliant event. And it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I'm in the session on history. So there will be a bit of history. China, very good to see you. Um, the, the edition which most of us saw way back uh, when Pashagon is made his appearance in England was the edition edited by Chris Arthur in 1978. And that's still around. The translation is by Barbara Einhorn. And it's a translation of the translation into German of Pashaganis, which appeared in 1929. And I'm not sure who the translator was. It may have been Pastor himself, of course, at that time. But in any event, the Barbara Einhold translation misses most of the footnotes. In <clears throat> 1980, there was another translation by Peter Mags, and that's the one which appears on the Marxist.org. And there's a footnote saying, but if you want to see the footnotes to Pashakanis's third edition, then you need something. Oh, can I have the book? So I've got hold of this. And this was a volume from 1951 on Soviet legal philosophy. And that includes a translation of Pashakanis by Hugh W. Babb, who did the other translations, with all of the footnotes. So I say now, if anyone wants to see it, I've scanned it, and you can see all of the footnotes, which are almost all to German authors. So on the history side, as we know, Pashaganis was born in 1891. In 1909, when he was 18 years old, he started studying law at St. Petersburg. It obviously didn't suit him because in 19, 1910, when he was 19, he went to Germany. And he was in Germany right up until the start of the First World War. And actually, he studied for his PhD in Munich um, at the university there. And his thesis was on statistics of legal infractions in labor protection. So that, that was what he was doing. At the age of 23 in 1914, he returned to uh, Russia and uh, was around in the revolution. 1917, he became a revolutionary judge. But from 1920 to 1923, he was the head deputy head of the economic law department at the Soviet Russian Foreign Affairs uh, Department. And actually, in 1920 to 21, he was in Berlin and was one of the main negotiators for Russia, Soviet Russia, for the Treaty of Rapallo, where, to the horror of people like Lord George, 
there was a treaty between Germany and Soviet Russia, and a Srikut treaty, which included the opportunity uh, for the defeated German armed forces, which were supposed to have been disbanded, to train in Russia. And <clears throat> so that was taking place during the 1920s. And Pashikhanis wrote the text of the general theory in Berlin in 1920-21. So there he was, having been a student in Germany, PhD from Munich, and when you look at the translation, or well, you look at the original Russian, or at this 1951 translation, you will find that most of the references are to people like Kelsen, uh, to German authorities. So as he pointed out himself, uh, later on, in 1929, 1930, when he retracted his theories in the general theory, he said that when he was writing this text in Berlin, he, had, he was on his own. He had no contacts at that time with, uh, the, with uh, Russia, or very few. And so... <clears throat> This is an argument mainly with German legal theory. And I think it's hard to understand it except in that context. It's a heroic work, of course. I think it's the only serious attempt to write a Marxist theory of law. And of course, Marx and Engels themselves were very clear that you could not have socialist law and nor could you have a socialist theory of law. And they were both very clear that workers can and should make legal demands, as they did, for example, for the 10-hour day. And that's quite a bit of uh, volume one of capital. And legal demands are extremely important. But that does not mean that you have socialist law or a socialist theory of law. And of course, uh, as has already been mentioned, uh, Pashikhanis, when he returned to Soviet Russia, completed the general theory in 1923. It was published in 1924 and went into its third edition in 1929. And of course, his theory was that law would cease to exist with capitalism. And therefore, <clears throat> what he taught and this you will find in the articles by John Hazard, who attended his courses in Russia. And he was actually director of the Institute of Soviet Construction and Law from 1931 to 1937, uh, was that um, law would be replaced by technical administration. And under his leadership, civil law was no longer taught. Where there was an absolute collision, was in the fact that in 1921, Lenin, having seen that the world revolution was not taking place, and that uh, in Lenin's view, so socialism in one country was not possible, uh, you had the new economic policy. And so Pashikhanis was in a position where he was advocating the end of law at the same time as adoption of the new economic policy meant a lot of law. And the Russian Civil Code, which was introduced on the German model in the middle of the 19th century, was reintroduced by Goshbar. And so in that period, um, law then became um, necessary for having the form of capitalism in Russia. So Pashigarnis reached the pinnacle of his success in 1936, when he became Deputy People's Commissar for Justice, and Pashigarnis was chair of the drafting committee for the 1936 Stalin Constitution, which he and Bukharin and others thought would actually introduce rights into Soviet Russia. And we know what happened to Bukharin. And Pashikhanis himself 
was arrested at the beginning of 1937 and sentenced to death on the 4th of September. During the period uh, from uh, 1930, he made a complete recantation, wrote a hallelujah for Stalin in 1932, and during the period uh, when he was director of the Institute for Soviet Construction and Law, uh, he was a committed Stalinist. So I think this is really in order to grasp what he was doing with the general theory, which I think is an amazing and extraordinary text and a heroic text, I think to do the impossible, but nonetheless, there it is. And that's why we all talk about it to this day. One has to bear in mind that it was written in the context of his being a Soviet legal advisor in Berlin and writing it in Berlin, in Germany, in relation to uh, German scholarship. So again, I will send you the uh, scanned version. Uh, I'm sorry for being uh, scholastically nitpicky, probably. But the more I've dug into Pashagan, it's the more fascinating I find this. And I did a lot of work for my book, which was mentioned in the libraries in Moscow, in particular with the early journals that Pashkanis was involved in, in the 1920s, which are not properly looked after. You're frightened to breathe anywhere near them because uh, they will disintegrate. But I find this absolutely fascinating and crucially important to where we are today as well, and what we can or can't do as lawyers. Put my uh, colors on the mask. Law is not emancipatory. Sorry about that. Thank you. You can hear me. <clears throat> you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers. Also, thanks uh, for ensuring that this kind of event will also spread in other contexts. Uh, that's really a great effort of you. Um, I did not plan to talk about why Pashukhanis was right, even though I have an article with a title. Uh, instead, I thought that I could use my time here. Uh, to first say something general about the contemporary reception of Pashkanis, uh, something very general because of, because of time limits, but, uh, and then I would like to ask also what we can uh, learn by uh, turning to uh, the earlier history of reception of Pashkanis. So maybe my talk will be between Bills and Werner's, <laughs> between theory and history in some sense. Uh, but so f first I, I want to repeat what you said, Tansil, uh, and stress that uh, uh, the trope, I mean, the trope, you might have heard it, that uh, Marxism and law is a, a marginalized area within Marxist theory. I really think that that trope is not defendable anymore. And I think it, it's enough to just look at the contemporary reception of, of Pashukanis to prove that point. Uh, and we have in English, we have a flourishing debate in German, uh, in French. Uh, I've also seen newly published work on Pashukanis in Spanish, in Portuguese, in Japanese, in Romanian, in Swedish. Uh, I'm sure you, you could add further examples <laughs> to this list of, of, of different language areas in which Pashukanis is discussed. Um, <clears throat> I do think. Uh, Antonio Negri, he wrote a new postface to an article from the 70s, but he wrote a postface in, in 2017. And he, 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 he stresses that we have to distinguish between two different revivals of, of Pashukanis thought, one in the 1960s and 70s and one contemporary. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm really in agreement with, with that point made by Negri already five or uh, six years ago soon, <laughs> uh, seven years soon. Um, uh, an interesting detail about the original uh, renaissance of Pashukanis, for me, uh, since I'm from Sweden, there is a, an edited, edited volume on, on, on Marxism and uh, the critique of right in Swedish from 1978. And the editors, they argue 
in that introduction that we will not translate Ashokanis into Swedish because everyone knows the details about Ashokanis. So we translate like contemporary uh, Soviet legal scholars from the 70s. They translate also uh, Norbert Reich, uh, uh, several articles on, on the early Soviet legal context. Uh, so, so, so we have had two uh, important revivals of, of Pashukhanis. And, and, and the, uh, the reason to why I think that it's important to acknowledge that, I mean, of course, it's nice that we have a contemporary reception in, in the thought of Pashukhanis for all of us who's here. Uh, but but I, I mainly think it's important because it makes possible a discussion uh, about continuities and discontinuities between the original revival of Pashukhanis thought in, in the 60s, 70s and the contemporary uh, debates. Uh, in turn, then, it also makes possible a discussion about strength and weaknesses when we compare the contemporary reception with the previous reception of, of Pashukhanis thought. Um, and of course, I, I would love to dig deeper into to, uh, these various uh, continuities and discontinuities that exist. Uh, uh, but I, I will have to end by offering one proposal about what we can learn from one single constant that I think is, is constant from the 60s until today. Uh, <clears throat> and the continuity I have in mind is the distinction between what Pashukanis calls, on the one hand, logical de deduction or uh, uh, he also uses the term dialectical development. And on the other hand, uh, the uh, historical evolution or historical process of the legal form. Uh, I mean, if looking at the theoretical legacy of, of Pashkanis, you can see different terms used. Uh, uh, you can see a distinction between logic and struggle, or uh, most commonly, I think, uh, a distinction between logic and history. Uh, and uh, so, so if you have a vantage point of the logic of the legal form, it means that you're interested in the legal form uh, in the same register as the ideal average of capital. And it also means then that you at least provisionally brackets issues of causation, processes, intentions, agency, uh, specific differences of the legal, of, of the elements of the legal form or the content of the legal form. Uh, and instead, you focus on what is uh, uh, what is the ideal average of, of the legal form in capitalism, um, and and I think that this distinction has been extremely important both in the original revival and in the contemporary revival of Pashkanis thought. Uh, I think it can be proved indirectly uh, in a number of ways. Uh, 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 for, for for instance, <clears throat> and just to offer a few examples from the original revival, it was very common that uh, scholars, both both uh, legal scholars and social theorists more generally, turned to Pashukanis in order to criticize Stalinist conceptions of, of, of strategy on the one hand and social democratic reformism on the other hand. It was also common that, and mainly, especially here in England, I think, it was common that you uh, you turned to Pashukanis and this abstract logic of the legal form in order to inform analysis of, of concrete strategy. Uh, and there you had the, the two alternatives of ultra-leftist reactions, reactions of the rule of law on the one hand, and uh, 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 some kind of less critical acceptance of, of the possibility to use the state for socialist politics on the other hand. Uh, less known, I think, is that also several criminologists turned to uh, to Pashukhanis in the 1970s in, uh, and the concept of the legal form and the most abstract parts of it uh, in order to criticize what they call the philosophy of marginalization, which they saw in French post-structuralism and, and the way in which uh, deviation and, and uh, marginality became romanticized as uh, a poten potential for resistance against capitalism, for example. And they criticized that on the one hand, and they also criticized the reformist and progress progressivist uh, belief in, 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 uh, in the state uh, as, as an instrument. Uh, from the present rev revival, I, I think that the distinction between logic and history can be proved indirectly uh, by the way in which uh, Pashkanis has been used in new ways uh, in order to intervene into debates about, in the context of, of the war on terror, 
uh, and also revolutions in the 21st century. Uh, I also think that uh, an important background of several debates in the field is the rise of red and green social movements in the wake of the financial crisis and also the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and here I'm especially thinking about discussions about the uh, uh, general equivalence and equality of the legal form on the one hand and social difference on the other hand, such as racialization and, and gender power relations, for example. I know this also ties into what you said, Werner. Um, directly, and I will end here and then come to a few conclusions. Directly, I think it's also quite easy to prove that the distinction between logic and history has been important during both, uh, uh, bo both revivals. And here I think that uh, Helmut Reichelt and, and uh, Heidi Gerstenberger and Joachim Hirsch uh, all uh, uh, made visible what is, what, was, what is at stake in different ways in texts from the early 1970s. Uh, and I thought that I could quote uh, Wilhelm uh, Reichelt, Helmut Reichelt here. Uh, and Reichel wrote that by secluding the logical order from history, we are, and here I quote, left with model-like and unhistorical method, which in its exclusion of all history is the equal of any bourgeois model building, but which in its attempt to be above history is painfully contemporary and precisely in this reveals itself to be eminently historic. And as I interpret Reichel and Gerstenberger and, and Hirsch, uh, I, I think that they try to warn about, about two dangers. On the one hand, a rigid separation between logic and history, saying that, well, uh, we can theorize the, the legal form at an abstract level, and uh, then political consequences can be whatever. Uh, they are fully contingent. But they also argue that we need the distinction between logic and history. Um, so um, I, I, I'm finished now. I have a few minutes, I, just yeah. a few comments. I have five minutes. Five minutes. Yes. But you don't have to take it. Bill didn't take it. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm free to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have three comments. We'll see if they take uh, if they take uh, five minutes. First, I, I just want to uh, to stress that I, uh, that this distinction between the first original revival and the contemporary revival of the photo Pashkanis is important, and I hope really that we'll see a lot of. Uh, articles uh, or even uh, bigger works uh, really systematically comparing those two contexts, both in terms of the political and ec economic conjuncture uh, of the two uh, di uh, different revivals, but also, of course, the content of uh, the theoretical and, and political content of them. Uh, second, then, in contrast to some or not a few critics of Pashukanis, I think that the, the legacy of this distinction between logic and history in the two revivals proves that uh, Pashukhanis did not defend a rigid separation, just privileging the logics. And I think, uh, Rob, you also emphasized this in another way in, in your introduction. Um, and uh, 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 so, so the distinction is highly relevant for both historical research and political strat strategy precisely on account of the abstract point of departure, only because of privileging the abstract logics of the legal form, it becomes relevant in very different historical conjunctures. And I, I think that, that, that the legacy and the reception of Pashkanis proves this, and that this is in the text of Pashkanis. Uh, lastly, uh, both uh, Tansil and Rob, you emphasize that Pashkanis is important for law and le for, uh, for legal scholarship. Uh, and I agree. Uh, and uh, Bill, you emphasized that we have to understand Pashukhanis intervention in concrete legal discussions uh, in his own time. Again, I agree. But I, when looking at this, at, the, at this reception and, and at this political and theoretical legacy of Pashukhanis, I think it's also is clear that uh, you cannot reduce Pashukhanis to, to, to those two contexts. And I don't think that you want to do that either. But I think it's important to emphasize that Pashukhanis is a central Marxist theorist, and that is very useful for interventions in broader social theory debates. 
uh, as proved also by by the reception. Um, I end there. Thanks. Now we're handing this around. Maybe. Yeah, I think we we are going to have to hand this around, and even maybe to the people asking questions. I guess if that's if that's possible. I, I, no. What we'll do then is I'll repeat the questions so we don't have to mess around with the mic. Okay, we've got about 45 minutes. Thanks to the timeliness of our, of our speakers. Thank you very much for being disciplined in a very, um, not revolutionary way, but the, there was some discipline shown anyway, and I'm grateful for that. Any questions um, or discuss points that people want to make, reflections on anything the speakers have said? We've got a long two days ahead of us. So maybe it's good to pace ourselves. I can see Rob. I'm trying not to see Rob though, and I can and I can see. So I'll take I'll take Rob and then Tor. Yeah. So I have mostly questions. I'll just kind of ask one now. I was saying, I wonder to what degree can we also think about those debates, also in terms of thinking about like the tactical function of those debates. Because I think that one reason why you might want to privilege logic over history, in a sense, is because history tends to be the thing that you kind of over significantly emphasize in these contexts, right? So a thing that's very common is that, in a sense, you could say that history theory often has an, or, an overemphasis on history, often involves an implicit theoretical assumption about the essential neutrality of law and the responsiveness of law to the different pressures in different ways. And so often, one of the reasons for what could be an overemphasis on logic is, is actually a form of political intervention into a particular political situation or set of debates, right? And you can, I think you can also say that that's not just a perception, is it? You can also say that in Pakistan itself, because what Pakistan is doing, as we also, one of the big things is Brenner, because Brenner is like, hey, Lord, it's this, it's this, it's this. And Pakistan is actually at some point wants to stress, but it can't. And in fact, I suspect that would understand that in the context of some people might be able to see the main intervention that from a logic point, which is to say that you, know, you can't do anything because this is kind of not a neutral form. And I do I wonder if then that's especially true, I think, in like the sixties and seventies debates with that sort of image that well. And that might also be where I think it's a bit more different than the contemporary thing. Because that's not necessarily like people are kind of more accepting of like at least certain structuralist accounts in the kind of general legal or the legal field and that might account for some of that difference. But I'm just wondering if you want to reflect a little bit on the, the particular political state of how those revivals happened and how that mm. might have you know inflected the emphasis by the world. Mm. Thanks. I'll, I'll repeat both I'll repeat I'll repeat both. I, I am going to summarize it. I am going to summarize it and be oh, criticized for it. <laughs> Go talk. Uh, okay um Bill, Bill, you mentioned in the, the late 70s that we get the Chris Arthur edition. And, and, and Carl, you mentioned the, 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 the evil with that, uh, an initial rediscovery of Venice. And then you, you mentioned sort of, or you, you rehearsed some of the possible drivers for the more recent rediscovery. Apologies if I missed it, you said similar theory. Early one, but, but but I'm struck by the, the late seventies, early eighties. You see this, right? It's, it's, it's after that we also get like, the clear piece of the later, the the first translations of the Portuguese, um, Portuguese and Brazil, I think, in Spain, the Portuguese and right? the UK with uh, Robert Fine, right, writing about. It. So 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 what is it that that, ex that 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 at this particular moment actually this Trans-European. Uh, can I can I just for the benefit of the recording? Can I just pay, summarize, paraphrase the the questions? The first, what what is the tactical function of of those debates, particularly in terms of the the political stakes, um, in relation to the laws neutrality? But more generally, what the, the political significance of those debates is at the at particular moment you're talking about. That was Rob's question. Is that fair? It's sufficient. <laughs> it's, it's sufficient. <laughs> it's sufficient. Yeah. Um, so the second question, Tor's question in the late 70s, the, the kind of wave of translations and adapt the way in which Pashkans has picked up, particularly trans-European trans context. 
Um, what what is it about this moment that 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 happens? Is that sufficient? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for two very good questions. Uh, beginning with uh, your question, Rob. First of all, I mean, I think it's a very, very interesting argument against people privileging history, saying that, well, you also have an implicit idea about le the legal form in capitalism. Uh, I think that's very effective and effective and true. Uh, uh, the, you asked about the tactical dimensions in the two conjunctures and what we can learn from the tactical so and it that also ties into the question about what how to explain the for the original uh Ashkana's revival and, and the contemporary uh, i mean it's 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 uh it's impossible of course to to um, offer any conclusive answers to that I, i've been thinking about uh uh why i mean i studied at the university of warwick so i met robert fine there and for a long time, I didn't, I didn't know about the contemporary reception at all. I thought it, this was a seventies thing, and then I, uh, yeah, uh, encountered uh, several authors sitting in here in this room, and uh, uh, and understood that, yeah, we have another uh, reception of Ashkenazi today. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to see this as the same conjuncture in a very specific sense. I mean, the contrast with between the big boom uh, years and then the return of, of crisis. Uh, and it's also, I mean, that's also how I interpret the, 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 the most general issue uh, articulated by Robert Fine, for example, that, okay, how to relate uh, as a social, as a revolutionary socialist, how, how to relate to the fact that uh, we, Relate to each other as equals and as uh, um, bearers of free of a free will, uh, and at the same time, deep inequalities. And how does that relate to capitalism? And to what extent should we defend liberal institutions when they are threatened, either directly, as we see in the wake of the financial crisis, we see direct threats. In the seventies, the threats may, might have come rather from raising levels of inequality, for example. Um, I, I do. Th I mean, uh, this is not an answer to your question. We we have to discuss this. I I I just posed the question. <laughs> uh, I I do think also that there is a, a quite big difference in terms of that the uh, Shukani's debates today is certainly dominated by legal scholarships, legal scholarship or scholars, and that in the yeah, 60s, 70s, you had a, this was a social theory uh, problematic. Uh, I don't know what to do with that difference. Uh, I'm not a legal scholar myself. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, maybe I'll stop it. I, I say some, one thing more about your uh, question, Rob. Uh, it's, I think it's certainly true that uh, the 1970s reception Privilege the logic in order to know something about history, uh, and that in general you have you have a shift. Uh, I mean, in my context, I'm, I'm interested in in the reception of of the history of ideas of the Haitian Revolution, and here most scholars who kind of left scholars they they turn to Etienne Balibar, uh, they they turn to to, and I mean this is a specific genealogy I think. It's a long genealogy, but it's important since the 1970s, a kind of a Euro-communist shift. We can defend uh, democratic institutions uh, and the implicit assumption that they are neutral. Uh, so, you, and you have it in Claude Lefort uh, and the, the notion that uh, rights uh, at bottom are indeterminate. Uh, and of course, Etienne Balibar and the concept of uh, égal liberté, um, so, so I do think that the need for Pashukan is, is as great today as in the 70s. Uh, and perhaps in that sense, it's also the same theoretical conjuncture. Um, yeah, but feel free to, to uh, add to this. Thanks, <clears throat> Rob. Um, so uh, I was uh, discussing with Rob a lot uh, during a certain period and examined his PhD. 
<clears throat> where the word logic um, played a very important role and still does, I think, in uh, Rob's thinking. And of course, there's a sense in which what Pashikanis is doing is, in his opinion, writing about the logic of law under developed capitalism at the very end of developed capitalism. You know, he's got a, uh, sorry to put it this way, but he's got a bit of the problem that Jesus had, <laughs> which was that Jesus was preaching that the end of the world was imminent. And that's why you didn't need to bother about anything except give it all up and follow him because the end of the world was going to come very soon. And, you know, Pasikhanis certainly was of the view that the end of capitalism had come and that with the revolution, uh, which one would still have perhaps at that time, the hope that it would be, would be a world revolution uh, going from Russia to Germany and, and around the world, uh, that the law would at that moment vanish. And so when Pashikhan is, is criticized uh, for the fact that his theory doesn't apply terribly well uh, to periods in history, I'm um, going back as far as you like, really, I, I think you've got to situate him in that kind of, you know, it's, um, I've forgotten the right word, but uh, when you expect the the end of the world or the end of a particular world is has come upon you, and I think that's where he sees himself. So, and the logic, therefore, I think is the logic of late capitalism, but very late capitalism about to go. So, I mean, that's maybe a topic for argument. Um, on the other question, as a good historical materialist, I have to say that the high point of the class struggle was not the late 60s, of course, uh, but in Britain, it was exactly in the 70s. And that was when Edward Heath was de defeated by the miners at Saltley Gates, and Thatcher mobilised her programme for wiping out trade unions and local governments in Britain. And, of course, the 1970s, when you had the period of the greatest trade union density in Britain, and, of course, uh, the highest number of strikes. And it's only in the last couple of years, as a matter of fact, that British workers have started going on strike again in large numbers. And I think this is the real crisis for Starmer, if one can mention his name. Um, so uh, uh, and look at my blog and you will find what the Attlee government did, what the Wilson government did to call out states of emergency against workers in struggle. And I think one can see this coming from Starmer. So again, I repeat, as a historical materialist, I think it's blindingly obvious why there was also the interest in legal scholars, by legal scholars in Pashikanis, and a whole range of thinkers, by the way, at that time. And I think it is interesting, you know, of course, that um, uh, at the theoretical level, that's when people like Chris Arthur were developing uh, commodity form uh, theory, etc., and there was a conjuncture, and it's absolutely clear what the conjuncture was in the publication of Bashkanis at that time and the huge interest. Alan Hunt, one shouldn't forget. Uh, and there were a whole lot of people at that time, actually, trying to work out, I mean, Catherine Sipnovich, you know, actually a whole book on socialist law at that time. And just mentioning Robert Fine, um, whom I revered, uh, and Robert, actually, his Dem Democracy and Rule of Law, that was 1984 that came out, and that was a reflection on what had happened in 1978 and immediately after it. So I think, again, no surprise that Robert wrote, I think, the most compelling critique of Pashikhanis, um, in my opinion, um, so soon after the publication of the translation of general theory. So I'm afraid to say I do link these things in a crude and mechanistic manner to the class struggle. Thank you. So for me, the question is, if the form of law or the legal form is a form of a particular kind of society, then the question it asks, what is the logic of this society? 
what belongs to its concept. What is it capable of? And particularly in relationship to the struggles, what are the limits of this form of society? What can you get from it? And what does it not allow you to achieve? So the question about the logic is the logic that asks about the conceptuality of a certain society. What belongs to it? And what does not belong to it? That's the question also of struggle. How far can you take it until the time when society, the logic of society, bites your back? In Adam Smith, there's a very nice word, which says the workers are staffed back to work. They're staffed back to work because when they withdraw their labor, they can only live for a couple of hours, days, months, and then they're staffed back to work. So it advises the workers not to go on strike. Here we are at Queen Mary University, which, which organized a huge uh, boycott of marking, and then they were staffed back to work. So what lies within the concept of this society, where people who withdraw their labor reach a limit, or a limit is reached, and they are staffed back to work? Let me um, allow me to make one final point. And the point is something that Pasho Kandos hints at in his book, but actually doesn't discuss, and he should have discussed it. He says somewhere that the legal form presupposes social peace. In other words, the legal form presupposes, presupposes order, which means to say the normal saying law and order is wrong. What is right is order and law. The presupposition comes first, order and law. Who decides whether the presupposition order holds or whether order has been breached? That cannot be done by law because law is the, is the presupposition of law is order. It does not make order. And in that small sentence that the legal form presupposes social peace is an argument or is an opening for the idea of the state of exception who that goes into a society that is regarded as being in disorder. It's not peaceful. It does not provide the conditions for the law to apply. And the state of exception is called to, as it were, push the rule of law, or put it aside, to reorder society, to make order again, so that the law, rule of law can apply again, that the presupposition applies. And this idea that the legal form presupposes social order, social peace, tells you also about the limits of struggles. When the legal form, the legal form of bourgeois society is pushed, it reacts. It reacts by starving people back to work, and it reacts by calling a state of exception in the most extreme circumstances. Or as Mario Draghi put it during the Eurozone crisis, we do whatever it takes. And I think that is important for social movements. That's why Bush Economist becomes important time and time again. What is the possibility of the legal form for our interests? How far can we take it? What belongs to its concept? What does not belong to its concept? And what happens if we drive the concept beyond its limit, which means the presupp its presupposition, the presupposition of social peace would no longer hold and apply. And that's where he opens the argument towards the state of exception without mentioning it by name. Thank you very much. Um, I've seen at least one more contribution question, but this screen is in the way, so if there's anyone else that I can see any other contributions or questions, please. Suggesting that that is, if you like, a kind of 
a bitter personal irony or a rebuke to fear, because the former I would completely be on board. But if it was the latter that you imply, my reading of, of Bashkanis is really being that two, two things. One is that if you see law as about um, commodification and commodity law rather specifically than a capitalism, that bracket the definition of that for one moment, then the explosion of commodity exchange under the NEP is precisely no theoretical surprise that there will be an explosion. And secondly, in terms of that, um, that for all his degrading bold class, um, the one thing he would not do was say that under full communism, you're still going to have law. So there's a lot of like, yes, I mean, obviously I was wrong about this, I was wrong about that. But there's a strong argument that actually one of the reasons he was purged is because of this tenacious, um, this, this tenacious fidelity to his core withering away thesis which meant that when you have these more and more grandiose claims of Stalinism to, about moving beyond capitalism, even if you say, yes, there's a role for law in the transition of, and so on, the fact that that core, uh, which is derived from the commodity form theory of law, means he has to go. So if it's that latter reading, I don't see this as any theoretical rebuke at all, even though it is yet a, a bitter personal irony. I'm afraid I'm going to have to clumsily reinterpret that question. Well, I'm going to have to say this for the recording. I'm going to have to ask the question again for the recording, yeah. So the, the question is, you know, what really is the, the nature of Pashukanis' analysis in the context of the, the new economic policy? Um, and and what's particular, specifically the nature of his comments on the withering away thesis at that moment? That's... How much damage does it do? Yeah. Yeah, so to, to, to what extent were things that perhaps he was saying under duress undermining his earlier comments? Is that sufficient? Thank you. Thank you. Not necessary, but sufficient. Thank you. Thank you, China. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think he went through an excruciating personal tragedy, as a matter of fact. And, you know, spending time looking at the journals and his long recantations and, and so on. Um, is, as you rightly say, heartbreaking, because this was a guy with a massive intellect, I mean, I've seen no question of it, uh, performing a heroic task. I don't think anybody else has tried to formulate a Marxist theory of law. Uh, anything like the rigor um, and logic, you know, if you like, of Pashkanis. So, uh, so what the, that whole period is so replete with tragedies, of course, and his is not the only one. It what, Something I was very interested in was, of course, he was shot as a fascist Trotskyist saboteur, you know, that's what he was accused of. So I was wondering, was he ever attracted to Trotskyism or to Trotsky? And strangely enough, his very first uh, scholarly publication, um, before the general theory was published, was in 1921 in a journal called Bread, Virgin Soil, uh, which was an article attacking Horio, the French legal theorist, who's actually footnoted a number of times in the general theory. <clears throat> and actually, that journal was edited by Trotskyist, who was duly executed. But there's no evidence I could find that Pashagan has ever saw himself in that way. I mean, I don't think he saw himself as somebody standing for the principles of the revolution, which would have been a slightly more, I suppose, honorable uh, way to have gone. But And I do think the latter years of his life um, must have been absolutely impossible for him as well. And I think the people who worked on the Stalin constitution and Bukharin, who really believed that it was going to do what it said on the tin, and I, I think a whole lot of people. And the fact that Pashkanis was chairing the committee, putting it together, um, that that is part of um, uh, trying to reach an understanding of what the hell was going on during that whole period. And of course, just final word on this is that of course, law had to come back under the new economic policy uh, because you had capitalist relations and it needed a capitalist civil code and courts. Of course, Stalinism 
Well, uh, Scott Newton's book, I think, is amazing on this, on the red, uh, what's it, red demiurge, or however he calls it. But the Stalin was, the Stalin period was absolutely awash with law. It was saturated with law from beginning to end. And so, and that is one of the great paradoxes, actually. Um, uh, and this is why Pasekhanis is, of course, published in Russia, and people know about him, but exceptionally difficult for people to come to terms with, uh, and you know, particularly with uh, more recent events. So, in any case, I mean, this is all food for thought and for general discussion. But uh, I share your pain absolutely. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, I mean, this is half a comment, sorry, half a question. If you want to take this bit, right, it's yeah. half a comment. And you're right. very close, you're very close by. I'm going to fucking stand up. You don't have to take, take this, you can go to the end. Yes, I'm going to. Um, so yeah, half comment, half question. Uh, so, but it's just, firstly, to follow up a little bit on what, what China said, and I think this is this is addressed to everyone, but especially to um, Carl and to Bill. I do think one of the, the, the casualties of how people articulate the history and logic distinction is they can they can miss the way in which logic often is articulated in a historical dimension. By which I mean, to respond partly to the thing that Bill said about the millenarianism, there's a sense in which actually Pachikarnas's theory, despite how it's sometimes taken, is is essentially agnostic or neutral on what you can do with law. Like he has a big statement about it. And he doesn't really say anything else about it. And so one of the things I think is interesting and it kind of implicates what's being said here, and I'm interested in hearing people's reflect on it. If you take those two kind of history and logic things seriously, what you can say is, well, if, if as Marx has always understood, a transition is a struggle in Lenin's words between a dying capitalism and a nascent communism, you would imagine that law would be doing weird things. Like, as in the logic of this would suggest that law is doing weird things, which can then be understood Historically, so I think there's there's a kind of interesting thing there which is worth exploring in the the transitional thing, but also in that context in the pre-capitalist law thing. This is a similar thing. It's like law is enmeshed because commodity exchange is enmeshed with all these other kind of like forms and relations and, and stuff like that. And I think that's also linked to this kind of other logical historical point that Pashikhanis makes. He makes it actually pretty clean in the general theory of law and Marxism that he's like, look, there is a difference between let's use the old school language like simple commodity exchange and like the generalization of commodity exchange, which is not just a quantitative thing but is actually about a, a transformation of value from a kind of concrete thing to something torn from its concrete foundations and like abstraction to the heavens so i just i was a little bit interested to hear reflections on that and specifically thinking about like the kind of law transition stuff and how that comes up there now that's linked to another this is an actual question i think which is that and i, I really want to talk to Vern about this too like the other way place that patrick Connors comes up that we haven't talked about yet is state theory debates. Because of course, we've been talking primarily about Patrick Connors in terms of, as a legal phrase, but he's a huge influence in that same period, and Carl already alludes to this, on state theory, on state derivation theory, and on the specificity of understanding the state form as a product of commodity exchange. So I kind of wanted to hear also some reflections on this and how this people on some this to play out. And then a final point just to Werner specifically, and this is a kind of bugbear of, of mine, but I do think one of the things that is also true about um, <laughs> certain criticism, the kind of circulation criticism you're talking about, it's just a very like volume one of capitalism, of, of capital criticism, because of course it's, it's Marx continues to center the production process throughout, but if you read like two and three, again, value starts doing some weird shit outside of a factory. It starts being like up here, total social capital, and it starts being much more abstract than it can sound about in the kind of form of like how surplus value gets pumped up. So I was just wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on like how these kind of like the understandings of Marx of the kind of contortions that happen to value at the kind of total social capital level might reflect back on some of the understandings of like the legal form. Now that might be a really weird question so you can just tell me to fuck off but i think there is something interesting just in how that would play out in terms of the, the theoretical account cool. yes. yeah thank you rob um i'm thinking <laughs> uh i begin with the state theory or state derivation debate and, and pashkanis in the state uh and maybe it, I mean, 
it relates also to what you said about Robert Fine and his critique of Barshukhan. So maybe I can combine those two. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm a big admirer of, of Robert Fine and his book, Democracy and the Rule of Law. Uh, but I, I don't think that his critique of Barshukhan is, is very original. Uh, basically, he says that uh, Pashukhanis fails to to relate the legal form to production, uh, and yeah, that's what Polanza said before and before him, uh, Korsh and, and others. Uh, so uh, and, and and I think I think it's it's uh, in in the general theory of law Marxism, Pashukhanis is, is contradictory on this point. I mean, he he, he has different positions of how to relate the, the legal form to production and circulation. Um, uh, and I think that there are theoretical solutions in other debates in Marxist theory today of how to, to relate circulation, production, and legal form. Uh, maybe you will respond to that later. Uh, concerning this, uh, but Robert Fine, uh, he, 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 I think he, he's, he's, he's close to Pershkan is in arguing that, uh, as I understand Robert Fine, he's saying that this, the state, uh, the state is subordinated logically to the legal form. So he quotes uh, uh, Hegel and the philosophy of rights saying that capitalism is a society in which uh, uh, relations between people appears as relations between legal subjects on the one hand and economic objects on the other hand. And then he says that the state, uh, the state becomes relevant uh, in relation to the legal form and we can theorize uh, uh, the state in relation to the to the legal form. I also think that you, China, uh, in your dissertation, has an interesting argument about that uh, that uh, Pashukhanis uh, de demonstrates that uh, um, that uh, the state is not necessary for ex exchange to uh, to to develop and function. Um, so, so that's the comment to to the question about the state. Uh, um, I think I leave the first more common part of Rob to you, Bill, <laughs> if you if you don't mind. Yes, I'm not sure I want to add to what I was saying before, as a matter of fact, really. That um I think the questions that Rob raises, you know, Rob mentioned his uh, strategy and tactics. And of course, you know, I, I think we've had an engagement on this in the past. And you know, so they're in print, you can look at it. And I think we have uh, a different take, quite rightly, on what is the role of law and what lawyers or legal theorists can do. Uh, and <clears throat> I, I think if you want to explore how law can be theorized under capitalism, I think look, Rob has taken a very interesting direction, as a matter of fact, I think you would agree, over the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, and you are exploring actually new territory. Um, uh, and I think, you know, you started with France Fanon, and I think this is actually absolutely crucial in today's circumstances. So um, I th think that is at the heart of some of what you were saying just now. Good, yes, I'm not too far off. So, you know, I follow, I disagree. But this is how things should be, shouldn't it? So um, I think we continue the argument and debate. But I do go back to the fact that I think the class struggle at the present moment is breaching um, a, an extremely dangerous moment, apart from anything else. But it has not subsided anywhere in the world. And now that we have, well, today... Uh, if anybody was watching the arguments in the International Court of Justice this morning, one thing is quite clear, which is law is not going to resolve Israel and Palestine. And just on a personal note, I spent uh, more than a decade taking Kurdish cases against Turkey at the European Court of Human Rights, and then a decade taking Chechen cases against Russia. Was it worth taking them? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I think there were reasons why. Has any of those problems been solved? Of course they haven't. And this is not what law can do. I think if we are lawyers, there are things we can do as lawyers. But I think the moment we start being delusional about the 
uh, effects or possibilities of law, um, well, you know, I think we will be ignored, as a matter of fact. So thank you. I mean, this is so I look very much forward to the continuing debate. So logic and history. I think I never quite understand the distinction between one and the other since for Pakistan, Pashukani, sorry, the legal form is the legal form of historically specific social relations. It's not a universal historical concept. If it were an historical un universal concept, then it would have a logic over and above the societies through which it exists. But for Pashukanis, it isn't that. For Pashukanis, law is the form of a specific, historically form generated social relationship. In other words, the logic of law is the logic of that society. The logic of that society manifests itself in the form of law, amongst other things. And now to separate those two things out would be to me for me to say that Pashukanis is quite wrong with his starting point. He ought to have argued it is a universal human form. It has a logic independently from the social actions, from the societies. But in fact, that would be to misunderstand and misconceive uh, Pashukanis entirely. So the question of the separation and the distinction between logic and history as two different avenues, as it were, is, is bogus as far as I'm concerned in relationship to what uh, Pashukanis says, in fact, has to, has to say. He might be wrong, but then we cannot argue that point in support of his, if, of his, uh, of his argument. Um, in relationship to circulation and production, it's equally very tiresome. You cannot produce without exchanging. You cannot exchange what you haven't produced. That, that is the end of the story, I think. But the distinction becomes important if a theoretician talks about circulation only and forgets about production, or talks about production and thinking and forgetting to talk about exchange and circulation. Those two things belong together and have to be argued together. And the, and the accusation, if, if that's the right word, by Nick and Negri in relationship to Pashukanis was that he doesn't discuss surplus value extraction. And as a consequence, he doesn't discuss economic bondage. As a consequence, he doesn't ex discuss exploitation. And as a consequence, he doesn't discuss the same old dodge of every conqueror who buys from the conquered with the money that he has stolen from them beforehand. He doesn't do that. And in a way, both of them are right, because you don't find that in Pashukanis. For Pashukanis, the idea of the commodity form is the form of exchange. He talks about the market all the time, about market relationships. Market is a fundamental category, but what makes the market, the category of the market, fundamental in relationship to capitalism is the labor market, which is specific and unique to capitalist society. It's not a slave market, it's a labor market. And though there are frequent references to it, there is no thorough in investigation into what is traded and what happens to the traders, and how are, is that what has been bought being consumed? With what consequence? There's no argument there in Bashikanis. At least I, I couldn't find it. For that reason, in my talk, I highlighted that, in fact, there is more to the idea of the legal form as a form of the, of, of the commodity. There's more to it than it seems. What is part of it is economic bondage, is exploitation, and is the same old dodge of, of every conqueror over and above the, the inequality that presents itself as an equality before, before the law. Uh, so that was the reason for my argument. I didn't want to argue that he, they are right and we should not look at produ as production in abstraction from circulation. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, is there anything else I was asked? I don't think so, no? All right, that's fair enough then, thank you. Thanks very much. I'm not seeing any other uh, questions or points. Are there any last questions? Sorry, any last questions or points? I can't see anyone. Uh, yes, I can. I just wanted to... 
if we can um, just consider a bit further the issue of the state in all this, uh, in this outfit, um, in the sense that I agree that, I, I, you know, I agree with, with Werner that the law is not emancipatory. However, I think that we do need to unpack it a bit further, including the role of the state, uh, particularly in relation to contracts of employment, so that if you look at the legal form the, as, a, as a contract, which is entered into between private people, in which they are free to, uh, to, to, to formulate a set of obligations and rights, it doesn't work like this in an employment contract because the state intervenes. Um, and the state, for example, to various degrees, which you know are a moving target, if you like, says you, the worker, even though you contracted to sell your labor, you do have the right to withdraw it without actually violating that contract. Um, and it imposes obligations on the employers as to where in remote circumstances it can terminate this contract, which is independent on what was negotiated and is subject and, and you know what is being negotiated privately is subject to the state. I just think this question is important because uh, this is where we are at the moment where the struggle is really fought in the arena of the state. What kind of state we are going to have? And we see the rise of the fascistic, militarized state, as opposed to what, say, China would say, a socialist state, always Chinese characteristics. And one of its, you know, if you like, pillars is the protection of workers' rights within the concept of freedom, as, as you say, from the means of production and, uh, you know, and, and the worker as subject to, if you like, capital, capital needs. So I just wondered whether, you know, you can comment on it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I'm going to take this as the last question and come to the speakers and ask the speakers to make some final comments as well as if they want to respond to your questions about the nature and role of the state. So so let's have some summing up comments from the speakers. Thank you very much. And do you mind to start? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I agree with you, but there's a but. The assumption of my talk was the best possible world, the best possible world, in order to show that even in the best possible world, economic bondage, exploitation, inequality, and the same old dodge of the conqueror manifest themselves in the best possible world. That doesn't mean that we live in the best possible bourgeois world in terms of gender discrimination, racial discrimination. People from the North, you should meet them. They look different than people in the South in Great Britain. There is discrimination. But overcoming that discrimination, important though it is, doesn't change the relations of exploitation, of inequality, of economic bondage. Thus, therefore, there is no argument against the fight for labor rights. Why should a laborer sell his or her commodity cheaply? Why should they work for nothing if it doesn't really matter? They fight in order to make a living, in order to retain and have access to material things, to live. That belongs, as it were, to the concept of bourgeois society. And it is important to fight for that so that the worker is not staffed to work, but goes to work well-fed, well-housed, with electricity, with gas supply, not disconnected. That's really, really important. 
with employment protection legislation. That's really, really important. But it doesn't mean at the same time that therefore the character of bourgeois society is overcome. In fact, it might be argued as in fact Pashukanis does. It's mystified because the promise of the forms of freedom, of justice, of a fair wage for a fair length of the working day is achieved. That mystifies the relationship on the basis of the promise of these splendid forms. Therefore, however, does not, does not come to the argument that one therefore should disregard these forms. Like it doesn't matter whether a fascist becomes the prime minister or the chancellor or the president. That matters. And to whom it matters is the people who struggle for access to the means of life, who struggle for some dignity, who struggle for free time, who struggle for access, who struggle for life over a life solely consisting in work and labor. It matters. It's an existential question, but this is an existential question within the concept, within the boundary, within the limits of the very society that treats them through an economic bondage as mere resource for abstract forms of wealth, money as more money. I don't know whether I answered your question, but the assumption is the best possible world to say exploitation is not a consequence of discrimination. Exploitation exists even if there is no discrimination. And one ought to fight against discrimination in the full knowledge that that doesn't change inequality, exploitation, and economic bondage. It mystifies it further. But for those suffering from it, that is an existential question of life. So <clears throat> the word struggle, I think, is absolutely crucial. And um, I'm a communist. I think other people in this room are also communists. Uh, Marx and Engels made it absolutely clear, as clear as they could, that communism is not setting up plans for the future or for an ideal situation or anything like that. And I think they, um, of course, now we're in the system which I think Marx correctly identified and correctly identified what moves it and what drives it and what is absolutely inexorable, which is the law of value. Um, so without going into that now, but I think he was absolutely right. It now poses an existential threat to human beings and indeed to all life on the planet. Here we are. It is happening now. So I think the question is not blueprints for how things are going to get much better or how we're going to uh, win this or that legal reform. Um, I was very much taken uh, some years ago. There was a big conference in the former um, Yulu building uh, in Bloomsbury of 150 years of Marxist capital uh, with a number of uh, speakers, including Michael Heinrich, um, whose side I take against Fred Mosley, I think, in the current dispute. But anyway, that's a different question. And he and the other speakers were asked at the end of the conference to sum up Marx's thought in one word. And he replied, without hesitation, struggle. That is what it's all about. So, I mean, Returning to Rob, uh, I think tactics actually is how how does one fight the class struggle at the present time in this ghastly situation that we're in, where, by the way, not all is lost. And there are very significant big forces, as a matter of fact, mobilizing as we speak. So I think that's where we are. And I think a problem with getting into rather abstract discussions about what laws should be, um, actually, I think it's a diversion from what, where we really need to be. So that's just my personal view. Thanks. Yeah, yes, something very short. Uh, first, in relation to your comment, <clears throat> I think it's useful to, to make the distinction between legal form and legal content. Uh, and uh, the fact that we can find a lot of examples in which the legal form in its 
yeah, more abstract theorization does not apply, does not mean that the, the concept of legal form is affected. I mean, if of course, you can find a lot of various cases in which legal demands or legal institutions has been useful for socially social movements or revolutionary struggles or uh, uh, but seeing that as, as legal content makes it easier to understand I mean because other, otherwise the, the concept of legal form becomes very broad uh, but and at the same time when we see it as legal content it's still related to, it's still the, the content of a form which also relates to the limits of, of, of this legal form as a form of appearance of, of capitalism. Um, and, and maybe I could, I could end there because I, I th with this point, because I think that the concept of legal forms means that we cannot, and this is what you said as well, Werner, but we cannot be indifferent to threats of authoritarianism and fascism, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we defend the legal form, but specific legal content uh, can be defended uh, and it also means that uh, the, the, the threats against democracy that we see uh, does not mean that we can strive for alliances with, for example, bourgeois parties that supports capital at the same time. This is what I think that partial kindness can help us, help us to see. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you to all our speakers for committed, engaged, and an important start to the conference, it really was. Thank you very much. Let's thank them in the in the normal way. And thanks, thanks, thanks to those who contributed. We we now have ten minutes instead of fifteen minutes. That's a measure of the extent to which we've been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have we're back at quarter past for the session on Pashkanis and the law. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh, so we had had a great uh, panel session previously. We're starting again <clears throat> with the second panel panel on Pashakarnis and law. And uh, my name is Roger Cottrell. I'm a professor at Queen Mary here. I feel a little bit of an interloper because I'm not a I'm not a Marxist, um, but I did read Pashakarnis in great detail a long time ago. <laughs> so it's really good to be reminded. And to also to know that the discussion goes on now, and that uh, today there's a revival of interest in Pashukanis. The reason I think I'm here, and the reason I agreed to cha chair the panel, is because uh, I've taught jurisprudence all my career, and then at the end of the 1970s, um, as as has been said by pre previous people on the earlier panel, Pashukanis was big news. For those of us who were interested in critical legal thought at that time, it became apparent very, very quickly that the the, the theorist who everyone needed to read was Pashukarnis. <laughs> and um, Bill Baring explained it far, far more accurately than, than I can, the circumstances of the time. The end of the 1970s, of course, it was a very strange time because it was a time when critical legal theory was really flourishing. But of course, Thatcher was just around the corner. In 1979, things changed politically, and that was very significant. So I don't want to go over anything that Bill said, but I did want to kind of, in a way, justify my presence here by saying a little bit about that time and <clears throat> what happened to some of us as a consequence. Um, <clears throat> As, as Bill said, um, Barbara Einhorn's translation came out then, 1978, and just two years later in 1980, uh, Piers Byrne and Robert Charlotte produced um, a translation, a big, big volume of translations of Pashukhanis' essays <clears throat> and a new translation of uh, the general theory of law and Marxism. And um, my introduction to all of that really came through through Birkbeck College at the time, and especially through Paul Hurst, who some people may remember. There were plenty of people who were mentioned earlier uh, in the previous session as uh, very active around that, around that time. One who wasn't mentioned was Paul Hurst, who was Professor of Social Theory at Birkbeck at that time. 
And Paul was, um, I was a postgraduate student of sociology at Birkbeck then, while teaching law here at Queen Mary. And Paul is going through a very interesting transition from being an Al <laughs> Althusserian Marxist to um, becoming interested in <clears throat> pluralism, globalization, and law and legal theory. <clears throat> and we became quite close friends. Um, and Paul, Paul um, <laughs> uh, wrote a book called, uh, well, a collection of essays, really, I think, Socialism, Democracy, and Law. And um, this was an, something else that fed into critical legal thought at that time. But like several other people, but yeah, like several other people at, at that time, I decided that there were enough things wrong with Bashikhanis' theory and with Marxism generally, <clears throat> that I wanted to use the experience of studying Marx in depth and take, take it somewhere else. So I became a legal sociologist, and most of my career has been in jurisprudence and sociology of law. Not forgetting Marx, but also putting alongside Marx lots of other people, especially Weber, Durkheim, and more modern social theorists. Um, I did want to also mention that uh, I think Bill, Bill mentioned very quickly in passing um, John Hazard, the American comparative lawyer, who is a major, a, a very remarkable figure in comparative law in, in America, in America um, and studied in Moscow in the 1930s, um, was, was basically sent to Moscow to study Soviet law um, on the route to becoming a comparative lawyer. And um, Hazard has a lot of interesting personal descriptions of Pashikhanis. I did want to, well, I won't, I won't read it out now, but he talks about Pashikhanis' physical appearance as a very, very big man, a very dominating character with bushy eyebrows that went up and down with great speed. <clears throat> Hazard listened to Pashikhanis' lectures and uh, met him in his office, where it was very obvious that Pashikhanis totally dominated all his all his colleagues, all, the, all those around him. And... Um, if we're thinking about the reasons why Pashikhanis fell from grace, a number of them, of course, have been mentioned already in the previous session. One that perhaps wasn't mentioned was that he um, tried to revolutionize the, the system of law teaching <clears throat> and uh, legal practice in, in the Soviet Union to such an extent that he could, he could not possibly be ignored. So a number of other uh, Soviet scholars who shared Pashikhanis' views actually escaped with, uh, with their lives, whereas Pashikhanis didn't. It was something else, really, that I think uh, made, made it uh, in inevitable, inevitable in a way that he would, he would uh, cease to be around in the face of Stalin's <clears throat> intentions. So now we have... Um, <clears throat> this session and three people on the panel <clears throat> who I'm going to say something about very briefly. Gretchen, <clears throat> Gretchen Bars is senior lecturer in law at City University. She works, uh, they work on the role of law in society using queer and Marxist theory to understand and ultimately subvert the constitutive ordering and ideological functions of law. Dr. Barr's monograph in 2019 is Law, Capitalism, and the Corporation, which describes how international criminal law has obscured economic causes and effects of con conflict. And it uses in-depth analysis of the Nuremberg trials of the German industrialists. Um, Gretsch has been in corporate <clears throat> commercial legal practice in the city of London and human rights and international humanitarian law work in the Middle East. And she's a reg and, and there's they are a regular faculty member at the Harvard Institute for Global Law and Policy, um, global and regional workshops, and presently senior lecturer at City University. Also on the panel is Tor Krever, 
who is University Assistant Professor in International Law at Cambridge. His work focuses on the history and theory of international law and critical and Marxist approaches to international law and left legal theory more generally. Dr. Crever is currently completing a book manuscript developing a materialist history of the pirate in international legal thought. He also has a new research project, assume it's still new, um, on the relationship between anti-imperialism and international law focused on anti-imperial movements of the 20th century, and is published in numerous journals. And then thirdly, Demetrius Givotidis uh, is at Goldsmiths, and he joined Goldsmiths as lecturer in September 2023, previously holding positions at Birkbeck and at Durham University. His research interests lie in public law, human rights, law and political economy, critical legal theory, in particular Marxist critiques of law, law and social change, comparative law and European Union law. And he's published on the impact of crisis legislation on fundamental rights, on the relationship between rights and social change, and on the relationship between constitutional law and political economy. <clears throat> So we'll have about 15 minutes uh, for each speaker, and then we should have plenty of time for comments, questions, and answers after that. Gretchen. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Being told to speak into the mic, great. Uh, thank you, Roger, very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Cotter, I should say. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the, for the organizers for organizing this uh, this event today. And I'm, I'm really excited to be in a room with so many Pashkanians or so many maybe Pashkanites um, in, 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 in training, maybe, or, um, you know, people who are at least interested in. I know that when um, Rob and I were doing our PhDs. I think we were probably the only two, and we were disciples of China. And it's great to see a whole room full of the, uh, us now. Um, but yeah, so my talk today is going to be slightly different from what I had in mind um, originally. And that is, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, Pashkanis and um, what we can learn from Pash what's basically the relationship between. Um, what we've learned from Ashkanis and what's going on in the world right now. So it's mainly going to be about um, Gaza. And I've also written out my talk, which I don't normally do, but I thought it's best to keep myself on track also not to start ranting, um, which is still a possibility. Um, so in some ways it's ironic and in other ways entirely appropriate that this event falls on the very days that South Africa is challenging Israel and the International Court of Justice on Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza. In fact, it might be a key test for Pashkanite theory. One of the main contributions, and that's been mentioned before already by Rob and others, of course, um, today, um, one of Pashkana's main contributions to legal scholarship is to raise the question um, the possibility and indeed the argument for the abolition of law and legal systems with mm. capitalism and the state form in or after the revolution, whatever form that might, may take for us to restart organizing our communities and societies along an entirely different non-hierarchical lines with what our anarchist friends might call consen consensus decision-making and transformative justice. Pashikanis, in other words, was an abolitionist before it was cool. One of the key questions in the meantime, as you all know, is what to do with law. What role, if any, law may play in our liberation or getting to that point where we can reimagine and remake the world we want to live in. And Rob, as has been mentioned already, of course, has discussed this question in his seminal uh, 2010 Finnish yearbook of international law article on strategy and tactics where he argues we can use law tactically while remaining while maintaining a revolutionary strategy that moves beyond law and legal methods for change 
We need to keep our eyes, in other words, on the prize. I've been very impressed in the uh, past nearly 100 days of genocide to see many academics, including academic lawyers, some of whom in this room even, on the, or not even, but especially, on the demos and also um, on, the main, on the many direct actions, such as the arms factory blockades organized by the Workers for Free Palestine, in direct response to the call by Palestinian workers and unions. Now I also have comrades and friends involved in the ICJ case, and having spent many years myself, as, as Roger also mentioned, as a human rights and IHL lawyer in Palestine with Palestinian human rights organizations, including in Gaza that I've visited um, at least 20 times, I've worked as an IHL lawyer for the fact-finding mission on Operation Cast Lead in 28, um, which happened in 20, 2008 to nine. Uh, led by Justice Goldstone, and I've also briefly led a universal jurisdiction program at an international human rights organization in Europe before changing course uh, 180 degrees, and that did have something to do with reading Pashkanis in China's um, book that introduced me to um, Pashkanis. Of course, I continually, repeatedly, especially on days like today, question my own reasoning and resolve when it comes to actively working against seeing the law as a or one tool for liberation. We have seen the Israeli leadership and its military brazenly ignore or explicitly violate in the past almost 100 days, can be 100 days on, on uh, Sunday. And also, well, you know, who knows? Um, and also before, as the Palestinian human rights lawyers I've worked with would say, all rules of international law. Israel has acted not just exceptionally, but routinely, despite or regardless of international law. At the same time, Israel invokes some very power, powerful paradig paradigmatic changes in international law discourse when it comes to Gaza shifts few seem to notice or challenge. For example, invoking the notion, the legal concept of war, as in the Israel-Hamas war, which is, of course, uh, used by all mainstream media, this phraseology, which suggests an equivalence between the two parties. Moreover, which of course erases the 75 years of oppression and occupation and the legal framework of the laws of occupation in favor of a more permissive interstate war framework. Israel's invocation of equivalence only goes as far as invoking this framing, however. For the remainder, it still only goes one way, because imagine the Gazans right to, to defend themselves, or imagine if Gazans had the weapons to carry out targeted strikes on Israeli hospitals, schools, universities, archives, museums, theaters, places of worship, academics, journalists, political and military leaders. Last week, Hassan Nasrallah in his speech following the targeted assassination by Israel of Hamas leader Salah al aruri in Beirut and five other members of this group that um, Nasrallah said in his speech, we don't believe in the, all that international law stuff anymore. I paraphrase the interpreter. And he's not the only one. I imagine most of us who have been watching the genocide unfold on our screens day after day, while one national and then international institution after another has so blatantly and brazenly upheld, upheld its bias in favor of Israel in ways that has shown the empire's full nudity to the world. And yet, watching the ICJ this morning in its hallowed halls, I want to believe that law can save Gaza, that legal order can be restored against this genocidal chaos. And I'm not the only one, of course, in the past months, the demos have rung with chants like Rishi Sunak, you can't hide, we charge you with genocide. And protesters carry signs invoking the ICC and ICJ, showing faith and endorsement, or perhaps imminent critiques of international law. The moment South Africa filed its claim at the ICJ in December, the number of social media posts containing congratulations, explainers and endorsements multiplied by the hour. Demos outside the court of The Hague have, are happening, uh, were happening this morning and, and tomorrow morning with massive sc um, screens as well for the live stream. 
and uh, watch parties are being organized, articles in law blogs abound. Some scholars seeming seem to be relieved that they can be pro-Palestinian in a respectable way, supporting a legitimate civilized legal claim. We have pressed pause on our disillusionment with the UN, even the Security Council, while our hearts are lit for the ICJ. If I was the ICJ and the West in general and interested in my own survival or indeed supremacy, which obviously I'm not, um, I would take this opportunity now at the ICJ to undo the damage to Western imperialism by coming out even in a modest way in support of South Africa. Even a legalistic condemnation of genocide in the abstract and an exhortation for Israel to abide by international law to minimize civilian and child, especially child casualties is going to be celebrated as a win and restore some faith in the international system. The international order will uh, be restored even if, as after the advisory opinion on the wall, um, which happened when I was doing my um, uh, masters, my LLM, um, neither Israel nor the international community takes any steps to execute the ICJ's polite requests. Um, for what it's worth, I think the ICJ will do a blinken and simply paraphrase Israel has the right to defend itself. Again, no word of the Gazans right to defend themselves and of course Israel must take care to minimize civilian casualties. The old IHL game of calculating how many civilian deaths is acceptable and how many is too many resumes and nobody saw the executions, the targeting, the deliberate starvation, the white phosphorus, the white flag deaths, the eradication of entire families which isn't new which was also documented in all and in all previous operation um, in Gaza, including uh, the Goldstein report on Operation Gas, Gas led exactly the same things and exactly the same exhortations followed. And then we can go back to doing theory and being vaguely critical, but no, but yes, but only if our theory stands at the service of revolutionary practice. And at the time of the absolute horror of the Gaza genocide, the ramping up of authoritarianism in our own countries and the existential fears this brings with it, I am actually glad of this opportunity to share and discuss, discuss with um, fellow, fellow Pashukanites, which are probably the very few people that I, I know who would share some of the concerns about um, the law that I have. Having finished watching the ICJ uh, this morning, um, as I was writing this, I'm left with the following thought. Like international law, Israel is a creation of Europe. This genocide is a creation of Europe. And as Aimé Césaire said, Europe is indefensible. We must end Europe. How we do so, I would like to hear your views on and discuss with you. So um, let me see how much time I have. Um, like three, uh, two minutes, two minutes. Um, I actually did want to, um, I did have some slides, um, to also link this to, um, the work that I'm actually doing, um, that isn't about Gaza. Um, although it is of course, um, very much connected in the sense that I see, um, all these issues connected, right? as a popular slogan uh, goes, and also um, you see that on the side of the slide, and that none of us are free until Palestine is free. So I work uh, on uh, on Pashkanis, uh, obviously, and I've, um, uh, I'm working specifically on the Pashkana notion of the legal subject. And as Pashkanis puts it, then the social relation which is rooted in production presents itself simultaneously in two absurd forms as the value of commodities and as man's capacity to be the subject of rights. So um, as we know from Rob uh, Pashkanis, in order to be use, um, uh, as useful it can be as, as it can be for the uh, um, uh, 21st century, it needs to have um, take full account of race, which it, it hasn't, of course. 
So far, although Rob's done amazing work, it also needs a career and family makeover. It needs to take into account questions that we struggle with today around uh, gender and sexuality and many other issues that uh, other scholars um, will hopefully be contributing. So what we need is a historical materialist understanding of how sex, uh, gender, sexuality, race, and gender sexualized and racialized legal subjectivity um, developed, in other words. And my argument is developed in the, um, in the transition to capitalism. So I'm interested in the investment that we have in law, and this is uh, why, I, uh, why I study the legal subject. Uh, this investment we have in law and in order, this belief that law and justice are not somehow man-made and specifically made by the powers that be to further their interests. But this weird, outdated, semi-religious notion that law exists out there in the abstract as a function of justice. I want to understand where it comes from, what its power consists in, and of course, how we can break that spell. Of course, not just the ideological spell. This isn't a question of false consciousness, but the ideological spell is shored up by real material benefits. Very simply, the powerful ideology that makes us, not us, not us in the room, uh, talk about Israel's right, Israel's right to defend itself, not the Palestinians or the Lebanese, um, is um, the result of um, the coding, the centuries of coding done by the marker of race that serves a settler colonial racial capitalism. So I'm not, um, and when we're talking about race, um, I've obviously used Rob's work, but also um, more recently, Tab G. Garba's uh, work, who um, writes, who has an article called uh, Slavery of Social Form, also a number of other articles. Um, this current one is not yet published, but you can find it linked in an interview I can share after the talk, um, where he says the ideal of contractual freedom mediates the relation between potential emancipation and actual domination. What anti-blackness produces is not the actuality of freedom, but the capacity to be free. It is this capacity of promise for forever deferred, those are my words, that is Apotheos, I can't say that word, apotheos, maybe a Greek person can say that word, um, in, the, in the form of the contract, um, in other words, the law, right? So it is that um, the capacity to be free that is linked in, in my mind to this, um, to this um, sort of the mystic pull of the, um, not the mystic and the material pull of, of, of uh, legal subjectivity. So um, I've most recently been working then on a project on uh, the Dutch East India Company's sodomy prosecutions in the early modern period. So here we see, uh, you might think, well, why on earth would you be looking at that? But what we see here is that, um, the, in fact, the self-identification of the homosexual and at the same time, the legal categorization of the homosexual as such and, as, and the criminalization, of course, of the subject as opposed to the act or the practice happens um, at a very particular moment in history and in the uh, uh, global economy, in the development of the, or in the fall, in fact, of the Dutch uh, empire. Um, and uh, when you can see a mass a wave, of, a wave of mass persecution, this is a, a moment of uh, economic decline and financial crisis, and that, of course, you might make you think, does that sound familiar considering the anti-trans laws that we see uh, being passed in, in the um, uh, US and, and increasingly also in the UK um, at the moment. Um, okay, so, um, okay. Um, yeah, so here's, here's just a slide with uh, some of the sources that I work with um, on, on thinking of a, a queer and tra uh, trans -histor historical materialist uh, theory of, of law. So um, I've written before about the straight court. I also use um, um, uh, uh, Oriane Sophie's uh, concept of factory of jurisprudence where trans, uh, where the cis heteronorm is pr both produced and transnormalization happens. I use um, uh, authors like Tronti and, and Ludwig 
and also maybe uh, nice to mention the the desire for recognition of the legal subject and what i find really interesting is that most work that's been done on on uh, subjecthood doesn't uh, understand doesn't theorize a difference between legal subjectivity and subjectivity as such and that is in fact that distance is what i'm interested in um but the desire for recognition then including for example um like non-binary legal recognition. This seems to like a million miles away from uh, from Gaza, but it really isn't. Um, it leads to a recognition trap, and then that's something that Nadine Alanani writes about in her book. Um, keeping the trans and LGBTQI plus legal subjects desiring stuck in a system that depend depends on their eradication and also renders them complicit in the exclusion and extinction of others. So it is that sort of recycling and, 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 and um, readapting of this individuation, individuating move of uh, legal subjectivity that I think is very strong, but also that ultimately we need to, of course, um, get rid of. So I thought I'd leave you here with a still from the video, uh, Build or Destroy by, uh, by the... Um, by Rashad Newsom uh, from his amazing exhibition at the Hayward Gallery uh, in the Black Fantastic uh, last year. So, no matter which mic I use, let me sleep with the one on. I don't need to use this one. Oh, no, no, no. Yep. Very good. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll stand up here just because that's the pattern we've established. Uh, all right. So the the brief was was ambiguous with what what I was you know Tansel's email was was quite uh, thin in in detail. Um, so uh, Rob though assures me that I'm more entertaining when I speak off the cuff and and and. You know, disorganized. I suspect he means that at my expense, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to to to, to I, well. I, I started to think about Pashukanis and law, uh, and, and immediately thought, of course, of of the recent, not so recent now, turn or embrace of Pashukanis and Marxism more generally by legal thinkers. Right? So I'm often, well, I often read, but I'm also often told, especially by younger colleagues, students, with some degree of awe often, uh, that there's been a new generation, certainly of British Marx legal scholarship in the past Britain decade here, but I suspect a couple decades now. Uh, that the, right, that, 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 so, so I think it's easy to overstate, uh, let's put it that way, both the prominence of any such turn to Marxism by the legal academy and indeed the novelty of any such development. But to the extent it is true, right, and that there is a new generation of legal scholars, at least in this country, perhaps the, the English-speaking academy more generally, right, more openly embracing a Marxist analysis, what's most striking, I think, is indeed the influence and the prominence specifically of Pashu Kanis within that, that, that development. So it's worth thinking briefly then about the resources that Pashu Kanis's account specifically uh, of law brings to Marxists working within the legal academy today. The Pashukanis' general theory of law of Marxism, as we've of course heard several times already today, remains, of course, the most significant Marxist analysis of law. Following Marx and Engels, Pashukanis suggested that law gained dominance as a mode of social regulation only under capitalism. Now, some Marxists in the interim had argued that you could simply add in an element of class struggle. Uh, to positivist theories of law, to attain a Marxist theory of law. Now, this is important, I think, because an earlier generation, earlier, that is, um, to, relative to us, not to Pashukanis, uh, and especially um, in, in the US, for instance, such as those of the critical legal studies movement, uh, had implicitly formulated their theories in conversation with or, or explicitly in juxtaposition with uh, 
uh, a Marxism that focused narrowly on the presumed class content of law, instead, right, stressing on the part that is of, of, of CLS scholars, the indeterminacy of law and legal texts. Today's Marxist legal scholars, I think, are much more attuned to Pashukanis' insights that it was not simply the bourgeois content of legal rules uh, and the rule of law that was unique to capitalism, but the legal form itself. Right? Such a form, he insisted, was not an inherent or eternal instrument of social regulation, but rather was relative and historically limited. So social regulation itself was nothing unique to capitalism. It's only under certain conditions that the regulation of social relations assumes a legal character. And those conditions, especially Canis, of course, suggested were those of commodity exchange, the commodity form being that under capitalism through which material exchanges are mediated. And only with the capitalist mode of production does the product of labor take on the commodity form. Furthermore, for commodities to be exchanged through the medium of money, say, they must be brought to the market by their owners, each recognizing the other likewise as the exclusive owner of the commodities. And each commodity is acknowledged as the private property of its owner given freely in exchange for another. So the juridical relationship between exchanges of commodities mirrors this economic relationship with each party recognized as legal subjects, formally equal if abstract commodity owners. The legal subject in short, as Pastor Kappas puts it, is an abstract owner of commodities raised to the heavens. Forgive me, I'm rehearsing a fairly common summary of Patrick Hannes' insights here. The legal form in turn, right, is a form of social regulation premised on disputes between the sovereign, formal, formally equal individuals implied by this commodity exchange. And in arguing that the legal form was a peculiarly capitalist commodity, sorry, capitalist institution, the outgrowth of generalized commodity exchange, Patrick Hannes here didn't deny its existence in pre-capitalist periods, uh, as is clear, from his discussion, say, of Roman law. Commodity exchange clearly predates capitalism, and so to law, a function of pre-capitalist markets, but only as embryonic legal forms. So only as capitalism came to dominate social relations of production, displacing feudal relations, were market relations and commodity exchange generalized with, in Pashtacanis' words, separate casual acts of exchange transformed into expanded, systematic, commodity circulation, and so too with law and the rise of the universal legal subject. So it follows on this approach then that law was not a set of abstract norms imposed upon social relations, but was itself indissolubly linked to and thrown up by concrete material relations. It unfolds, as Patrick Hannes puts it, not as a set of ideas, but as a specific set of relations which men enter into not by conscious choice, but because the relations of production compel them to do so. The influence of this analysis today, I think, is evident in the attention of Marxist legal scholars to the, among other things, the historical specificity of legal relations and to their grounding, and that of the dominant role assumed by law in modern capitalist society, in concrete material relations. An attention that contrasts with an earlier preoccupation among some Marxist legal scholars with law as reduced to force or with ideology as law's primary function. Now, importantly, this opens up also questions of how we as Marxists should engage with law. And again, I'm rehearsing themes that we've already discussed today. Um, so if we can just replace bourgeois, the bourgeois content of law with socialist content, then we should have no difficulties embracing law and legality as mechanisms for advancing progressive causes. But if, on the other hand, the very legal form is suspect and rooted in a particular concrete material circumstances and conjunctures, we're faced with a quite different prospect. So Rob has engaged, of course, precisely with this issue in terms of questions of tactics and strategies, advancing an argument for principled opportunism. Uh, alas, Rob's influence is not yet hegemonic on the left. Uh, and so the question, I think, of the progressive or, or even revolutionary potential of law, and in my own interest, international law, remains, for most of the left, I think, a pressing one. And indeed, possibly the preeminent predicament facing radicals 
committed to an emancipatory politics who also happened to be lawyers, or in my case, international lawyers. Um, David Kennedy spent some time now arguing that law has been proliferating as political vulgate. Law is the transnational language of entitlement and disputation. But importantly, so too is law and international law in particular, ubiquitous today as oppositional vocabularies. So from the anti-war movement to people's tribunals to social movements, international legal argument or legal argument more generally is today a staple of popular political discourse, including on the left and even indeed on the revolutionary left. So we see it right now, as Gretchen has, has pointed out, with respect to Palestine, where we see increasingly a turn to international legal institutions by, amongst others, the Palestinian leadership and efforts to convince the ICC prosecutor to prosecute Israeli leaders, for example. But also we see this in the case of solidarity movements in the North Atlantic and Global South alike, with a similar embrace of the ICC, or today the ICJ, and a real, I would suggest, narrowing of the solidarity movement's language of opposition. The problem we're constantly told is one of illegality, the illegality of settlements, of war crimes, of genocide, of apartheid policies. So what are we to make of all of this? Legality, international legality, right, is now the common vulgate, not only of governance, but also left internationalism. How did we get here? And what indeed is at stake? When we as revolutionaries, I dare say, mobilize human rights or international legal argument or the language of law, we make a wager, as Rob suggests, uh, drawing explicitly, in Rob's case on Pashukanis, right, a wager that the tactical gains of doing so will outweigh the costs. The gains, for example, are that we can mobilize otherwise apolitical liberals with no principled commitment to anti-imperialism, mobilize them, against the invasion of Iraq, say, or against Israeli settler colonialism, because while they might be otherwise indifferent to imperialism, illegality will touch a nerve. And the costs, on the other hand, are a possible legitimation or reification of an international law that has historically played, of course, handmaiden to imperialism and continues to be implicated in and complicit with the reproduction of neo-colonial relations of domination and indeed of a capitalist world system. In other words, imperialism. But that wager, I think, that calculus, that in this instance, right, it makes tactical sense to mobilize international legalism in aid of a politics of anti-imperialism, looks right, different today than say in the 60s at the height of anti-imperial internationalism. So the mobilization of international law in the 1960s at the height of a third world movement and anti-imperial internationalism that saw its horizon as the defeat of the system, imperialism, capitalism, not legality per se, looks very different than today when with both third world and workers' movements collapse, the language of international law and indeed of human rights has displaced, I would suggest, other emancipatory frameworks in the political imagination of internationalism. So when left internationalists decry Israeli apartheid, say, as illegal or unlawful, this no longer looks like the principled opportunism described by Robert Knox, or in the case of Palestine, by someone like Nora Arakat. The juridification of political praxis and the appeal to international law may, I fear, uh, in fact, weaken contestation and resistance and channel politics into other less radical forms of resistance, as I would suggest we're seeing in the case of Palestine. So these are questions that I'm increasingly concerned with in my own work, but they're questions that I want to suggest, and, and that's all I'll do for now, suggest, uh, questions right, for which Pashukanis and his analysis remain salient. For anti-imperialists today, especially those engaging with law and legal argument, Pashukanis should be foremost on our minds. All right, I've moved somewhat away from where I started, so let me briefly return then to the influence of Pashukanis concretely on, uh, or that he has had, and just as importantly um, should have, on today's Marxist legal thinkers. So I began by suggesting that the influence of Pashukanis on a new generation of Marxist legal think thinkers is noteworthy. Uh, particularly important in introducing this generation to Pashukanis was, of course, China's work, 
particular between equal rights. I think it's no coincidence that so many of today's Pashukanite legal scholars uh, are working in and with international law specifically. My own discovery of Pashukanis as a law student struggling to marry my Marxism with a first year US law school curriculum was not initially China, uh, but a somewhat obscure blog called Law and Disorder by a then young, obnoxiously precocious law student, Rob. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was from reading, religiously I should say, Rob's blog, that I first came both to Pashukanis, uh, but also to China's work on Pashukanis. Um, and although it's been 13 years and seven days exactly since the last post on that blog, uh, I'm quite confident that I was not alone in this room, possibly even, in experiencing the reading of that blog as a very much formative intellectual experience. Regardless, though, of how one came to Pashakanis, his influence on today's generation of Marxist legal thinkers, I think, can hardly be denied. And indeed, looking around the room, I see many scholars who engage with his theories directly, but just as many whose work is more subtly influenced by his insights and analysis. Also striking, although perhaps not so much in this room, is the influence of Pastokanis on those animated, not by an embrace of his ideas, but a rejection of, or at least an antagonism towards his analysis, from the open hostility of someone like Akbar Rasulov to the more subtle antagonism of someone like Dina Zavala. Um, I don't think that, uh, I do think rather, that this is an, also an important aspect of Pashokanis' influence on today's Marxist legal scholars. Uh, I say this with, with the utmost respect for, for, for people like Akbar and Dina. Uh, so I said earlier that one can exaggerate the novelty of all of this, uh, especially, I think, if one is Anglo-centric. Across the channel, right, already, and I mentioned this in, in my question earlier in the first panel, uh, across the channel already in the 1970s, there were significant engagements with Pashukanis in France, but also in Portugal, where the Queen Brother Professor Sovereign Martins produced the first Portuguese translation of the general theory, and in Spain in the work of people like Adolfo Sanchez Vasquez. Even in the UK, right, by the 1980s, as we've heard, we find Pashukanis featuring prominently in the early work of people like the legal sociologist Robert Fine. That said, all of this is, though, undoubtedly of a different order, I think, than today's interest in Pashukanis. The only engagement with Pashukanis comparable to today's, specifically Anglo-Marxist scholars, that I know of uh, is to be found in Brazil. Right? And here its origins are at least, I think, a generation earlier. So there one finds some engagement with Pashukanis as early as the 50s in Miguel Real or Orlando Gomez. Uh, in the 1970s, in Carlos Simois. Um, but it's the 1980s that are most significant here, too, when Marcio Bilarinho Naves introduced Pashukanis to a new generation of Brazilians. Uh, and indeed, four, late, four decades later, my sense is, I'm happy to be corrected, uh, that a new generation, sorry, that, that four decades later, Pashukanis is the dominant figure in the Brazilian Marxist legal academy. I will do. Um, even right, that country's current. Could be more subtle. Yeah, quite. Uh, all right, even even that country's current Minister of Human Rights and Citizenship, citizenship Silvio Luis de Almeida, has written glowingly of Pasha. Could you imagine a British Minister of Government writing about Pasha Canis, let alone glowingly? Um, unfortunately, right, the Brazilian legal academy is just as parochial and indeed monoglot as a British legal academy. Uh, and so there's very little dialogue between the two. Um, so this centenary year of celebration uh, is all the more exciting, I think, not merely right, as an opportunity to affirm the importance of Pashukanis' analysis of the legal form, but to connect otherwise disparate national traditions that can only, I think, enrich one another and offer new insights. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to start by thanking uh, Eva, Tanzil, uh, Fernando, and Rob for taking the initiative to organize uh, this event. Uh, now, the fact that about a century ago, the working class movement was rising, both politically and intellectually, means that there are lots of centenaries that give us plenty of opportunities to discuss the relevance of uh, Marxist thought in contemporary society. But it is not just the commemorative events that make Marxism relevant. The combination of successive economic crises and the rise of authoritarianism has led to a notable growth uh, of Marxist studies and Marxist legal studies. And the work of Pasukanis, uh, as Thor said earlier, uh, has been central in the attempt of various legal scholars to navigate around the Marxist categories and explore their analytical value regarding legal and political phenomena. Now, in this paper, I want to focus on Pasukanis' contribution to a classic Marxist hypothesis, which is the withering away of the state and law. Now, such a discussion might seem like a distraction or utopian, but it is nonetheless extremely urgent, considering that capital society has reached such levels of sepsis and decay that engagement with a new vision of post-capital society, in fact, communist society, is essential to inspire the social movements necessary to overcome the contradictions of capitalism. Now, the withering away of the state and law is a hypothesis that, even though not proposed by Marx himself, flows from the general points of uh, his analysis of the capitalist mode of production. Uh, Friedrich Engels famously claimed that uh, once society reorganizes production on the basis of the free and equal association of the producers, the whole machinery of the state will be put into the Museum of Antiquities. And Marx himself mentions the three historical milestones that need to be achieved before the narrow horizon of bourgeois is crossed. Uh, the first is the elimination of the subordination of the individual to the division of labor. The second is the transformation of labor from a means of life to life's prime want. And the third is the expansion of productive forces so that all the springs of commonwealth flow more abundantly. For Lenin, the question of the withering away of the state is a question of the development of the necessary consciousness and ethics, which Lenin refers to as habit, and the creation of the necessary economic conditions for such consciousness and ethics to develop. Now, I argue that Pasukanis' contribution to this debate consists primarily in his argument on the historicity of the legal form. And first of all, the notion itself, the legal form. It is very important because it enables us to understand law and rights, not just as normative standards regulating social behavior, but also as forms of social consciousness. And I'm using the term social consciousness here to refer to the collectively organized, harmonized modes of conceiving reality, which are shared by individuals in a society and which reflect and counteract upon social processes, practices, relations, and institutions. And this is the way that another Soviet theorist, Ewald Ilyenkov, um, uses the term. And according to him, social consciousness from the very beginning precedes individual consciousness as something already given and existing before, outside, and independent of individual consciousness. Law is commonly perceived as an objective and ineradicable form of the external world based on which we understand and analyze the totality of socio-political processes. But it is only a fetishized or reified form of collectively organized experience. Legal and political forms have crystallized in social consciousness and are reinforced by habit and tradition, but they are historical. And this means that new forms may develop on the basis of different social relations. It follows that the withering away of the state and law refers not only to the dying out of political and legal institutions, but also to the abolition of the predominant forms 
of social consciousness in capital society and their replacement by other new forms of social consciousness particular to the social relations that transcend capitalism. Additionally, it follows that the process of developing these new forms of social consciousness is equally, if not more, long and difficult as the process of developing new institutional forms. Now, Pasukanis' work is valuable for establishing the historicity of the legal form. Pasukanis defined the legal form as the quote that uh, Tor already used, the specific set of relations which human beings enter into not by conscious choice, but because the relations of production compel them to do so. And for him, the conflict of private interests is a basic prerequisite for legal regulation and consequently, it constitutes the origin of the legal form. So the legal form is the inevitable reflex of the commodity relation. It emerges with the beginning of commodity exchange, but reaches, reaches its full development with the onset of the capitalist mode of production as pre speakers in the previous panel already uh, uh, explained. So according to Pasukanis, one, the legal form has pre-existed capital society, and two, it becomes dominant, the dominant form of social consciousness in capital society. Now, it has been argued by several thinkers and uh, previous speakers already referred to this critique, but the main weakness of uh, Pasukanis' analysis uh, is his apparent emphasis on uh, the process of circulation, the sphere of circulation, rather than the process of production. And according to this view, um, his argument that the possibility of a dispute between sovereign, formally equal individuals gives rise to the legal form is problematic because this possibility pre-exists capital society and cannot adequately explain why the legal form becomes the dominant form of social consciousness at this historical period. So it is not the possibility of the dispute, but instead the actuality of exploitation, which renders the legal form the dominant form of social consciousness and social regulation in capitalism. It is not the general relation of exchange, but the special exchange relation between uh, uh, capitalist and worker, where labor power is sold as a commodity, which necessitates the role and place of the legal form in capitalism. So the legal form is an essential precondition for the non-coercive extraction of surplus value on which capitalism rests. Formalism, individualism, adversarial setting, as well as the universal validity of freedom, equality, and property constitute the essential characteristics of the bourgeois legal form. And these characteristics are necessary for a class divided society relying on commodity exchange and labor exploitation. Now, one may agree with those critiques of Pasukanis, or one may argue that uh, this is already there uh, in Pasukanis, but in any case, it follows uh, that Pasukanis' argument on the historicity of the legal form leaves open the possibility of a social formation where the legal form has been replaced partly or wholly by other forms of social consciousness and social regulation. The question is, does the existence of the legal form in pre-capitalist social formations leave open the possibility of post-capitalist social formations where the legal form exists but is not the predominant form of social consciousness and social regulation. In other words, is all law bourgeois law or can there be such a thing as socialist or proletarian law? And related to this, can we even speak of a communist legality like Igor Soikedbrod does in his very recent work? Now, I believe that the methodological key to theoretically answer this question is to ask what differentiates the bourgeois legal form from pre-bourgeois uh, legal forms or post-capitalist legal forms. Now, Pasukanis' approach to this question reflects the contradictions that characterized the revolutionary process in the context of which he was writing. And in the first revolutionary period in the Soviet Union, uh, this was characterized by strong condemnation 
of uh, the legal form. The idea that law was essential to the suppression of the working class led many Soviet lawyers uh, to view law itself as a purely bourgeois phenomenon. According to another Soviet jurist uh, mentioned earlier, Alexander Hoy uh, Goichbar, the temple of bourgeois authority uh, is legislation in its fetish is the law, which makes the law the sanctuary of the exploiting classes. On the contrary, according to this theorist, the temple of the socialist world system is administration and its divine services work. Now, Pashukanis too shared Engels' view that administration of things through technical rules would replace the government uh, of people by legal regulation. And according to him, there could be no such thing as a socialist or proletarian law. But the second revolutionary period saw a change in the Soviet jurists' uh, view on the role of law in socialist society. During the 1930s, in conditions of intense class struggle between different social elements, as well as deep antagonism between the socialist relations of production and market elements, law was not withering away, as was mentioned earlier, but its presence was increasing in Soviet society. And in that context, the Soviet jurists argued that the need was not to eliminate all law, but to eliminate the bourgeois features of law. Additionally, socialist law was not considered as merely a further development of bourgeois law, but a new type of law that was the expression of the will of the entire Soviet people. And in this context, Pashukanis was led to revise some of his views before his eventual arrest and execution in this tragic unfolding of uh, the Soviet revolution that was already referred to earlier. Now, to conclude, uh, the main point of this paper is that Pashukanis' argument on the historicity of the legal form is crucial for grasping the possibility of the withering away of the legal form and its replacement by different forms of social consciousness in a post-capitalist society. I know that Fernando tomorrow will share his views on this uh, topic. I have my own views, which I'll gladly share tomorrow. But to finish, what exactly will replace the legal form, as well as whether a socialist law or a communist legality are possible are both questions left open for history to decide. Thanks very much. Okay, so we have uh, about 20 minutes left for questions and comments. Anybody like to start us off? Bill. Sure, that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks for three very, very stimulating uh, papers and um, <clears throat> very interested to see what directions Tor and Creature will be going in. Um, Dimitrios, uh, you picked up uh, Goichbar. But of course, Goichbarg was the person who reintroduced the civil code, was it not, in conditions of NEP. And uh, as a provocative question, is not the Soviet experience a demonstration of the thesis of Marx and of Engels that you cannot have uh, socialist law or socialist legal theory? And they were absolutely not about having blueprints for what would happen um, as a result of a revolution. And uh, I don't think, um, you know, so I think we've already been discussing, or I've tried to uh, outline how Pashikanis based his theory on uh, the revolution having happened, and law therefore disappearing, and we've heard more about that. And so I, I'm deeply sympathetic to people who are lawyers uh, wanting to be able to theorize what they do, and in particular, lawyers who are Marxists. Uh, Marx, of course, je ne suis pas Marxiste, and he was very clear that uh, he did not want to be a Marxist. Um, he was a communist. And of course, you know, the de definition of communism being uh, that it's struggle in the present circumstances, concrete circumstances in which we find ourselves. So, Provocatively, I ask, um, 
does uh, Pastor Carnes actually give us a way forward as lawyers seeking to understand what it is we might be doing and whether it has the possibility of any emancipatory effect? Please, thanks. Thanks, Will. Um... Yes, I mean, it's a, a huge discussion about what the Soviet experience uh, confirms uh, or not. Uh, does it confirm that there cannot be a socialist law? I'm not so sure. Uh, and I'm not sure that this was the view of Marx and Engels, to be honest. Uh, there is a statement on the critique of the Gotha program about the narrow horizon of bourgeois right. But... Uh, there's also the view expressed that socialist construction is a process that will take a long time. What happens in that process and what forms, uh, what institutional forms, uh, political, legal, uh, this can give rise to, uh, we cannot be sure because the Soviet revolution was uh, uh, overturned, let's say. Uh, and again, it, it depends and everybody has their own views on when this happened and you know what is the uh, the point. Sorry? Well, yes, but uh, I'm not sure that this is the place. Um, but yes, as far as uh, whether Pasukans can give us a way forward as lawyers, uh, again, I'm not so sure. I don't consider myself a lawyer. I mean, I haven't practiced law. I started training as a lawyer, but I never practiced. Uh, I teach law. Um, I think that Pasukanis can give us a lot as legal scholars and as teachers of law, uh, introduce our students to what law is. And again, I think the main contribution, as other speakers already noted, is uh, the focus not on the legal content and a critique of you know specific regulations or uh, acts of parliament, but the critique on the legal form what it is, uh, and why it is specific to capitalism. Uh, thank you, yeah. So the question about post, um, will we have law after the revolution? Um, I find it really interesting that people even ask that question um, because, and I think it, it prompts me to ask people why do you, or like the, the people that ask that question often uh, try to make the, the case for there being possibility of socialist law or proletarian law or whatever and that makes me want to ask you what is your attachment to law that you so why can't you imagine a, a world without law like can you inter interrogate that in your in your mind that you what about if we create the imaginary space in which we can actually think of how we organize uh, a world without a law, that is the more interesting question. Um, in terms of, as lawyers, what do we do? I don't know, Marx had a law degree, right? Like Marx did his PhD in law. I don't know if he self-identified as a lawyer, but I mean, <laughs> I'm an, I, I hmm? Right, exactly, right? Like, like, what is it to what? What does it mean to say I'm a lawyer? Like, I, ha I have a law degree. I qualified. I practiced. or whatever. I'm not. A, I'm. That doesn't mean that I believe in. It's a diploma. I have that. It, I could stick on the wall if I wanted to, but it's not. It's not. Um, it doesn't commit me to any type of uh, a method of, for political change, I don't think. And that's why I was saying earlier, it's so great to see also academics and academic lawyers out on the barricades and on the blockades and things like that. Um, because we, you know, perhaps we have um, a way of, of seeing that, um, a way of understanding uh, the way that law works and also doesn't work for the purposes, it, for its stated purposes. And perhaps our job as perhaps as lawyers or as people who've been trained in the law, is actually to um, explain that to others who kind of still believe in law, like still believe in Santa Claus kind of thing, like to actually like take that um, 
Wait, now about um, I. For example, the the South Africa case, right? Like, of course, it does massively increase people's uh, like understanding of what's happening. Loads of people tuned in to watch the ICJ this morning. It helps people understand how international law works. It helps people the facts as they put them down, the arguments as they put them down. It was all like super clear and super passionate and really, really strong and fierce. The the, the women, especially who were. Uh, in court this morning, and I think that's really powerful. And it doesn't mean that I believe that law as a or the legal institution of the ICJ is going to save the day, not at all. And I do think that um, we all go through a process of perhaps having that hope. I like 10, 15 years ago, I was a human rights lawyer, yay, human rights, whatever, you know. And there, there are people all over that are going through that process and will have. Uh, an understanding about different ways of social um, social change and like break uh, yeah so breaking that spell is our job. Would you? Excellent. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, um, I'm not sure who is first. <laughs> Maybe David. <clears throat> I've got quite a parochial question, um, but I, I'm kind of interested in this. Like, I don't want to get involved in any more mutual bat slapping. I think there's been enough of that, like naming names of all the, the great heroes that have brought Pashikanis back. Um, and and But I do, in a way, want to sort of say that, that it's probably quite significant that it was in the topic of international law that happened. That's a question, right? I don't know, because it seems to me to be odd that... that China, Rob, you know, Tors reading this stuff, and and of course, Greta, are all in this in, in reflected on international law, and it seems to me that's not an obvious, it's not actually an obvious thing. A more obvious thing for me would be, or a more obvious question would be, why is Pashukanis not central in critical criminology, for example, right? Because, and you and you can see that there was some tech, people have mentioned Ben Fine, but nobody's you know mentioned people like David Greenberg or. Colin Sumner or critical criminologists who were around the late 70s, early 80s who were using Pasha Kansas, and then it goes, poof, it disappears, vanishes. And it vanishes in the midst of the split between left idealism. I know nobody here is interested, but I, I used to be interested in this stuff, right? But it vanishes in the split between left realism and left idealism. And it's obvious to me that at some point abolitionism doesn't go within critical criminology. It's obvious to me that Pasha Khan should be there somewhere, but it's not. It, the, the abolitionism in critical criminology is completely devoid of a Marxist account, I think. You know, it's not not completely devoid, but but pretty much. So I suppose, sorry, that's a very long-winded way of asking a question. Why international law? Why not other fields, right? Why And, and why not the most obvious one that, that should be dealing with the commodity form? With, with social relations through property and how that's upheld, crit critical criminology, right? So I'm not asking for an answer to why not, but I, I suppose I'm asking why, why international law? Thank you. Thanks. I don't want you to say it's because of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, who's going to have a go at that? <laughs> yes, well, well, all right, okay, you can comment. I don't know. I mean, I just want to make a comment and ask a question. Oh, well, invite us to reflect on, you know, the, the Gaza issue and, you know, and by extension, how do we approach the role of the law in times of struggle? Um, and I, I, it seems to me that, first of all, um, we we do tend to view the Palestinian struggle through a Euro, Eurocentric um, lens. Uh, the Palestinians have a, have experienced the falsehood of the legal form on their body, so there is no question that they do not look to the law for liberation. But you know, in in our us um, evaluating whether the law has a role to play in the process of liberation. 
it seems to me that we need to distinguish between tactics and strategy. The ICJ claim was tactically, I consider, extremely important on two grounds. One, the potential for stopping the killing. And second, the uh, highlighting of the issue of exceptionalism in the legal form. Who, uh, who merits to be exceptional? Strategically, I don't think anybody actually relies on the law to achieve uh, the liberation of Palestine. Um, and I just invite your comments. Mike. Thank you. I have a similar question about... Last question and I'll ask... Okay. Um, about why international law? Because uh, I feel like international society is a premature society. In international law is kind of premature law comparing to domestic law. And I I I have obsessed with Martin Koskaniemi, who's also a critical legal scholar in international law. And he said international law is an open platform for everyone to mod, mod, modify and to implore. For example, uh, South America could use ICJ to sue Israel and people's permanent tribunal in South America could bring suits against American. So I, I was also wondering why international law that is more close to Pashukhanis instead of domestic law. Thank you. Okay, so I'll ask each of the three panelists to uh, Try and answer some of some of that and, and sum up a bit. It will impair my hearing. Oh yes, of course, yes. You go first, please. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not I don't have a good question answer to, to, to David, who's now not paying attention. I don't I mean I think I think we there is something conjunctural there, and and but my, I mean, my my instinctive answer is to be sort of autobiographical, which is precisely what you don't want, right? Which is to say, at that particular, and I don't think it is important, right? But we can't. This this there are material right um, reasons for for these developments, but also there's some contingency there, and I happen to be reading a particular blog, and I read China's book, and I was interested in international issues, and I decided to go to law school, and suddenly all of those interests aligned so that, such that I was drawn to international law and Marxism at similar times, and they came into conversation. You know, is that true generally across the board of all of these Pashukanite international lawyers? Probably not, but um, there was something, right? And and But so, so, and the fact that Rob and China were already writing about these issues and engaged in that speaks to something more structural that I could then attach and be drawn to that. Concretely, I don't know though. I mean, maybe others have a have a better insight into that. I'm sure Rob has a, a so, yeah, Rock too, right? I, I, so I so specifically, but 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 my, I, I have a less clear concept of of why Pashukanas and international law. I do think that there is a turn to international law more generally, right, that that goes with Iraq, right, um, and, and those sort of, you know, that moment in time, but also it, it's, it's part of a, sort of a more analysis of the long durée, which is the, the, the supplanting of, of anti-imperialism, right, as the language and the, the, the you know, the left imagination or the imagination or imaginary of left internationalism by other Vulgate's vernaculars, right, where international law comes to play a particular role. Um, Salir Moendesi has a new book, of, I guess it's not new so much anymore, right, about specifically the emergence of human rights as an emancipatory language that supplants anti-imperialism. I think that analysis can be more generalized to international legal language more generally and international legal argument. Um, so I think, right, that, that the, there's something about the emergence of an embrace of international law by the left or by yeah, by the left, amongst others, but also liberals, right? That goes hand in hand with the decline or the defeat, right, of the third world movement, of workers' movements, of 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 anti-imperialism as a as an international movement. Um, 
and, and, and Pastor Kenneth specifically must uh, is presumably part of that same story, although I can't articulate that at this stage. Yeah. Um, but to speak to the tactical, I mean, the tactical strategy questions are, are quite right. I think I disagree somewhat with Gretia. So I don't, I think, I mean, you say that 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 the ICJ case, right, educates us or shows us how international law works. I think it it, it, it educates us or gives us a, a bourgeois narrative of how international law works. But I think, right, that that tactical strategy, strategic question is is precisely the risk that that simply re reifies a particular right, that bourgeois story and masks or makes us sort of start investing in, in international law or the ICJ. No, of course. Well, no, but but that's where I disagree, right? So, you 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 said that right quite cynically and correctly cynically that the ICJ will presumably just right rearticulate an argument that Israel has a right to self defense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But surely the Pashukanite insight would be to say it doesn't matter. The ICJ could come up, could have the you know a super and you know pro Palestinian position. Say Israel has no such right to self defense. It's genocide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Pastor Kenai insight would be doesn't matter, right? Because the very form that they're engaging with, that they're articulating these political analysis through the legal form, is itself fraught, right? And and historically contingent and wrapped up in all you know. And we should be skeptical, sort of with you know, with the institution to court, not simply because it comes up with a particular anyway. We could go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would. I mean, we can talk about this for hours, but we, I won't. But <clears throat> both a positive and a negative out. I'm not saying at all that the South Africa shouldn't have brought that case. Up. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare say that. But um, both a positive outcome for South Africa and a negative one have. Uh, negative implications in the sense that a positive outcome would reinforce the fact that, yeah, we can believe in international law. That's kind of also what I said in my talk. And that's not what a negative outcome, um, of course, is negative in the sense that the killing will continue and a lot more people will, will die in the meantime. But at the same time, we've also got to start thinking about how we, how to affect, I mean, not starting about, but continue and redouble our efforts in thinking about how can we um, affect social change differently and do revolution. Um, about um, Greenberg, yeah, um, <laughs> I was just um, reading a book by uh, Green, uh, Greenberg, The Construction for Homosexuality, and he does a really good job at like explaining the, um, the, the doing a historical material is basically a, 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 um, analysis of of the introduction of um, of the homosexual subject, not so much about the law, but this is um, I don't I think my story about how I came to Pashkan is the same as Taurus and also as as Rob's. The my LLM year was the the year that the, um, there was uh, the decision. You know, Tony Blair was going to war in Iraq. There were a million people in the street. We had the was there was there not going to be a second resolution, etc. The, the, we had um, Elizabeth Wilmshurst they coming to give a lecture. We had Greenwood coming to to uh, teach on the LLM, etc. All this kind of stuff that was going on that was the hot topic. We had the teachers. We had the teachers of international law letter that you know we had pretty much again, pretty much again, like um, a few a couple of months ago. Um, International law is just much more interesting than that. Uh, very briefly, I think uh, on the question why international law, even though I'm not an international legal scholar, so again, you're not looking for the biographical or anecdotal uh, view. Uh, I think because at the international level, uh, it's much more evident what the law is. So if we see that Mark said between equal rights, force decides, yes, that's true. But at the international level, I think even between unequal rights, force decides. I mean, uh, if there is one party that is right and the other that is wrong, force will decide and the wrong will prevail. I mean, it's, uh, it's much more obvious at the international level. Who enforces international law? I mean, if you were asking me, uh, while I was doing my undergraduate, I didn't believe that international law is actual law because of asking that question, who enforces it? 
Mayans. Yes, so, okay. so we've heard uh, three quite varied papers, very interesting discussion, especially about international law and so on. So can we just thank the three three speakers? Okay, well, if we can uh, take our seats so we can make a start uh, on the for the plenary. <laughs> okay, so hello and welcome to the second. Uh, oh, no, no, that's the those are the wrong notes. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so what today uh, has intended to do is explore and examine both the uh, ideation of Pashakanian thought. And I think this is something that Bill alluded to in his talk, uh, particularly as legal and socio-legal studies embarks on the revitalization of Marxist and Pashakanian thought, as well as to focus our attention on the ways in which Pashakanis has been received in contemporary scholarship. Uh, and to that end, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers for our day one plenary uh, on reception and new directions. And what we want to do here in very broad and relaxed strokes, is to discuss both contemporary treatments of Pashukanis' work, as well as to get a sense of how non-lawyers understand Pashukanis and the relationship between law and capitalism more broadly. I'm going to introduce each speaker before they speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and um, we'll go in the order of the way that they are sitting from uh, left to right. Uh, so firstly to uh, China Mayville. So China is an award-winning speculative fiction writer, essayist, and comic book author. He is the author of several books, including The City and the City, which won a raft of awards and was adopted into a BBC TV series in 2018. Padilla Street Station, which won the Arthur C. Clarke Award and was ranked by the magazine Locus as one of the top 10 fantasy novels published in the 20th century. And confusingly to me, when I was an undergrad, Between Equal Rights, a Marxist theory of international law. And I remember thinking how much of a coincidence it was that the author of this book shared the same name as an esteemed science fiction writer. Uh, China completed his PhD in international law at LSE uh, and uh, was a Frank Knox fellow at Harvard University. He's also written several other nonfiction books, including October, the story of the Russian Revolution, and has a forthcoming book called The Book of Elsewhere, co-authored with none another than Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I, I've read that right. There we go. So um, over to you, China. Uh, thank you. Am I audible? Broadly? Okay, cool. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's It's been a, a long time since I've written on Pashukanis, and, and it's, a, it's really lovely to to be uh, back among uh, Pashukanites, as the noun appears to be emerging. Um, um, so just, um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about uh, uh, potential directions for future research and, and sort of try and embed my own approach to Pashukanis, which of course I hope has nuanced over the years since publishing and reading, but has remained fairly faithful to the position that I took um, in, in that book, although I have genuinely learned a lot from the people here and that's changed some of my opinions. And I wanna thank um, uh, Grisha for uh, talking about the great uh, catastrophic event going on and bringing that to bear on this issue. Um, and also to, and in a sense to kind of make the point that one can talk about these quite abstract ideas in a concrete, in a concrete way. At the same time, I also want to kind of gently, and, and I hope, a, a comradely fashion push back against Bill, who, who, who said uh, about the potential for abstract discussions to be a distraction, and um, there's a potential for anything to be anything, I guess. Um, and I want to, I want to say that a lot of what I'm going to be saying is.
quite abstract. And I, to an extent, make no apologies for that because I don't think there's an automatic distinction between abstraction and, and concrete action, um, although of course there can be. So as an introduction to the kind of overall heuristic that I would like to see, uh, um, that for me was the great draw of Pashukanis and that I think um, I would like to see developed and come back to again and again uh, over in this kind of new Pashukanite moment is, is, is the draw of totality. And I think for me, the great power of Pashukanis uh, is the great power of Marxism, which is in <clears throat> one hopes and intends a non-dogmatic fashion it is a total theory. It is a theory of everything. Now, obviously, that can be deployed in a catastrophic way uh, to simply say anything I'm not concerned with is not important. But it can also, I think, be used in a very powerful way, drawing on angles, which is, you know, everything affects every other thing and vice versa. And so this is a theory in which, you know, French exchange rates and women's oppression and Mickey Mouse are related to each other. They are part of the same thing. And this is one of the things that I think Pashukanis, uh, although he focuses on a particular aspect, is, is, is very powerfully placed to do. And I'm gonna approach that in terms of three, uh, uh, three sections, one, which is basically, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, talk about it in terms of temporality. So I wanna focus firstly on something to do with the past, then the present, then the future, in terms of uh, possible directions for Pashukanicism. And of course, being totalizing, these are all related to each other. So this is a, a somewhat rough and ready distinction. So to start with the past, I want to suggest uh, that Pashukanis can be brought very fruitfully uh, into conversation with the recent work of Jairus Banerjee, particularly A Brief History of Commercial Capitalism, which I think is uh, an astounding agenda setting piece of work. Uh, very broadly, I'm sure many people in this room have read it, very broadly, it's um, uh, a his history and a historiographical approach to various articulations of a profit-driven system going back to the 12th century and before, um, wherein merchant capital is used not only to circulate commodities, but in various different ways, and that's very important, in various uh, um, uneven and combined ways, if you like, to control production uh, and to subordinate production and the relations concomitant on production to the interest of that merchant capital. Now, uh, as Paul Tedesco has put it, this is a frontal assault, a frontal attack on the traditional Marxist dichotomy between the sphere of circulation and that of production. Now, Banerjee is a very strange book because if you read it and you are uh, not particularly well versed, and why should you be in certain aspects of Marxist theory, then you're very likely to come away and think this is a really interesting book of history. But if you happen to be broadly read up on debates in political Marxism and modes of production analysis and things like that, then you're like, this is a nuclear bomb in the field. But he doesn't say so. It's a book that hides its own light under a bushel in a very interesting way and a very frustrating way as a fan of it. So I want to propose that, for one, for example, I think it is a severe challenge to political Marxism. Um, and I say this as someone who's learned a lot from the political Marxist tradition, who's always been critical of it, but in a, I hope, a comradely and open-minded fashion, um, but both in terms of the historiography um, that he outlines, in terms of the way he pitches the trajectories of capitalism and pitches them way back further than uh, is traditionally associated in and out of political Marxism. And finally, in terms of the, as Tedesco says, the, well, as Tedesco implies, I should say, the de destruction of the separation of the economic and the political. I think this is a powerful attack on a, on a, on a current. In Re Pashukanis, I think this book does several things. One is it presents a very, very powerful challenge, which I'm glad to hear is something which many people here have already addressed to this idea that like uh, capital, uh, Pashkanis either doesn't address or can't account for pre-capitalist law. Now, I think one of the things that the, the Banerjee book does is simply say, you know, as a matter of fact, if you've got these kind of relations, you're going to have these legal regimes a long time previously, but at a deeper level of structure, it also starts to outline 
why this is and the dynamics within them so that it becomes more than a mere oh no here it is we can fit it in it becomes part of a total history of international and indeed if you like domestic law going forward um it also the Banerjee brings um as tedesco does say the centrality of commodity circulation right back in um and i again i've been very glad to hear some of the I, you know i think that um the 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 criticism of Pashukhanis from a certain schools of traditional uh, Marxism that he focuses on circulation, I think, as Bonafelt has said, I think is, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a, 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 it's just a fallacious understanding of the totality of capitalism. But I would go further and say that it is a kind of sentimentalism about production. It is a kind of high theory iteration of workerism. You know, we're interested in the horny-handed stuff where people are pushing big machines around, um, and. Capitalism doesn't work that way, and this is a sentimentalism of theory. And Banerjee very quietly says, your theories of the way capitalism arises are false, and here's why. And also, just in passing, I think this goes some way towards addressing the point that David rose, which is why international law in recent theories? I think there's various reasons, and Rob has mentioned some, and you know the, the, the interest during Iraq and so on. There is also always elements of contingency. But I think, going back to something I said 15, 20, 20, Jesus, 20 years ago, I think it's also a fact that the non-superordinate authority, the fact that there is no superordinate authority in international law precisely does, A, outline Pashukhanis' theory more clearly than in domestic law. Um, and I think that, uh, I can't remember what B was, um, but the point is, when you're talking about this historic this history, you're talking about exchange relations between organized polities as much or more, and certainly more importantly at a, at a societal structuring level than between individuals. So proto-international law, proto-interpolity law is precisely both as a matter of logic and history at the core, at the key of law. And this is a vindication of Pashukhanis. So for the past, I would like people to bring in Banerjee. For the present, and I'm going to draw here something, Rob has said this as well, and not for the first time, Rob and I have been pursuing sort of parallel trajectories. So if anyone's heard Rob talk about this, I want to be clear that I haven't stolen it from him and he's given me permission to talk about it here, um, which is, it has surprised me for some time that unless I've missed it, which is perfectly possible, I haven't seen anyone bringing in, in a systematic way, bringing Pashukhanis into conversation with the discussion around real abstraction. And this seems to me to be, I'm talking, you know, uh, most recently the big, uh, a lot of work about Son Rettel and intellectual and manual labor, but there's also a, a longer tradition and Lukács and so on. But this seems to me to be an extraordinary lacuna in the field um, and ripe for engagement. So just very briefly, the, you know, the Son Rettelian approach to real abstraction, uh, Son Rettel talking about uh, a pure form of abstraction had to emerge and be admitted into reflective thought with essentially commodification and importantly, the, the introduction of money. We reason that this could result only through the generalization intrinsic in the monetary commensura commensuration of commodity values promoted by coinage. Now, and, and this is where we get to um, the nature of the relationship between a real abstraction and an ideology because Crucially, a real abstraction is not an ideology, but sometimes you will see certain kinds of, I suppose, certain kinds of post Althusserians sort of say it is not at all a theory of ideology, which seems to me to be wholly bogus. It is in part a theory that raises issues of ideology because it is precisely about categories. What it does is it leads, uh, it, it opens up categories of thought that become not, it's not a question of so much of what is possible because this doesn't foreclose anyone thinking anything. What it does is it is about what kinds of thought, thinking, and categories of thinking can have social traction, can become meaningful at more than an individual outlier, idiosavant level. Um, and this, and when you consider, uh, we've heard all the, the wonderful quotes that Grish has used and so on about, you know, um, uh, you know, it is not by conscious choice that people become essentially legal subjects. It's because they are 
bearers of the abstract rights because of commodity exchange, and that the legal subject is, to quote Pashkans, the abstract owner of commodities raised to the heavens. Um, as a side note, I think if anyone wants to see, I think, a exquisite um, exposition or a kind of articulation of a kind of real abstraction theory historically, I just today found out that Richard Seaford died last month, um, and Richard Seaford's book, um, Money and the Early Greek Mind, is a is an absolutely stunning piece of work about the emergence of a certain kind of consciousness through and in the context and and um, and uh, um, intrinsically imbricated with the emergence of commodity exchange and coinage. So what this allows us to do, if we sort of say that in a sense, I want to argue that Pashikonis is already a theorist of real abstraction. And it's just that the, the real abstraction theorists haven't really picked up on that yet. Um, I'm not having a go at anyone, there's too much to write about, but I would really love that notice to be brought forward because one of the, you know, we are talking about a real abstraction in law. We're talking about the real abstraction of legal fetishization. And one of the things that this can allow us to do, I think, is talk very seriously about the incredibly strong ideological, because real, purchase of the legal form. Um, the uh, the horizon of, 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 of philosophy is essentially jurisprudence in bourgeois society. Um, and Grietje talked about um, the being very struck in, in reading theories about uh, subjectivity, about the elision of legal subjectivity and subjectivity to court. And on the one hand, this is a, an expression of, of, of ideological failure. And on the other hand, it's accurate. The subject is the legal subject, you know, and this is one of the ways we can get to this. Um, I think this also, um, no, I'll move on because I'm taking too long. Um, this would also, uh, that, you know, much of this I'm making suggestions, but at this point I want to kind of open. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit over 15. Okay, but not much. Um, I want to essentially kind of plead for something, which is that there is, it seems to me, an opportunity to uncover the specific real abstractions of the legal form, as opposed to the real abstractions of the commodity form, because they are both inextricable, but not isomorphic. And one of the things I'd love to see from research is what those real abstractions are, because I don't know. And that's why I want to see that developed. And finally, I'm going to talk about the future and the relationship of Pashukanis and Pashukanite theory to the future. And here, um, I was really delighted to agree to talking so much about abolitionism, um, because, um, as they said, in certain respects, Pashkanis is, is an abolitionist avant la lettre. But it's worth taking stock of the shape of the debate on the left about abolition, because it has been, for the most part, I think, fairly unedifying. There's been a kind of weird shitstorm element to a kind of, you know, sensible social democrats versus... Um, uh, uh, um, abolitionist, um, uh, I want to put it in a non value laden way. Um, but the idea, you know, the critics of abolitionism will say, well, this is just silly swaggering. Um, you know, how, what do you mean abolish the family? What do you mean abolish prisons? This is ridiculous. And then on the other hand, if you come from a position where you are interested in ruptural politics and a literal sense of the reconfiguration of totality, including the real abstractions and the humans able to, to be developed after the end of that kind of abstraction, what else are you here to do? What are you doing if not that? But to be generous to the critics, there are problems sometimes with the collapse of slogan and aspiration. If you say you want to abolish something, it is left unclear whether you mean I want to, you know, by fiat, get rid of it tomorrow, or I look forward to the day when this no longer exists. Now, at a level of slogan, that may not be the worst sin, but it does become unhelpful when theoretical debates are essentially missing each other because one person is arguing with a placard. Um, and I think that Pashukanis is really, really powerful here. As a, an aside, I, draw, I, I essentially agree with Richard Seymour, which is that for the most part, without suggesting that this means that no meaningful and indeed very serious and deep structural reforms can be affected, because uh, they can, but for the most part, I think you can only quote, you can only really make sense of, of abolition as part of a broader strategy to overthrow capitalism. Okay. Um, absent the sense of totality, 
certain wings of the the um, anti-abolitionist left essentially can become kind of quiescent and naturalizing of reification and real abstraction. But again, absent totality, certain uh, uh, a theory of totality and of and of uh, social form and of legal legal real abstraction, the preemptively abolitionist left can tend to moralism and indeed a sense of themselves as the elect and the elite, which is like, you know, we are capable of doing transformative justice, for example, as if even if you decide to bypass the bourgeois state, you're not saturated with legal fetishism, as if you're not saturated with, with the muck of history. And I think that Pashukanis, in a sense, is far less bothered about this debate than we are, because it is simply, in, in quite a bracing way, because it is simply self-evident to him that where you've got commodities, you've got law, and then once we get rid of a system of generalized commodity uh, uh, circulation and exploitation, you're not going to have law. Um, and that kind of, if you like, sort of rather bracing, um, uh, sensible, uh, sort of sensibly non-agonized um, attitude to abolition seems to me to be um, very, very sensible. And uh, I know I'm, I know I'm near the end, but so this is essentially a distinction between abolition and the withering away. And I was very, very glad to hear um, Demetrius talk about the withering away. Um, abolition is a desire. I don't think it can be a tactic for tomorrow. The, the maneuvering towards it can certainly be a tactic. Um, and I think it's very, it's very noticeable to me that a lot of people, when I hear them talk about Pashkanis, including people who have studied Pashukanis, will talk about Pashukanis wanting to abolish the law. No, that's not what he wanted to do. Um, he believed law would wither away under a communist, uh, in a communist horizon. That's not the same thing. Now, finally, in the last two minutes, I just want to try and address this question of principled opportunism. I've completely rewritten this to try and get to the, some of the stuff that Tor and other people have, have mentioned. Essentially, again, to draw on this notion of totality, the idea, the question that we keep asking, does law have a role to play? Let me put it this way. Law will play a role. Now, it's up to us what we do about that. And I'm not saying that we have an obligation to therefore get involved. In fact, I think it's very healthy that some people don't. But that doesn't mean that I think it's unhealthy if others do. And the like Tor says, recourse to the law might weaken recourse to other more radical approaches. I mean, it might. But I don't think it's inevitable that it does. And this is where the question of the specificity of principled opportunism comes in, which, apart from anything, for me, is about constantly reiterating that you have no respect for law, even if you are uh, turning to it. Um, I'm not suggesting that would be a panacea, but I think it would be a good start. We essentially have no option because of these abstractions in totality to opt out of law. Um, and in the same way as, you know, if our if our pipes burst, we need a plumber. Um, and, you know, we live under the reality of laws, we're going to need lawyers. And there's nothing about the necessary, there's, there's nothing implying the necessary surrender to the legal form of someone who is working on the pipes of capitalism, if you like, in, including in the court system. There is no automatic, um, uh, uh, um, there's no automatic whitewashing of the problems of the legal form in the necessary turn uh, um, to the realities of the legal form in the here and now. So the question is how to make principled opportunism possible. People have talked about the shift away from principled opportunism because it's not just that it's necessary, it is inevitable. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, now to uh, Ruth Fletcher. Ruth is a reader in medical law here at Queen Mary University of London. Ruth's uh, research addresses the relationship between law, health and society through the lens of reproduction. She has an ongoing interest in law's reproductivity, the generation of new legal forms through the synthesis of already existing legal forms. And this has produced critical readings of new governance as it emerges through civic exchange on public health issues. And relevant for us here, it has led to more abstract critiques of Pashukanis' concept of legal form. Ruth's current major project, a monograph in progress entitled Peripheral Life, Governing Travel for uh, uh, Abortion Care. Very outdated, very, very outdated. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. We'll blend the, the website for that. Uh, investigates the significance of shifting abortion restrictions in transnational uh, travel strategies. Um, indeed, Ruth has been at the centre of many uh, important struggles, including around uh, reproductive justice. Obviously, Ruth. 
Thank you, Tanzo, and thanks so much to Ava in particular, who can't be here and who, who I've had lots of conversations with about this event. And so thanks to everybody for making it happen. And thanks for all for being here. And I suppose, yeah, it's been fascinating to me to, as somebody who did engage with Pasha Canis, you know, as a PhD student, and then later kind of mid-career and kind of dipped in and out, it's been really interesting to come back um, to Pasha Canis in this context. Um, uh, and as somebody who came to Pashikanas, you know, wanting to think about legal form and legal subjectivity from feminist work, you know, so it was very much dipping in kind of to Pashikanas and thinking about how these theories of legal form could have. So I'm going to speak to, um, to our discussions from that perspective, trying to think about how reproduction, social reproduction in particular, is not captured or is captured in indirect ways by the commodity form theory and try and think about then what are the attributes, I guess, of, of uh, Pasha Kansas's thought that might lend itself to, um, you know, development, renegotiation of that legal form. Um, and, and, and try and think a little bit about the different trends, I guess, in social reproduction theory that might take us in different directions that way. So basically, um, there's kind of three aspects. We've touched on this uh, so far, but three kind of dimensions of Pasha Kansas's thought in the general theory that it seems to me lend themselves in generative ways to materialist feminist engagement with theorizing social reproduction. Um, and that's particularly the approach to legality and the contrasting that people mentioned earlier between administrative technical regulation and legal regulation, right? So there's ways in which uh, technical regulation has a common purpose and um, can build consensus, has that singular purpose. And that was what Pasha Kanis thought things might move towards. And that's contrasted then with the commodity form, which is it, it doesn't have that single purpose and this conflict is more at the center of that. So I think that's interesting, right? That distinction, um, it's another kind of distinction between administration technique um, and the legal form that we might, that I want to come back to, um, that I think is useful for thinking about what's happening with social reproduction. Um, I think particularly uh, ways in which it's, the, the legal subject is a bearer of property rights. Again, this is a key thesis that everybody's been talking about. The ways in which Pasha Kanis makes it really clear, you know, commodities don't exchange themselves, right? The, the commodity form needed the legal subject in order to be able to play a role in circulation in that exchange. So that specific generation of a legal subjectivity um, as the bearer of property rights is that process of generating the legal subject um, uh, as a bearer of property rights is again a process that we can deploy in other ways. And then as people have been saying, the method, the materialist method of form content analysis. There's a dynamic here that is uh, going on that we talked about as logic and struggle earlier, perhaps, you know, so the work, the abstraction of legal form is doing, it's important abstract work, but it, it, it we're putting it in into use in order to, uh, as Pasha Khan has talked about, in order to, um, to reveal something interesting that's happening in, in actual material relations. So those are sort of, in earlier work, the three kind of dimensions that I tried to draw on um, of Pashkanis' thought that I thought illustrated uh, certain features of the legal regulation of reproduction that aren't easily captured by the commodity form. And so particularly, um, particularly I'm thinking of ways in which um, property ownership is not bequeathed on women or pregnant people or reproducers, right? So we can see that there's a very clear way in which that uh, that form, um, the commodity form and the generation of a property owning subject typically has not, um, has excluded women in particular in relation to reproduction, but lots of different racialized, classed communities, sexualized communities. So we have to look at the underside of that relation and think about the, the forms of inequalities that are also doing work for capitalism, but not directly through the commodity form perhaps, okay? So, so, so that debate, I guess, has been picked up in social reproduction theory then. Obviously, people would be very familiar with the work of Marxist feminists from the 70s and 80s. 
Um, so everybody, you know, I'm thinking of Michelle Barrett, uh, Mary McIntosh, um, thinking of Lise Vogel in particular, um, also thinking about the autom autonomist uh, feminists, the Italian feminists, wages for housework type of debates. And so one of the interesting dynamics, I guess, we see here is ways in which then the role of domestic labour, the, the role of unpaid care labour in reproducing workers for tomorrow, that work is not being directly commodified, right? It's unpaid work. Um, and so wages for housework then was using, you know, the wage relation, the, the, the potential for commodification to make visible the fact that this was work that was important for capitalism, but not paid, not entering into the commodity form. And there's an interesting way in which the, that, you know, there's a, a rhetorical use in wages for housework. It is meant as a desire, as a, a rhetorical claim to make something visible, to make this appearance visible. Um, and, and Federici would say, you know, it's not meant literally, right? It's meant to, to make um, the, using the wage and the contrast, the distinction there to make something visible, but not meant as a, you know, a, a program, as a blueprint or a program for action. Um, so, so then I, I suppose what I want to draw attention to is ways in which, um, at the same time, people like Lise Vogel, for example, or a certain strand of Marxist feminism working on social reproduction, do think that the appropriate response to that is to is the root of proletarianization um, and and you know employing people um, and organizing labor in that context and so obviously what we're seeing now as part of the crisis of care is we are seeing increased commodification of care labor and work that was performed for free at home you know is increasingly performed in paid work and and um, in racialized and in gendered ways obviously right so there is that crisis of care that is um where capitalism is drawing on the the necessity the is on social reproduction but also destroying it at the same time depleting it at the same time and so you have that dynamic going on so 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 one one strand of social reproduction then does engage with the way in which commodity form makes unpaid, makes the reliance of capitalism on unpaid domestic labor visible, right? But it does want, it does talk about that labor as you know a set of necessary conditions for the commodity form, right? Whereas I would say that Federici and the other the Italian feminists are more wanting to say that there, there is a direct contribution from unpaid domestic labor or other unpaid forms of care labor that don't have to go through the commodity form um, in order either to be reorganized or in order to have value for capitalism, right? And so there's a, a debate there, a critique there about, okay, they're, they're taking the idea of value then away from sort of the use um, surplus value, use exchange value uh, distinction. So there's a gap there, perhaps, to think about how, you know, support value or some other kind of articulation of value um, that, that unpaid care labour does for capitalism. Um, and so I think, so I suppose just to try and uh, move it on to the kind of work um, I'll be talking a bit more about tomorrow and thinking about the significance of, you know, the need, I suppose, for a legal form then to address um, the fact that there are types of unpaid domestic labor, care, social reproduction, that we don't capture through the commodity form. So there's a gap there for legal form analysis. And so I suppose there's two ways of thinking about that. One is that um, the way in which Federici, for example, has drawn our attention to you know, the ways that violent, uh, violence against reproductive bodies is maintained uh, through capitalism, there isn't this, you know, the primitive move from primitive ac accumulation was uh, arranged through violence against reproductive bodies it, with her work, The Caliban and the Witch, and looking at the witch hunts and that. that. So there's a way in which I think legal form can try and pick up on that, um, the coercive, the criminalized form. And I think this is partly what we're seeing in the struggles then, not just in the crisis of care, but, but in abortion struggles globally around the world, that we're seeing uneven decriminalization of abortion. And so partly that's about um, engagement with a reproductive property form and use of rights, rights to bodily sovereignty to enable uh, 
legalization of abortion, for example, and reproductive freedom is in, is developed and enhanced in that way. But at the same time, we're seeing um, incre intensified criminalization, right, in other. And so this kind of conflict, this unevenness in the world, um, I think that sort of set of struggles around abortion law are can be usefully uh, addressed through a legal form analysis, and it can help us see the the tensions there without necessarily uh, and and bring I suppose ameliorate or supplement the commodity form of legal form analysis and help us to theorize that the violent form um, that works against reproductive bodies that secures unfair labor for capitalism do, does help capitalism to stay in existence, but isn't captured by the commodity form. Um, and then just finally, I think there's something of interest, and I'll pick this up tomorrow perhaps, in, in the effects then of sort of liberalization of reproductive freedoms and criminalization of reproductive freedoms in other places around the world. Um, there's something about ways in which there's a collection of time-limited rules and lawfulness that is made subjected to a certain time period. So there's a way that um, the, the technical distinction between timetabling for the railways that uh, Pasha Kanis, uh, drew attention to as being different from the, the commodity form, there's a way in which that is now being deployed mm -hmm. um, in order to organize lawfulness and make reproductive timetables accountable to productive timetables. So uh, those are three areas, I guess, where I think that we can supplement legal form analysis to um, take account of the violence against reproductive bodies on behalf of capitalism and also this administrative way in which reproductive and productive timetables are increasingly being advantaged through administrative state forms. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, next, we have... Um, at Pashukanis Twitter handle, we couldn't have a a, a panel without uh, without that. Uh, uh, Rob Knotts. Rob is a, a senior lecturer in law at the University of Liverpool. Uh, he completed his PhD thesis at LSE and is a member of the editorial boards of uh, uh, Historical Materialism and London Review of International Law. Rob has written a number of uh, texts charting the place of the Marxist tradition within legal theory and international legal theory mapped out the role of Marxism within other theoretical traditions. And indeed, many of his writings, some of which have been uh, mentioned, including strategy and tactics, uh, valuing race, stretch Marxism, and the logic imperialism, and many more, are arguably, I would say, key uh, references in the burgeoning Marxism law field. And indeed, I think Rob can be considered uh, one of uh, several who have been significant uh, in uh, its resurgence, as well as a more contemporary revival of Pashukanian thinking. Uh, Rob is also a member of the Isaac and Tamara Memorial Prize Committee and sits on the board of the Left Book Club. Over to you, Rob. Yes. Right, am I speaking into the mic? It's fucking very weird mic, it's a bit short. Um, okay, so thanks for that generous introduction, Tanzel, and thanks for people mentioning various things that I wrote about years ago. Can't live up to those anymore, but you're going to get something out of me anyway. So I think what I want to talk about is to kind of deal with some of the issues that have come up throughout the day and return to the kind of themes of race, racism and racialization that I have talked about at pre previous points throughout my life. And I want to put those into conversation with some of the discussions that we've had today and see the degree to which thinking about Pashukhanis and putting him, in, him into this context of race and racialization can yield, I think, some important insights that also go beyond just things to say in, in legal theory. So as Ashi Tanzel mentioned, you know, I have been writing about race and racism in relation to Pashukhanis and the legal form for quite a long time. But I do think that talking about it now in the context in which people have talking more and more about race and racism helps to open up some some issues and in part i'm going to be following on a little bit from what ruth has talked about which is about the way in which we think about capitalist social relations there are certain kind of areas which are like outside of the traditional purview and what that means for how we would understand law's relationship to them and i specifically want to discuss that in light of some of the conversations which have been happening across the day about history 
and logic. And in particular, what I want to do is make a little bit of an intervention about some of the kind of what I would think of as rigid separation between history and logic and what that separation can lead to in terms of thinking through law's role in, in various social phenomena, but also understanding those social phenomena themselves. So I really agree with something that Werner said and others have said, which is that I am very skeptical about attempts to unpack history and logic, and particularly in the work of Pashikhanis. So if we read Pashikhanis, of course, he is talking about the development of a logic in the context of a very specific set of historical social relations. So his whole thrust is to, in fact, say, look, we understand this logic as a product of a determinant set of historical social relations. Now, to me, this implicates a kind of broader Marxist and even, let's say, Hegelian understanding, which is that it's only in the context of its of their historical unfoldings that what we can call logic makes itself manifest and is understood, right? So if you read Capital, some people are like, don't read the first parts of it because it's not historical enough. And they're idiots because actually what we see in that context is Marx establishing the way in which an imminent logic begins to unfold historically, right? And this to me is a core example of how Marx understands and wants to challenge this kind of distinction. I think this is particularly important and often comes up in the context of race and racialization because what some people take to be what Marx understands to be the logic of capital is actually often incredibly under-theorized and not rich enough to capture the kind of dynamic logic that Marx thinks capital has particularly in the context of, let's say, historical, a, a kind of imperial and uneven expansion. Now, I think if you read, um, so th the point about that, of course, is that often when people talk about a kind of logical understanding of capitalism, for them, they tend to understand this logical understanding as being a domestic capitalism, which is kind of hit a static equilibrium. But if you read Capital, Marx really does not think that the kind of pure logic of capitalism is ever domestic or ever, in fact, at a static equilibrium. He thinks that a logic of crisis and a logic of unevenness is imminent to the logic of capitalist production, right? I think this is important because if you read Pashikhanis' own account, right, he himself understands the unfolding of the logic of the legal form in a historical context. Despite what some people say about the kind of the pre-capitalist law stuff and everything else, it's actually pretty straightforwardly the case. If you read Pashikhanis, he engages with changing and unfolding historical circumstances, and he talks about the development of the logic in that context. In particular, right, in a, in a passage that I think a lot of people don't take very seriously, he underscores the relationship between the generalization of the legal form and the subordination of the non-European world. And indeed actually says it's only with the kind of domination of the bourgeoisie over the world, including the non-European world, which is not given legal subjectivity, he argues, that actually the legal form attains its full significance. So in Pachikarnas' case, he is looking at that determinant set of kind of historical relations and how they unfold and unpacking the logic in this kind of way. So to me, Insofar as we think of Pashikhanis in this context and understand this kind of sense in which logics unfold historically, we are, can ask ourselves a very different set of questions about the relationship between law and kind of various phenomena in the commodity form theory, which basically says something like this. If for Pashikhanis, the logic of the, of the legal form is about is about the unfolding of a mystified set of capitalist social relations. And those social relations unfold themselves in determinate, messy historical circumstances that will, on a very vulgar reading, tell us something about law. If commodity exchange, in Pashkarnas' own reading, is necessarily quite messy and necessarily enmeshed with imperial and colonial relations, even if we're just doing a very vulgar reading, so too will the legal form. And it's this particular understanding of the relationship between history and logic, which can give us insights into how a kind of Pashikhanis inflected theory has things to say about race, racism, and racialization. Now, this is also important because the general tendency towards the contemporary manifestation of Marxist debates about race and racism have again repeated, I think, ad nauseum in the most boring possible way, this kind of history and logic dispute. 
Many, many, many Marxists seem to think the most important thing they can say is, is racism a logical f- feature of capitalism or is it not? Or is it simply a historical aberration? Now, often what I want to say about this is who fucking cares? Like, essentially, if we look at the world today, it's pretty clear that capitalism and racism are pretty closely implicated and have been historically. But I think it's incumbent on us to say a little bit more than that. And that's where this particular history logic thing and the role of the legal form comes in, I think, quite importantly. So if we look at the context in which race and racialization kind of emerge under capitalist social relations, it's primarily in the context of uneven development, competitive accumulation, and differentiated forms and modes and levels of exploitation, right? That is the context in which racialization seems to be emergent as a kind of necessary element of capitalist accumulation. Now, the thing is, is that contingent? I don't think that it is. I think, again, if we read Capital, we understand that these kind of relations of unevenness, of accumulation, and of crisis, Marx understands as imminent to the logic of capitalism, and imminent to the logic of capital, if not able to spell out exactly how they're going to occur in what context. So again, this history logic thing in Marx becomes very blurry because Marx is, as someone said earlier, ideal average of capitalism cannot and is not actually stable or geographically limited or even instead, by definition, in various ways that comes out, even if you can't specify exactly in advance how that is going to happen. So if we're thinking about capitalism as a totality, right? Unevenness, differentiated forms of exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are built into capitalism as a totality, even if you can't specify exactly how it is going to look. So on that basis, right, of understanding how that logic unfolds in a particular historical way, race and racialization are imminent to the logic of capitalism on, in some sense, but not in this kind of way where it's like, oh, you can just say that this is definitely going to happen in this kind of way. But some form of something that looks like racism is a necessary element of capitalism. And specifically, and this is where, again, the law thing comes in, capitalism as a machine that produces and operates on abstractions and real abstractions takes those particular social relations that it deals with and they manifest as abstract forms, right? Abstract forms of race and racialization. So even if we don't know if it would have been, you know, black people or someone else who would have been racialized in a particular way, we can see from that imminent unfolding of capital's logic historically, that something like race and racialization, no matter what you want to call it, is going to happen. And by the way, just as a point about this, no matter what you want to call it thing, I think it's very important that sometimes debates about the legal form become really annoying semantic debates where it's like, well, Patrick Arnes is not saying every instance of the utterance of the word law needs to be regulated by a particular theoretical position. He is saying that the appearance of this social phenomenon, which we have called law, can be historically located in this kind of way. So the important thing here, right, if we bring these things together, is on the one hand, we can have an idea of capitalist accumulation as necessarily throwing up an abstraction, which we can call race, and we can call racialization, which stabilizes, forms, and shapes how capitalism works. And at the same time, do the Pashikanis thing, we have something called law, which does a very, very, very similar job and is itself a mystified abstraction and form of capitalist social relations. So, Again, if we wanted to do the vulgar thing, which I think is okay to do sometimes, we can say on this very basic reading, if these two things are imminent, and if as Pachukana says, he does more than this, but in a vulgar way, it's like commodity exchange equals law. Well, that will also mean importantly, that commodity exchange equals race. And therefore law is itself part and parcel of these processes of race and racialization. So if we think about the kind of imminent unfolding of a historical logic in this way, and the way in which logic unfolds into these particular historical contexts, rather than thinking of race as a necessary like added extra to how Pachikarnas understands law, we can instead say, no, no, this is also part and parcel of that same process that he is describing. 
So with that in mind, and with thinking then about the fact that we have these different processes of, of abstraction, which are linked to the prospect or mystified forms of capitalist social relations, we can now think about the necessary connections between law and racialization. And it's clear on this front, right, that simply by doing a bit of boring historical work, we can see the way in which legal abstractions are themselves closely related to, structurally related to, racial abstracts, abstractions of racialization. So on a very basic level, law was absolutely crucial and key in producing racialized categories. If we just think in international legal terms about the kind of production of the idea of civilization and the way in which civilization gave you access to certain kind of benefits and burdens of society, law is absolutely central and crucial in doing this, right? But at the same time, because again of this particular structural connection between law and capitalist social relations, the modes of racialization which are produced in this way are themselves modes of racialization which are linked to and articulate transformative politics involving, well, capitalist social relations. If you look to the way in which forms of racialization played out historically, they were always closely linked in a language of laziness or kind of inability to manage your own affairs to capitalist transformation. So in this very basic sense, law was at the forefront of creating forms of racialization, which were themselves ultimately linked to these tendencies in capitalism. At the same time, law was really crucial and continued to be crucial in articulating the changing patterns of racialization. Because insofar, again, as these are kind of mystified forms of capitalist social relations, both reflect upon and help to kind of mediate and transform capitalism itself. The obvious point here to say is the degree to which contemporary juridical things very frequently embed racialized understandings, racialized patterns, racialized practices. We could take, for instance, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and the racialized language that they use to describe people defaulting on their debts, frequently harking back to kind of the inability of people to manage their own property, manage their own affairs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But similarly, and we can use a kind of topical example, if we think about international humanitarian law and international criminal law, kind of things that are on people in the forefront of people's minds today, we need to be aware that even insofar as people try to use these to challenge, let's say, the actions of the Israeli state, they embed and embody very deeply racialized, unequal logics. The obvious thing, for example, being that if you want to go fully down the kind of IHL route, anyone who shoots an unguided missile at anyone is basically committing a war crime as and when. But if you drop a smart missile onto a school, they'll be like, hmm, well, we're going to have to work out if the military advantage here was could have been gained slightly differently. So that logic of the unequal racial confrontation is embedded directly into and throughout the kind of language of international humanitarian law and the kind of stuff around, around war crimes. Now, crucially, and this is the point where we can think about it coming full circle, it's also the case that the kind of juridical abstractions that we're talking about are themselves necessarily rooted in, embedded and solidified, solidified through their confrontation with racialized peoples, not as a kind of fucking like generic abstract othering, but instead in terms of the specific confrontations that we see. So if we look at the way in which property was developed historically through legal categories, it was often done at the same time as developing that property to dispossess certain people racially and enable and, and kind of enhance these capitalists um, transformations. Now, what's really important about this, and I'm not going to go much over the I'm on 14 minutes, but I won't go too far, is this has really important political and like tactical and strategic outcomes, right? Because it's a kind of myth, and it's an understandable myth, and it's one that actually has kind of, for, for obvious reasons, um, entwined with the history of racialized peoples attempting to challenge the existing order, which is that the gaining of equal rights is in some sense a positive and progressive thing. And of course it is. But the point is, is that the gaining of equal rights is in the context of a set of social relations and abstractions, which themselves necessarily embed and embody continually patterns and practices of racialization. This isn't crucially just the old thing about the contradiction between formal equality and substantive inequality, but rather that the very form on this reading of formal equality as it exists in the commodity form and the legal form necessarily embeds that form of racialization very straightforwardly. And that's really crucial because this is one of the ways in which we have to now reckon with and understand the navigation of the 
of the <laughs> the principled opportunism, a, 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 a term I coined when I was like fucking 21. Um, and that is essentially saying, I will slightly disagree with China here. I think things are a little bit, no, I don't actually think you think this, but like, I think things were a little bit less open than you were kind of alluding to at that point. Because I do think the point is, and I, I, I know that we would agree with this, plumbers aren't the same things as law because plumbing does not embody the same set of internal contradictions that the law does, right? So a plumber, probably, I mean, apart from the fact that they're working for you, which has its own set of contradictions, obviously, but the, the if we're thinking about these patterns, patterns of racialization, a plumber might be a racist, but there's not nothing necessarily racist about plumbing as a form, right? Whereas in the context, we um, think about this in terms of the legal form, that's a little bit different. And to me, that calls for then this specific understanding of the principal part of principal opportunism, which as China said, is about understanding and continually challenging the juridical in your political mobilization. But I think being very aware of the limits of, of that form, and that's particularly because, and I'm just going to finish here, which is with a bit of a tangent, but I think it's something that maybe hasn't come up enough in this context, is that one of the things that is true about the relationship between like commodity exchange, ideology, racialization, is law appears as the spontaneous form of politics for us under a, in capitalist society in ways that make law incredibly alluring. So one of the things that's very interesting, and I've talked this with other people about this, is that you often get communists, for instance, who'll be like, yeah, abolish the state, got it, fantastic. Markets, get rid of them, money. But the law, oh, I don't know about that. That's a very strange thing to think, but we think it in part because of the centrality of juridical ideology and the mode of, in which we exist to both our politics and also arguably to like different forms of our subjectivity. So I do think then when we're thinking about the necessary kind of racialized juridical forms that we make and how we navigate them. We also do need to reckon with the fact that they will in some sense feel like natural for us to go into and to use. And so thinking about how to navigate that involves, I think, bigger questions than just will this be effective right now and in this way. And I think does involve saying like in many respects, it's a problem to be involved with and legitimizing these institutions. So, I mean, I'll leave it there um, and yeah. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, finally, we have uh, Gagi Bhattacharya. Gagi is a professor at the University of Arts London, as well as a tireless organiser and trade union activist. Uh, she's been described uh, by another leading academic as one of the most leading, uh, one of the leading academics on race, responsible for writing what is probably one of the most important books on racial capitalism. And many, I imagine here, have been moved, prodded, provoked, and had their curiosity stalked by the many layers and rich textures of Gargi's writing and thinking. She is the author of several key texts, including more recently, Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Empire's Endgame, and The Futures of Racial Capitalism, which is out now with Polity Press. Over to you, Gargi. Right, okay. Thank you so much for inviting me and for arranging this. I really am not a lawyer and I didn't even ever think about Ashkanis before they invited me and I haven't thought much about him since. So apologies for all of that. The other thing I should say is that um, I'm obviously close to the edge of returning to toddlerhood. I was saying that I've just started to shout at strangers in the street and fall over. So that probably is involved in what I'm going to say. So I hope this is. Who knows, what do lawyers want to hear? I always try and give people what they want. I hope it's somewhere close to it. Okay. Oh, right. They did kindly, after much pleading from me, give me some questions to answer. So I've just tried to say, oh, this is, you asked me this, I tried to say this. Um, I have for some time been writing about racial capitalism, although I'm going to stop now under extreme duress from my children. But, um, Broadly, I'd say that racial capitalism is a question, not an overarching theory, but it's an attempt to account for the manner in which processes of accumulation harness or inhabit the arbitrary differentiation of populations. And I hear what Rob's saying, that racialization is like an empty category. From history, we think we know who it means, what it means, but it's really a process, not a pre-existing set of meanings as a question and way of thinking it's an account of capitalism as at once 
that fictional equivalence between all human actors and also a systemic differentiating process, mobilizing arbitrary, arbitrary difference in its remaking at every turn. Yes, there's a whole kind of overlap with um, debates about uneven development, but I think also the ways in which racial capitalism is being used as a term is an attempt to, to understand what the fracturing of class means in lots of different places. And I think that's worth some attention. Oh, come on. There you go, right. So I didn't, trying to guess what the lawyers want to know. Obviously not this from what people have said today, but um, I have been interested a little bit in the past about the idea of whiteness as property from that very, very famous Harris essay that kind of sets a whole set of terms about how we might think of racialized identity as something that, um, like a thing you have, as if your whiteness, you know, a person's whiteness is apart from them, as if it, as if it's a lovely car that other people can scratch by driving too close to. So I think there's something interesting about how Harris writes about that. Of course, in a exclusively U.S. context and around the very particular racialized histories of the United States, but talks about whiteness as if it's a thing, a thing that is given the protection of law because others who don't own that property trespass against it. And I've thought of that um, as an interesting thing to keep trying to apply to different spaces, because I do think that it's useful to think of racialized subordination as often or in part as a lack of access to redress through law. That's also what Rob is talking about, the ways in which not only is it a lack of redress, the partialness of the application of law and the gap between the rhetoric of law and its application is often how the machineries of systemic racism and violence work. You know, that's, that's kind of the game we're in, isn't it? That's how state violence operates. That's how some people are made insistently and endlessly less than human subjects. That there's a kind of talk about, oh, here's, here's the rules, and then here's your life. And the gap between them is, you know, that's the gap of racialization. Sometimes, of course, that barrier has been written into legislation. Harris is largely talking about a time when the United States is explicitly um, segregated when there are active um, legally protected privileges given to the status of whiteness. And then the, she goes through all these cases where pe someone who pretends to be white, someone who's taken as white and doesn't correct the other people, and then they have a case brought about them that oh, you're kind of trespassing on real whiteness by like going through the world in this way. So it's all, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, but actually, I think more recently, the ways in which that racialized subordination by lack of access to redress through the law tends to be enforced through other means. And some of what we've talked about today in the international sphere is about that, isn't it? There isn't really a law which says, you human animals, you can die. But that's something else that is happening in the application of international law that makes those things happen. You all know that. I think that's kind of interesting, though. But what does it, but although I'm interested in whiteness as an aspect of property, um, and it seems to echo things that are being said today about, um, it allows you to fold the politics of race into um, an account of law as just a reflection of the commodity form. And it also reflects this kind of centrality of property relations as the basis of pretty much all legal claims. It's also kind of odd, isn't it? It's odd. You know, when I say to white people, oh, you're white, this is like property. That conversation is always very, very odd. And I assume that they will carry on being odd today. Because there's also something about saying that whiteness is a form of property, which is so um, evidently an alienated form of being, isn't it? So that's like, I don't know what else would be like that. My whiteness is like this, this cloak I wear and this thing you can scratch and it's, I own it, but it's not me. And alongside that, it kind of, I think, putting whiteness as property reminds us again of um, 
the limitations for racial justice of, of legal means. You know, our goal can't possibly be achieving equality of property status for all fictional racial identities. I don't want my brownness to suddenly become or brownness as property. What kind of figure would that be? It's, so it's not saying, oh, human people own their racialized identity as property and everyone else doesn't. But there is something about whiteness as property that shows that law has been a powerful element of the machinery of racial capitalism. And also that, as everybody has said, that the violences of racial capitalism cannot be addressed through better or broader allocation of legal rights. I think it's always worth saying for people who don't work on race that the account of racial capitalism is also always a critique of the almost omnipresent liberal understanding of racism, as if racism could always be slightly made better through some technical or procedural or legal means. But you know, racial capitalism is a way of saying that's not going to happen. I'm also not sure, this is a conversation with someone else, I'm saying it in case someone else will say, say something about it, but I'm not sure that all instances of racial capitalism require the anchoring of an explicitly racist or racial state. And I think that goes back to what's being said about, um, about the ways in which, um, oh, what, I've lost my train of thought. A conversation that's been being had today about the ways in which, um, oh, I've lost it. Sorry, I had that point, but I've lost it now, so I'm gonna come back to it later. Right, so these are the bits I hope that wasn't what your day was about, but I hope it will feed into some of the things later. Most of our experience, I think, of legal interventions against crimes against the person, certainly around sexual violence and racist violence, but also other kinds of discriminatory practice, seem to be shaped by a parallel implication that personhood is a form of property. In particular, the way in which claims must be made and redress sought reaffirms the sense that our personhood is a form of property. If you've ever been in an employment tribunal, you have to kind of show what kind of loss and hurt you've had, how, you know, how you'd quantify that as if yourself and the hurt you feel is, um, is a loss. You know, that's the only way you can do it. But, you know, we, we communists are supposed to be freeing ourselves from this kind of alienated relation to ourselves and each other, I think. So this, you, know, you asked me this question. The legal regulation of contract dehistoricizes parties. The moment of contract is assumed to be undertaken by two equal parties because that's the fiction of contract in all segments of the world. The sedimented dispossession that characterizes differential entitlement can't be incorporated into legal regulation, but it's that sedimented dispossession of differential entitlement that characterizes the world of racial capitalism. As we seek to imagine and perhaps to prefigure a new world, the question of social regulation, I think, remains, although I can hear that almost, I must be the only person in the room who thinks this. So we've, <laughs> what can we do with that? We've learned too well the dangers of imagining a new authoritarianism and abolitionism, as other people have said, encourage us, us to give up on punitive logics, to, you know, to long for someone to order us. But the brutalization of systemic racisms and gender-based violence, only for example, not the only things, are likely to have shadows beyond matters of property dispute. And I suspect even the long transition beyond the commodity form. So I'm trying to think of law as a way of being with each other, although Rob told me that's not what Pashukanis wants to think about, so sorry about that. <laughs> Can the performance of law as a community practice be resurrected, a chorus, an internalised regulation, a collective assertion in the face of challenges? Now, I couldn't really understand, and you should all tell me, whether it's possible to imagine a law that's decoupled from institutions of power and return to the realm of theatrical chorus. Can we really think of social regulation as law if there is no enforcing body? Because I really do think that we are made as misshapen catalyst subjects, I'm really perked up when China kind of said that as well. So, oh yes, we're broken. 
we're not going to be, you know, be reborn as perfect beings in the day after. We are not unlearn ourselves in an instant. So there's something about how the techniques of legal reason might assist us here, which I guess are not the same as the law. Um, I wrote in my note, I was drawing a picture. I like to draw pictures when I sit down, so I don't to fidget too much. I'm a noisy toddler. And I wrote a note to myself, is law like ballet? You know, I like to think that one of the things that we should think is that it's no human achievement that does not belong to us. It might not yet belong to us in the form that we want and need it, but all of the assorted knowledge yeah. in this room, the training that you all represent, the ways of performing what reason is to another human being in the name of something called the law, even if the law doesn't belong to us, I want to think some of that belongs to us. So perhaps the habits, techniques, and rituals of law might be remade as a very different set of social practices. And maybe you wouldn't call it law at all, but imagining a non-punitive law decoupled from the defense of property might allow us to articulate something of what we hope for in, trans in the transformation of social relations. I think there's something to be learned about what might be the performance of legal argument and reason without the machinery of coercion. Because in the long transition in the day after, I think we will need to have those ways of speaking to each other in terms of who we are to each other, what we owe each other, and what the world might be, even if there are no more masters to punish us. That's it. Okay, so thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, we've we've actually got about forty five minutes for question, forty five minutes for questions. But given that we have actually been in the room for quite a while, I'm maybe going to take like just two rounds of questions and then uh, wrap things up. So we've got. I'm going to bring the mic over to you. We've got one question over there and then over here. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I guess um, my question is just coming off um, Gargi's point at the end about law as a way of being with one another. Um, I kind of agree with what I think someone said earlier, like the question of will law exist after the revolution is a bit of a stale question, but um, does I just wanted to throw to the panel, um, do you think that can anything be extracted from the legal thought and kind of like disassembled and repurposed for kind of like a new kind of society? Hello. Um, I have a question to China. And well, I'm first of all, I'm a huge fan. I'm from Brazil. And of course, not, not just the between Nicole Wrights, but also October, the, the history of the Russian Revolution that was translated into Portuguese. And this was a very important book for me um, in a special moment of my, my life. So, so I, I want to make a theoretical exercise about the concept of real abstraction because I am working on that bridge in my PhD um, uh, thesis. And well, I'm going to, going to read because I'm a, <laughs> a little bit nervous. So the concept of real abstraction and in, in its relation to fetishism, once it is related to uh, an abstraction that becomes um, a reality, but not just that, it becomes a reality materializing itself in a... Um, uh, in a specific form of manifestation adequate to its own concept. That's why the real abstraction par excellence in capitalism are, uh, is money. Um, so through this idea of real abstraction, we can analyze how capitalist uh, social relations are inverted, where abstract social forms rule over the concrete and the living. And you say that we must bring this category to think about legal form as well. Um, of course, we have the same sort of necessity or real inverse, inversion when we think about the legal form in its simple moment, that is the relation between subjects or uh, the, the form of the legal 
subject as as such. And that is the point where I think we must uh, radicalize the use of this category of real abstractions to think about legal relations. So the question is, is there a category within the conceptual concretiz concretization of the, the legal form that occupies the same role as money to the category of value in legal relations? And I would say that, yes, we actually have such a category, and that category is in my view, the legal norm, not the specific content of a determinate norm or, or decree or a concrete state regulation or something of the sort, but the universal and abstract form of the legal norm in which the legal subject can find a common property between them, but outside them in a third reified form. So we we'll talk about a totality and totality is about uh, an object, in this case, uh, a social reality, capitalist mode of production, capable not only of production, but of self-production. That's why we must push forward and posit the necessary determinations to um, explain uh, how the legal, no the legal form appears to to immediate be immediate consciousness and therefore um, reveals its uh, necessary forms of manifestation and mystification and therefore domination um, in our our reality so thank you very much sorry <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you for great presentations, all of you. Uh, I have uh, uh, one specific question to you, China, and one to you, Rob. Uh, uh, China, first, uh, I wonder if, because I, I read your book on the Communist Manifesto as well, uh, and in the book, I think that you argue against the no conception that Marx and Engels had no notion of, of uh, justice. Uh, and uh, yeah, you argue against various Marxists saying that. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know if you've read uh, Igor Shoikedbrod's book. Okay, but he uses uh, Stephen Luke's and Norman Geras to criticize Pashukanis. <laughs> and I wonder if you could relate your defense of Pashukanis and the issue of, of ethics as you uh, discuss that in, in, in the book on the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and then Rob, uh, yeah, we continue the discussion about logic and, and history. Uh, I, I mean, I, I fully agree that we need a, a dialectical conception of logic and history and that totality is uh, crucial, uh, but it can mean very different things. So I, I, I want to ask you three questions uh, uh, concerning this distinction. Uh, first of all, my impression is that Marxists, that you refer to Marxists in general that argue that uh, racialization is not a, a necessary part of of of, uh, of capitalism, uh, and my impression is that most of those Marxists, and I think Sarah Mao is a good example, uh, recent example uh, of, of of this, uh, they build on an opposition between logic and necessity on the one hand, and history and contingency on the other hand. So, yeah, uh, strong arguments about necessity on the lo yeah, according to logical abstractions, and then. Uh, historically and also strategically, anything goes, more or less. <laughs> uh, I wonder if you tend to accept that assumption and that opposition when you argue for racialization as, as a logical necessity. Uh, that's one question. Uh, also, uh, I, of course, agree then that it's possible to argue against a rigid separation of logic and history. But then I wonder how far would you like to go in the other direction? And the other uh, extreme is, of course, to, to collapse that distinction altogether. Uh, and I heard, for instance, uh, Heidi Gerstenberger at the H&M conference this autumn, uh, arguing that theory is only relevant in so far as it can be confirmed by history. And to me, that sounds like empiricism. So I would like to hear you defend the distinction between logic and history as well, if you would like to do that. Uh, and yes, thirdly, uh, I also wonder if you could relate your argument about logic and history to the issue of formalism and instrumentalism, because, I mean, I think it's, ha it's hard to uh, avoid formalism with the rigid separation. <laughs> uh, 
it's hard to avoid instrumentalism without the separation. Yeah, three three comments, questions. Thanks. Should we just get these three questions and then we'll we'll do another final round? Who who would like to go first? Yeah, go on. Oh, I've got to hold it like some kind of weird tiny baby mic. Um so the on the first question about law as a way of being with each other, I was just showing Gargi. I think there's a very good, like literal Pashikarnas quote, which is just one of my favorite quotes, which I think sums it up, where he says, um, Law is simultaneously a form of external authority of regulation and a form of subjective private autonomy. The basic and central condition of the characteristic of the former is unconditional obligation and external coercion, while freedom is ensured and recognized within definite boundaries. And this is the important thing. Law appears both as the basis of social organization and as the means for individuals to be disassociated yet integrated in society. So the point about law is a mode of being together. But it's a mode of being together in a very specific way, which is the way mediated through the way in which capitalist social relations allow people to relate to each other. And of course, this is like traverses the whole of Marx, which is that capitalism is both the system which has brought you together most of all of any other thing. It makes you so dependent on other people. But at the same time, you're not because of the, the social forms that it it throws up. So I think that's important because I'm also just like, yeah, we, we're together in lots of different ways all the time and the specificity of the legal way of being together is a set of social relations which well i'm pretty interested in 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 getting rid of right now another thing that i think is happening in some of these discussions and i think it's important it's this semantic point again right which is that like pashikhanis is not a semantic theory does not have a semantic theory about regulating what you can call law and what you can not call law and that's why some people will sometimes say, oh, we should say bourgeois law or liberal law. And I'm not into that because I, for reasons I could explain otherwise. But there may be, there will be forms of regulation post-capitalism. But what Pashikarnas is insisting on where I agree is like, they will not take the particular form they do now, which is as between abstracted, formally equal individuals. Now, within that, of course, there are things that like law provides and law does, which you'd imagine would continue. But it's that specificity, that historical specificity of the form, which I just don't, I don't think there's anything, there's anything that we want from it. And I want to say a little thing, um, which is that I think we also need to have a little bit of a middle ground between this, like, oh, we can say exactly what's going to happen and no cookbooks for the future. Because I do think that like one of the things that Marx always said is that capitalism itself, in terms of its contradictions, gives you something of the, the imminent logic of what a post-capitalist society would look like. So Marx isn't like fucking talking about the seas turning into lemonade, but he has a sense that production is going to look different in what kind of ways and in what kind of what kind of functions and i think it's sometimes important and this is where i would like come back to your point is like look part of the thing and i'm not a, i don't i really dislike prefiguration but we can also say in, a, in an important way there are modes in which human beings resolve disputes with each other in the world now and that have been experimented with and tried which are not juridical in this way and that in some sense can be the basis for thinking what that how things might be be different and i think the crucial thing about that is that it is about thinking about um, the specific form in which that that takes place. So I think that's one thing. As we want to say, have you read um, the Simon Clark stuff? Because he does a good thing about money, law, and the state, which might be pretty relevant to what you're thinking about it. Like, so I'll I'll, I'll send you it. Um, for Carl, um, I'll, I'll let China deal with with justice. <laughs> Most of them. I know Carl. He's cut his hair, but I can still recognize him. Um, so <laughs> in terms of the logic, necessity, history, contingency, I mean, it's probably just because I read Hegel recently, so my brain is just Hegel pill. It's very difficult to say that. Like to some degree, I think the distinctions are just are actually just much messier than people are saying, right? And that's because like I'm I, I just think back to something like the the Grundrisse, right? Where it is like, well. Obviously, on some level, you have to start from history and from the empirical, because you can't, Marx didn't just be like, that's what capitalism is. Let's see if it's proven by history. He reflected on the world around him, used that as a basis to like abstract in various ways 
pick out things and then and then you know so this this, this dialectic of the abstracts and the concrete in the kind of in the Enkov way which is the thing that I'm into which I think to some degree just weakens this idea that that that, that of how you even think through that distinction in that kind of way. So the other thing is, is that actually in part, I wasn't saying the problem is that people all become in the racialization debates, think it's contingent. I actually just think that framing the debate in that way is entirely unhelpful and people obsessing over like, so I read uh, and makes word and she said that capitalism is this, and that means this kind of thing isn't going to be part of capitalism. And I'm just like, this is like a, this is a stupid way of having a debate. And anyone looking at it from the outside is just like, what the hell are you talking about? Right. So, but then in terms of the necessity and contingency stuff, like, so partly, as I say, like some of that discussion is, is actually about what, what people think the necessary and logical parts of capitalism is. And I think actually there's a fuzzier corona of things than people acknowledge that it is, right? And, and partly it's also about recognizing where there is contingency and what categories you're talking about. Because I'm quite happy to be like, on some level, that there is a thing that we very much recognize as racism today it's pretty contingent because it's contingent where capitalism started. It's contingent how it's spread. But I am going to say some mode of abstraction, which takes seriously the kind of forms of concentration of accumulation and unevenness would have had, would have happened. I don't know exactly what it would have looked like, because that is, as far as I can see, an imminent law of the way in which capitalism unfolds. If it isn't, then it turns out that capitalism could, could be all right. If you could literally have like a very static, stable capitalism that didn't do these things, then it could go on forever. So in part, I'm I'm almost arguing to collapse the distinction, but not but not quite because I do obviously think that there is a that there is a difference to the way in which like logics unfold and they can be faced with counter logics and there is agency and stuff like that. Now this is important also because I think this then comes into the formalism and instrumentalism thing. I just think sometimes people take terms and they ascribe them with a kind of bad like character. I'm like the law is obviously instrumentalized. That's straightforwardly the case, but it's instrumentalized within a specific social form. I'm like, they're both true. The problem is if you think that like one is, you reduce it to one or the other, but it's clear that social agents inhabit and use the law to pursue projects or whatever, but it's also clear that they're limited by the form of law and that some people can do it better than others. And so for me, what I think is important is to, is to understand, in fact, the specific forms of formalism and instrumentalism that come up in determinate historical circumstances and also within that wider sweep and so do you know, do you know what I mean like I just think sometimes we take some of these things as if it's automatically bad or automatically good and that's because like people have been very one-sided about them but actually again the formalism and instrumentalism thing is it's, it's, a, it's a dialectic like obviously people who are just like it unfolds according to its own logic and that is it I'm like that's stupid and obviously people who are like oh it, it's just the bourgeoisie did this. Well, that's also stupid, but sting those two things together, I think, is the important thing. So maybe I'll just sidestep what you were saying. We can talk about it later, but um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm out of practice. I'm going on much too long of this, as quick as I can. Um, first of all, I'm incredibly excited to hear that someone is is doing exactly what I had hoped about real abstraction. So I'd be really interested in um, seeing your work and um, that's wonderful. And I love the idea of the legal norm as the money of law. This is very fecund to me. Um, second of all, on Carl's question about justice uh, and law. I mean, it, to a certain extent, I just kind of don't get my knickers in a twist about this that much. I mean, I, I've, I'm actually really delighted that there hasn't been, there you are, sorry, there hasn't been that much discussion about justice and ethics in this room. Um, I'm really pleased about that because it seems to me that one of the key things we need to do, not because they're not important, they're incredibly important, but because one of the key things we need to do as radical theorists of law is precisely disaggregate any notion of justice and any notion of law. And it's incredible how co-constitutive those are still notionally, including in radical spaces. And this is where we get into the discussion about uh, the, 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 the jurisprudential horizon of philosophy and the real abstraction of the legal subject and so on. So to me, just very briefly, as you know from the book, like I think, I think there is absolutely an ethical and, and, and a, um, indeed in some cases a moral theory in Marxism. I think there should be, I think there can be. I think it's impossible not to. I think Pashukhanis had one, like a lot of those Bolsheviks and um, and indeed Marx and Engels, 
in this rather unconvincing macho way, he liked to think that he didn't, but he did. Um, and that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about the real abstraction of the legal fall. So to me, no big problem. Um, I'm very happy to talk about ethics and justice, but that does seem to me to be a distinct discussion. Now, when we get into like actually existing law in the real world, inevitably there's going to be an overlap. And this is where we get into questions of uh, principled opportunism and the deployment of law and so on. And I think that's very serious and real. But as, as long as we're always aware that the legal form is not our friend in the, you know, and that we are therefore kind of trying to move towards uh, this justice or ethics kind of against the grain of the embedded logic of the thing. But sometimes that's all we have available to us. On this last question about, you know, can we repurpose law? First of all, I want to take Rob's point about my plumbing analogy. It was glib and facile, and I will never live it down. I only really meant in terms of the inevitable fact of the law, like the inevitable fact of plumbing, not that law is neutral in the way that, that um, although maybe there's like radical plumbing theory, I don't know. But anyway, um, <laughs> here's, here's one of the reasons I say this, though, and I don't want to be seeming to be having a go at tour here, because I'm really not, and I've learned a huge amount from a lot of stuff, but there's this one thing that there is a kind of the the contrary to uh, the, uh, um, if you like, the kind of unthinking left uh, um, co collapse of justice and law in radical Marxist legal spaces is a kind of tremendous and broadly, let me be very clear, I think correct and justified concern about the surrender to the law, but that actually can act as a backhanded aggrandizement of law itself. It's like if we put our faith in law, that's incredibly dangerous because it will validate the legal form. I mean, yes, that, that is true in the same way as when we fight for a wage increase, we're validating the wage form, which is also our fundamental enemy. So in a sense, I just want a kind of a kind of pragmatic realism about these these facts of law. And this is where I think what we haven't done is developed from Rob's theory of principled opportunism to how does that work? Because how do you use this inevitable thing that we're not going to be able to escape while constantly stressing that it is not our friend? But last thing on that point, the question about repurposing law. I in in almost no other respects do I have any uh, particular um, uh, draw for anything Agamben has ever said, but he has this one phrase about can we use the law, maybe the day after, I can't remember what he says instead of revolution, we will use the law in the way that children pick up toys and play with them. And I thought, okay, that's beautiful poetry. Does it work as social theory? I genuinely don't know. What I do think is that a lot of the, the content that for us, because of the real abstraction of law, is inextricable from law, May we may be able to use aspects of that content for the inevitable management of the the clash of claims under uh, you know um, under under socialism under communism and so on. You know we always talk about the importance of context. Uh, you know law is very abstracting. True, is abstraction always the wrong thing to do? Maybe sometimes focusing entirely on the context is going to lead to you know um, uh, you know in, inequitable outcomes. I genuinely don't know. So I would say. As far as, I mean, this is pure speculation and therefore fun. I have no particular, you know, because I think that, because I'm a Pashukhanisai and I think that law is an expression of the commodity form, no, I don't think law can be re repurposed. But I'm not going to get hung up on, the, on the, the word, as Rob says. And many aspects under a completely new, so of that phenomenon, under a completely new social context, would be doing new things. Maybe we can find uses for them, I don't know. But it won't be at the behest of the commodity form. Um, just before I go back to the floor, is anyone uh, like to come in? I don't want to. I was going to come in on the yeah. repurposing, yeah, because again, yeah, that repurposing question, and I just think it picked up, you know, what Gargi was asking us to do so well, is, or it gives an opportunity to think about that a bit more. And I suppose I would just want to say that there's so much, so many collections of legal practices that have developed habits, techniques, rituals of doing law otherwise that we you know, don't want to lose sight of. So again, there's a whole collection of legal actors, you know, litigants, um, educators, activists, not just the lawyers, right? So there's a whole collection of activities that you know, engage with law in different ways. If we think today about like, all the different ways in which people were watching the court. You know, there's a whole set of popular activities around that that are not reducible to lawyering, right? So I just, so partly I want us 
you know, not not to again, it's yeah, just to think about the collection and the periphery of things that are there around the law that can be repurposed and can be grown and um, nourished in other ways. Um, so yeah, just thinking about the, again, it's the practices right that come out of the struggle, and we can't know them right. We can't know what will be the effect of engaging with some of the traces of struggle in those legal practices. We can't know what they would look like. We have to try them out. Oh, I still have something. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is this is like coming into a fan club for a band you've never heard. <laughs> <laughs> and you all know each other and all that stuff. So I think the performance of legal argument can be a beautiful thing and is linked to other forms of philosophical argument and the structuring of ideas. And there's something about the ways in which a legal, legalistic framing of the structuring of ideas happens, which is not quite the same as some other forms of argumentation, although they're connected. Now, I don't believe in God, but I'm interested in theology as a practice. And I think in the day after, even if we all will understand that we are authors of our collective destiny, that there'll be a role for what we learned through theology. Now, it seems to me most of the people in the room are devoting all, if not most, of your lives to learning varieties of legal argumentation. Now, if you really believe that nothing you are learning, well, no, no, none of us in the room believe that legal argumentation changes the, law, the world right now. Maybe it kind of ameliorate some, against some most excesses of violence. But you've all told me that you don't believe it any more than the rest of us do. But if you don't believe there's anything in what you're learning which contributes to what the imagining of the new world is, then I'm really confused about the fan club, again, without having heard the band. So that's my kind of question. Yeah, I do, I work at a university, I do lots of stupid things, but I also believe that the intellectual training I get despite that, has a contribution now, later, reworked, stolen, in the wrong places. And I think that, what, what is it to be a Marxist intellectual if you don't believe some of that? And I've not yet grasped what, what your fan club thinks, which I'm sure is my fault. But if someone could tell me before I go, I'd really go home much happier. Which fan club? <laughs> well, whatever, I don't know. I've not heard the band, I don't know. But you obviously all know each other. And um, you know the choruses, don't you? You know the tunes. I don't know the tunes. Oh, that's giving you my phone. That means... Okay, we'll have uh, one more round of questions. So, yeah, Leila. I have a question for Ruth and Rob. And it's mainly a question of clarification because um, I think Rob has talked about how the legal form is enmeshed with racialized differentiation. And Ruth talked about, I think, gender differentiation, how it supplements the legal form. And as someone who's still relatively new to legal form, I think I just wanted to sort of ask, what exactly does that mean? Is the idea that the legal form itself internalizes the contradiction between formal legal equality and the necessity of gender and racialized differentiation? Is it that the law, gender, and race share the same logic of abstraction or, and is it that gender and race, to some extent, are social forms that exist outside the legal form and, and, so, and sort of become enmeshed or sort of intention with the legal form? So I, and maybe it's all of those things. Um, but I just wanted to, to, yeah, just wanted to ask about it. I was entirely sure. And I guess um, a follow-up question would be, do gender and race, to what extent do they work differently in this in this regard? To what extent is their relationship to the form different, or is it sort of are they sort of mirror images in the way they sort of um, on the one hand make the subject equal, but also differentials make them more exploitable? Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, I just wanted to, if I may, um, I should say sorry for this, perhaps to a degree, but go back to a discussion we had um, uh, this morning. Um, uh, well, 
I, well, I, I, I hope to paraphrase perhaps the nature of the question, then hopefully you can understand it. But 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 it it boiled down to the discussion about uh, the 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 irony, of course, that Pashukanis was talking about the withering away of the law, when the reality under his very own feet was the very opposite. So what we saw, I think quite logically in a way, and his, his theory is in, in a sense vind vindicated by the new economic policy, which reintroduced market mechanisms to Soviet Russia. The, the problem, however, arises later, and I think Bill Bowring made this point, which is that we see with the rise of Stalinism, the explosion of laws, where at the same time we see the suppression of market mechanisms. So the question is, how does Patrick theory make those account for, for, for the rise of Stalinism and the explosion of laws uh, at that time? Uh, any more questions for this final round? Yep. Yeah. Anyone can comment? But I was wondering about I I was glad to hear you talking about the theatrical chorus and also the ballet. Uh, I'm from Brazil and me and my friend Rena we've been studying cos indigenous cosmologies. And uh, I was wondering is 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 there a space for more than human or other than human voices in that chorus and also in the ballet, uh, the Kilombola people which was the reminiscent from enslaved black people. They have these dances, which they refer as choreographical strategies for resistance, and when, which they advocate for other beings, such as mountains and forests, but not only concrete beings, but also dimensions of those beings, like the spirit of the forest. There is a famous indigenous uh, leader in Brazil that he, he says that Every day he awakes and he negotiates with the spirit of the forest, not only the forest. So I was wondering about choreography, chorals, and how do it relate to the cosmo cosmopolitics uh, in this struggle for imagining and creating or rec uh, trying to recognize the, this struggle that are already being uh, taking place and bringing out other actors to this to this cosmo cosmo world in a different cosmo cosmo vision different cosmo politics different different cosmo actors so a lot of cosmos if you think it's just crazy please ignore <laughs> okay who would like to go first yeah thank you thanks leila um yeah so i suppose it, I think these your question gets at yeah some of the ambiguities and some of the tensions and gaps like in trying to think about legal form from a gender and perspective and from trying to think about it the differentiation question right so uh, so I suppose um it, it, it's in trying to think about work with legal form as you know the attribution of property rights and the generation of equal subjects um that that in itself doesn't capture the, the, the difference that is uh, generated, gender difference, racialized difference, other kinds of social differences. But it can be captured once you put, you know, once you're doing the form content analysis and once you're thinking about um, circulation and production together, and then you're thinking about how you know social reproduction and gender difference is required in order to you know generate the labor force as a particular kind of commodity which then is needed to to generate circulation of commodities right so so i guess the problem is that we just have one kind of dimension um that that has been kind of the legal form as the generation of that equal legal subject and and you know trying to understand how that works and that obviously has an impact then on the gen gender subjectivity but it can't explain it by itself yeah
Um, on the question about Stalin and Stalinism, just very briefly, I, I'm really glad this came up. And I, I, I think my own answer to this is one that will absolutely not convince a lot of people in this room. I'm aware of that, but I'm glad that we've reached a point, I think, where it can be talked about in a way that doesn't get sectarian hackles rising, which is that one of the things that I find compelling to me about Pashukhanis, particularly with regard to uh, the legal form as a real abstraction, and precisely looking at the phenomenon that you talk about, the explosion of law and Stalinism, is that for me, it is a vindication of that tradition that I come out of that sees the Soviet bloc as a version of capitalism, as a kind of state capitalism. Um, now, we, there's a huge discussion. We don't need to go into it. And I, I, again, to some extent, it can be an unuseful kind of question over terminology. But in brief, um, you know, I think I think you're right. I think I think that if you genuinely think uh, that that, 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 that there's no real way that that um, regime is is driven by capitalist accumulation, even in a kind of echo form. And yet you see the explosion of law. It's a major problem for Pashukhanisite theory. I came to Pashukhanis out of that theory. So for me, it was never a problem. It was just a kind of simple thumbs up. But I can recognize that that doesn't work for everyone. <clears throat> um. So firstly, to, to Leila's point, so I have said a lot of what I wanted to say, but one thing I do want to say, which I think is important, and it, I don't think it's imputable to what you're saying, but I think it's an important thing to get out of the way, is that one of the things that like certain popularizations of like the language of intersectionality did is they kind of smoothed over the differences in different modes of like, like race and gender just are not the same thing, and that's okay. Like they, they, they are both not class antagonisms but they are located for me in different parts of the social totality. They have different social relations that give rise to them. They're both forms of oppression, but it, it's not a surprise that race and gender might function quite differently in relation to accumulation and then in relation to the, the legal form in, in that kind of sense, right? And I think this is quite an important thing because my thing would be more I liked about what Ruth did, but why we can be different on this, right? Is it's like, if we imagine that these particular social relations come from different places, then of course we will also think that their relationship to the legal form looks quite different. Now, law, I think, clearly impacts and organizes both, but I think it does so in quite different, quite different ways, actually, about their social location, their geographical location. And of course, the, the two do intersect, because of course they do, but that the point then is to have particular material and social accounts of how each one is is brought in think about how those two things then relate together and what and what that means because to me obviously like what i am saying and i think this is a very specific thing about like the relationship between law and race is that law plays a very active role in just creating forms of racialization like just straightforwardly it, it, it does and it does then internalize a lot of that that stuff and so that to me by the way as i said it's not just the tension between formal and substantive it's also the very constitution of that formal equality has that thing coming on in the background and that is one of the reasons why whatever this is the international law thing you can be like look actually no no this is all very equal it's just that africans don't know how to manage their economies and white people do like and that is like an enduring thing there. so my point so i think we would answer it differently but i think that's an important thing to like set up as that as that difference i mean so then in terms of what um china was saying about about state cap i mean that's that will we'll, <laughs> there are agreements and disagreements to have but there i think there are a range of things that can be that can be said about that because of course you know so one thing that might also be said is that again if we're not talking about semantics you'd inquire into the nature of like what the kind of deployment like the stalinist deployment of law was and in some ways you could argue this is just a mystification of like a pure ex exercise of state power like actually if you look at the explosion of so much of the way that the law works it's like well, in relation to the kind of the public law stuff, it was just, a, it was essentially theatrical. It was like, here's a show trial. Like no one imagines that was an actual vindic, <laughs> but yeah, but it is one. So that's what, so one account could be that. And so one of the things I actually find quite interesting, but this relates back to the, the state capitalism thing from, from a different dimension is that one of the very interesting like sets of work that let's say people like um, Charles Bettelheim do is to be like, okay, well, what about the divergences between like formal juridical forms and then like the kind of juridical practices which can go on be like beyond and beneath the, like the operation of the state. So, and again, because we come from different ways of thinking about state capitalism, like one of the things that Bettelheim says is, okay, well, what if, it, what if it's actually the case that given the significant amount of autonomy that managers of like Soviet things have, it's not that the state is a capitalist, it's that 
actually in this context, they are functionally operating as capitalists because they have control over labor power. And there are legal mechanisms that like facilitate that, which might actually diverge from and contradict the kind of official state law of the Soviet Union, but nonetheless come up like that. So I think there's like a double kind of set of questions that we might answer there. And I'm going to let you answer the cosmology question, but I do want to say one thing which I think is important, which is that this is also why I think it's very important to think about differentiating the juridical from that. Because one of the best, one of the lessons that you get from Pashikhanis very specifically is that giving something rights is often a way to like enter it into the world of exploitation to begin with. So sometimes people, I think, can do a bit of conceptual slippage between this is an indigenous cosmology. We can translate that into a legal category by giving like this mountain, like juridical rights. And that's a way of, ins but actually that's very often, firstly, a way of mistranslating indigenous cosmologies into categories which are very easily appropriated by capitalism. And very specifically is often a way that you can enter it into like the logic of commodity exchange by being like, oh, this is, this has legal form now. And if you're in the legal form, then all this stuff can happen to you. So there's also often a very big danger. And for me, one of the things that this often comes down to is, very often indigenous people have made a tactical concession to redescribe their cosmologies in legal terms because they've basically been defeated. And it's like, hey, it's better that we get some protection. But then some people imagine that should be an ontological category where it's like, well, you need to recognize it's like, no, I, I don't think that you do because that is like legitimizing like a form of like, like a form of imperial control and violence over them. It's like they made the concession. It's great. They had to make that concession. We don't have to say in that context that this is also really that way. So it, does that make so it's not then to contest or criticize this from happening, but it is like I think that's a thing that people ought to be careful about in certain contexts. And I've been seeing a lot of conceptual slippage around that um recently. No, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think that was what was being no, said no, over no. there. That wasn't the yeah, claim that was being made. <laughs> yes. No, yeah, no, no, no. Because I thought you're interested in ballet and theatre like me. <laughs> exactly. Let us get back onto our terrain, <laughs> which is a much more fun terrain. So, and I know why you have to say actor, but I don't think even actor is the right word here. But it's something about um, what practices or imaginations do we have as humans to imagine the collective survival of all life forms on the planet? and what creative processes might we engage with, with an eye and an attention to who else is here with us that mediates against the very real threat that we're all gonna die. Now that seems like that's, that's worth some energy and performance. And I think um, there's something interesting about thinking of those kinds of questions as claims that are not adverse adversarial claims so it's not another side so we're not going to court but what practices might we have to articulate what it is to have you know a claim for our collective life which is what i think theater chorus you know chorus is like we all sing together and we just know the words there's not another side but there is something about um that's actually you know there used to be all this terribly, ro you know, roast into spectacle stuff about um, collective action against um, sexual violence when I was younger. And it wasn't, comp you know why people believed it, but, you know, also lots of difficulties with it. But the good bit of it is the idea that no court will ever help you in a situation of sexual violence, but all the other women in the village you live in could do. And the fact that the claim that is made might be made in a semi-legalistic language or in the language of the claim doesn't make it an act of law, but it does make it a reworking of something like a legal argument because that's what it needs for the chorus to be heard by the community. Now, I'm not saying that all of that work, and, and there are reasons why people try to look into that and we're still in that space. And I'm, and why I think about chorus is I was trying to do this other bit of work, I had to give up because I ran away from that workplace, about how we might think of um, navigating issues of sexual consent in online spaces, where there's never going to be an authority that tells us what to do, but we're all kind of can't tell what's happening and things bad things are happening to people that don't even so I think, oh, could you could it be like like traditional religion or the chorus of the community or some kind of creative practice 
which serves to articulate the legitimacy and recognition of the claim, the claim to life, and you don't need to have any will. So I think I think that's that must be part of our repertoire of survival. I don't know a way around it. Might be I'm more cheerful because I don't have to think about the legal form. But I would like to, yeah, you know, I think that's that must be part of what we're looking for. And maybe that's not law, but it's informed by, even if it's informed by what law could not be. It's a kind of dialogue I, was, I hear from you. You know, the stuff about um, fight dancing, that's kind of, kind of both like a spoof and an alternative to the argumentation, isn't it? That's what that history is. It's like, ha, 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 this is what you look like when you go to court, but also we can't go to court. So it's kind of what, that feels to me like a reworking of what legal logic and training might be for other purposes. But again, I don't have that. Thank you, everyone, for your responses. Right, I think we'll bring things to an end. We will start again tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. in the same room. We hope to see, hopefully, all of you, if not uh, most of you here. Uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, if people would like to go for a drink, I think they can follow Robin Fernando. Is that right? Mainly, <laughs> mainly Fernando. Um, finally, if you can just uh, join me in a round of applause for our panel here and all of our speakers today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of uh, Pasha Kainis at 100 uh, Legacies in Future Directions. Um, Thanks to those of you that were here yesterday and have come back, and to those of you that have come for the first time, welcome um, to that Latte group. I'll just do one or two quick bits of housekeeping. Uh, no fire alarm schedule for today. We have um, bathrooms on each floor, but I think the ones on the second floor are now locked, unfortunately. Um, refreshments are over there. Um, obviously, if you need a break at any time, please feel free to take one, but we will have breaks throughout the day. Um, we've tried to kind of ventilate the room a little bit better than it was yesterday. So some of the windows are um, open and we'll, we'll keep um, at least one of these um, ajar. Um, so yesterday we had a fantastic series of uh, discussions, uh, presentations and discussions. Uh, and we're going to hopefully, or we certainly will uh, continue that. Uh, we've got three panels today. Uh, the first one is going to be on uh, the fundamentals, um, which is going to be chaired by Leila Ulrich. Um, I, I just want to also remind you that this is obviously part of a series of events that's going to be taking place um, over the year. Um, the next one, we well, the next one that is certainly scheduled um, is going to take place on the 26th and 27th of uh, September, uh, which is going to be at Lund, which uh, Carl is uh, kindly organising. Um, and there'll be a call for papers in the next couple of weeks uh, or so. Yeah. 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 And Hugo is also an organizer. And Hugo as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, and then we'll also have uh, an ending conference in Sao Paulo. We'll we'll distribute details of that in due course. But we also encourage uh, colleagues from other institutions to organize their own events. And if we can in any way support that, uh, we'll be happy to do so. There is um, a page on uh, the uh, Marxist law blog, Legal Form, uh, which is going to be dedicated to... Uh, 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 advertising all of these events, and we'll also upload the recordings from yesterday and today. Um, and those of you that have registered will be become part of the mailing list for the Centre for Law and Science in the Global Context, one of the hosts, and we can send you out all of the details and reminders, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm just going to quickly pass it over to uh, Fernando, who's just going to make uh, a brief uh, announcement, and then we'll uh, start with the first panel. Do they go there? It's up to you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so as Tansil was saying, uh, this event is part of a series of events uh, because we want to celebrate and also explore the legacies of Pashukanis' work. And as part of that ongoing effort, um, me and Thais are putting together a reading group about Pashukanis. We've already collected some literature and uh, we will be conducting it in... Thanks. We will be conducting it in um, monthly or or... We'll figure out sessions uh, here in London. So if anybody would like to join in, uh, contact us after the conference and give us your email and then we'll be in touch. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, welcome to the first panel of the day, which is on the fundamentals. Uh, as Tandel said, my name is Leila Ulrich. I'm an associate professor of criminology at the University of Oxford. Um, we have four wonderful speakers with us today, uh, each of whom will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. And we will start with Fernando Quintana. I hope I don't, didn't get this completely wrong. Um, who, a, who holds a law degree from the Universidad de Chile and is currently a PhD student in law at QMUL here and who will speak to us on the defense of the withering away thesis, uh, followed by Thais Hoshika, uh, who is a doctoral student at the Universidad de Sao Paulo and will speak about Pashukanis on private and public law a dialectical reconstruction. Then we have Carl Willen, who spoke yesterday as well, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow in human rights studies at Lund University, and will talk to us about formalism and instrumentalism in the Marxist critique of right, with what must Pashukanian theory begin. And then last but not least, uh, Maria Tsanakopoulou, San Tsanakopoulou, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It was better, okay. Um, who is a lecturer in law at Birkbeck University and will finish with a uh, talk on legal form and the class struggle. Um, so without further ado, Fernando, do you wanna get us started? How would this work? So So, um, can you hear me? From this distance? Okay. Um, well, so thank you all for being here. Um, it's been a pleasure and it will continue to be, I assume. The title of my presentation is In Defense of the Withering Away Thesis. And um, I want to start with uh, two disclaimers. The first one is that this is part of my doctoral research in, I'm just in my second year, so many of the things I will be saying have not yet been fully researched. So if you detect any problems or have any feedback to give me, I will be very grateful for that. The second disclaimer is that uh, to talk about the withering away thesis in Pashukanis' formulation is to talk about a post-capitalist future. And as you may know, uh, we are not in the best of times to discuss about hopeful things, right? In a world marked by genocide, war, and impunity, it seems a bit odd to be talking about a post-capitalist future. But hope is the fuel of the working classes, and therefore I think we should not give it up. Hope is a political decision, so I think discussing about a post-capitalist future is still worth it. Um, the withering away thesis, as has been mentioned yesterday, is one of the ways in which Pashukanis characterizes a post-capitalist society claiming that a post-capitalist society would also be a post-legal society. Um, therefore, it's deeply tied to his commodity form theory of law. I would like to read a brief quote about his um, other texts. One of them is called Economics and Legal Regulation from 1929, and I quote, the problem of the withering away of law is the cornerstone by which we measure the degree of proximity of a jurist to Marxism. In other words, for Pashukanis, the withering away thesis is not a mere addendum to his commodity form theory of law. It's probably the core and the direct corollary of it. So how to understand this um, withering away thesis? I would like to start by uh, noting that uh, Pashukanis' commodity form theory has to be viewed as a conjunctural intervention in two senses, theoretical and political. Theoretically, um, Pashukanis' theory of law is an intervention against both formalism and instrumentalism, about which Karl, I think, will be talking later. And also in a political sense, um, his theory of law is an intervention against those attempts to abolish law at once as one of the first steps towards revolution, and also against those who wanted to preserve the legal reform uncritically in the form of proletarian law socialist law on, or formulations of that kind. I am, for today, more interested in the political part of this intervention. Although it must be noted that uh, Pashukanis wrote in a very different context to us, of course, we all know it, but um, the, um, specifically, Pashukanis addresses strategic questions 
not in our context, in the context of the possibility of an anti-capitalist resistance, but in the context of the socialist construction in the early Soviet revolution. That difference must be held in mind for interpretation reasons. Um, theoretically, the withering away thesis is very interesting in my opinion, because it is a thin synthesis of many different discussions. It puts together uh, questions about the determinations, the origins, and the, the nature of the legal form. Um, in other words, I think uh, addressing this is an indirect way to address most of Pashukanis' theory. One final note about the strategic implications. Um, we will not be able to go through all of this, but I want to briefly mention that um, last year was the 50th anniversary of the coup d'etat against the democratic president Salvador Allende in Chile, which was one of the most important attempts to construct socialism through the legal way. And of course, this analysis has a lot of edges to it, but I would say that one of the problems of Allende's proposition was precisely his over respect to the rule of law and uh, his subjection to the political limitations that are entailed in a fully legal socialist strategy. So um, I will start with a brief review of uh, some arguments that have been given against Pashukanis' formulation of the withering away thesis. If you review the literature on this, uh, you will find three main types of arguments. I will go fast through the first two and I will stop more in the third one. So first, the, what I call unfeasibility argument, claims that a society without law is totally unthinkable because any modern complex society needs law as an absolute condition for its functioning. Against this, I would say, if we follow Pashukanis and we analyze the legal form as a historically specific form for social regulation, we could note that a society without law is not the same as saying a society without any form of social regulation. The question is, what other forms could we think of? And then we can compare and see how it works out. In other words, um, I would say that the unfeasibility argument is part of what Pashukanis calls legal fetishism the unthinkability of other forms of social regulation that go beyond the legal form. Second, what I call the political argument, um, the claim that uh, without law, political power would be absolutely and necessarily arbitrary. This claim was put forward famously by E.P. Thompson when he claims that uh, the rule of law is an unqualified human good. I would answer briefly that, yes, it is a human good in class societies. Can we not imagine how political power would look like, would work like in classless societies? And third, uh, the one I find most interesting is what I call the normative argument. Um, this literature claims that even in a society that transcends class struggle, even in a society that transcends commodity production and therefore socially produced egoism, the law would be of value because it has inherent features that make it valuable. This argument can be found um, mostly in the works, or uh, to, give, to give at least two examples, in the works of Christine Sibnowicz and Igor Shoikebrov. Briefly, um, in her The Concept of Socialist Law, uh, Christine Sibnowicz claims that um, the legal form is a necessary condition for human flourishing. In other words, without a proper legal framework, um, the all around development of human beings would be impossible, she claims. Igor Shoikebrod has an even more interesting argument in my opinion, because he reconstructs, he reconstructs, I apologize, um, Marx's account of recognition as the normative argument in favor of communist legality. As you may know, uh, Marx, especially in his early stages, but also can be argued in his more mature critique of the political economy, uh, was concerned with alienation as one of the forms in which uh, modern societies distort the development of individuals. Schoikebrod reconstructs uh, his arguments on recognition, and he claims that recognition requires, as a condition of possibility, um, a reconstituted notion of legal person, which is precisely where I would attack him. Um, I mean, 
with for I would attack his theory um, because because it can be argued that uh, the legal form of recognition is precisely a distorted form of recognition. Okay, to make this point, one would have to go through a lot of uh, Marx's earlier writings, which I will not do right now. Um, what I want to do is to put the opposite claim forward. In other words, that um, there are normative reasons to envisage and fight for a post-legal society. Before I go to that uh, problem, the problem of the alternative, I want to say one more thing. Um, because the way in which Sibnowicz and Schoikebroth argue against the withering away thesis throws light into an interesting philosophical problem. Um, as I said, the withering away thesis should be understood as part of the broader philosophical discussion of the concept of the alternative to capitalism. And here is the question. What is the methodological status of the concept of the alternative to capitalism? Should it be understood in a descriptive way, meaning about uh, the consequences of Marx's critique of political economy and the historical character of capitalist social relations? Or should we understand the concept of the alternative to capitalism in a normative way, that is, as a programmatic formulation of what the ultimate goal of political action is? This philosophical debate is rooted in another even broader philosophical debate, which is also very interesting. Um, and that debate is, what is the relation of Marx's critique of political economy and Marx's critique of alienation? Briefly, my position would be that these two cannot be separated. I follow Peter Hudis in this, who claims that um, Marx's critique of alienation was not abandoned and replaced by Marx's critique of political economy, but rather Marx's critique of alienation is the normative standpoint from which he develops his critique of political economy. While at the same time, his critique of political economy gives historical concreteness to his critique of alienation. But again, that is uh, too thorny to be developed uh, completely right now. Um, so here comes the big question, the fun question. What can be the alternative to the legal form? Um, this question, of course, cannot be answered by itself, but it must be understood within a broader question about the alternative to commodity production. In other words, uh, we cannot think of an alternative to the legal form without thinking at least to some degree in an alternative to the logic of value, of the valorization of value as the guiding principle of social metabolism. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, discussing the alternative to the legal form by itself is an abstraction. It must be discussed within the broader context of the alternative to commodity producing societies. But also just discussing the alternative to commodity producing societies without addressing the problem of the alternative to the legal form um, is a methodological mistake if we take into account how Pashuganis explains that um, commodity fetishism is further complemented by legal fetishism. We should start, of course, with Marx, who, unlike a common belief, uh, does address explicitly the problem of the alternative to capitalism. Um, in Capital One, Volume One, right after his critique of commodity fetishism, Marx talks about the society of freely associated producers. And here I want to quote. Uh, let's think of, and here begins the quote, an association of free men working with the means of production held in common and expanding their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness as one single social labor force. Um, of course, that is a very brief statement, but um, not much more than that can be said uh, if we consider also that um, it will be the task of the revolution to go into the more concrete problems of the design of a future society. Based on this understanding of uh, Marx's concept of the alternative to capitalism, we can assess what Pashukanis' concept of the alternative to the legal form was, and um, despite how much I like his critique of the legal form, I do not agree with his concept of the alternative, and I will explain why. Um, Pashukanis explains that uh, the alternative to the legal form is the technical rule. 
okay? Um, to explain it briefly, uh, if legal rules presuppose the not just divergence, but opposition of interests as its uh, social basis, technical rules, rules presuppose unity of interests as their social basis. But Pashukanis has at least one profound ambiguity. He explains that the overcoming of the legal form is a um, slow and timely period, but uh, uh, of, of um, slow replacement of the technical rule to the legal form, but he does not really explain if for him the technical rule is actually the alternative for a fully developed post-capitalist society, or if it is rather a transitional form uh, to be the social vehicle of the advancement of uh, the state-based planned economy. How we read it uh, makes a big difference. In any case, no matter how we read this ambiguity, um, I have at least three comments on the idea of technical rule as an alternative to the legal form. First of all, it is conceptually um, too thin how to distinguish uh, legal rules and technical rules. Uh, the criteria for the distinction is not enough, in my opinion. Second, it is a form of social regulation that is still too state-centered. And I would like to read a quote here on the same text I quoted earlier. He says, true regulation, that is the technical rule, true regulation begins where the activity of the state replaces the so-called economic motive. So he's actually thinking of this dichotomy of market or state without seeing other possibilities. And finally, um, the formulation of technical rule ignores that even in a situation of non-oppositional interests, that is, even in a situation in which uh, society produces individuals with concurring interests, uh, there are different possible ways of achieving common goals. And I think the idea of technical rule tends to depoliticize the alternatives that exist even in a situation of common interests. And it kind of suggests that the task of deciding how to pursue those common interests should be addressed by a, a technical agency, which again is kind of like the Soviet uh, bureaucratic version of socialism. At the same time, but I will just go through this very briefly because I think I'm running out of time. Yes, I am, thank you. Um, Pashuganis claims that along with the legal form, the ethical form should also wither away. Here he does one big theoretical mistake. He takes uh, Kant's version of ethics as the ultimate example of, 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 of ethics. And he claims that uh, in a situation that in a social situation of um, being after the overcoming of commodity production, ethics would not be necessary. Why? Because uh, after commodity production, he claims um, the interest on, of the individual and the interest of the collective would not be distinguishable. I think that is a mistake uh, because uh, the fact that we transcend socially produced oppositional interests does not erase the boundaries of individuality. And therefore, we still need to think of possible mediations between individual interest and collective interest in a context of non-oppositional interests. How much time do I have? Um, two minutes. Two minutes. That's, that's enough. Thank you. So um, I will just uh, briefly um, state what my idea of the alternative could be. I am aware that I will leave many important things undeveloped, but uh, we have a long day and hopefully evening to keep discussing. So um, I would like to quote Marx on this, uh, who also has other texts in which he explores the possibility of the alternative, specifically in the letters to Vera Sasulich, the Russian revolutionary who was asking whether the Russian agrarian commune could be an alternative for a socialist development. And Marx says in the first draft that we should not be afraid of archaic social forms, but rather we could think of superior forms of archaic types of collective property and production as a way to say that the commune could be the starting point for a different type of socialist development. As uh, you may know, uh, in Latin America, we have a very rich um, indigenous heritage, uh, which has been picked up by the insurgent left and People like Alvaro Garcia Linera, the former vice president of Bolivia, has uh, elaborated proposals about the communal forms as possible uh, forms of social mediation between the individual and uh, the social collective as a form of organizing social reproduction beyond this opposition of individuals and markets. But, and I will end with this, 
um, communal forms are deeply based on uh, direct relations between each other, with people um, of people between each other, and direct relations with land. And the problem of land is that it is a particular space, so communal forms tend to be particularistic, and we need a universal type of mediation for a new society, right? But that dichotomy between the universal and the particular, I think, is also in the basis of Pashukanis' dichotomy of free market legal form or state-based centralized economy technical rule. I think we can think beyond that dichotomy with the uh, conceptual developments of modern debates of economic planning, which put forward a different type of social planning, which people like Evgeny Morozov or Pedro Nardelli talk about decentralized planning uh, through the socialization of the means, the means of digital feedback infrastructure or cyber physical systems for the democratic decentralized planning of social reproduction. I know I probably raised more questions than answers, but um, this is what I've done so far with my uh, idea of the alternative. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, so this is my first uh, presentation in English. So um, sorry if I if I make a few mistakes. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Tanzio, Rob, Fernando, and Eva who is with us online for the opportunity for this important event. It is truly an honor for me. And so my speech today is entitled Pachucanis on private and public law. Like Fernando, I'm also a PhD student. So I would love to, to listen to your commentaries and considerations about this ongoing research. So one of the most problematic topics in Pachucanis uh, work is how he addresses the problem of private and public law. According to most of the commentators, Pachucanis fails to terrorize public law adequately, positing it as a mere ideological uh, or uh, imperfect reflection of private law. So this presentation aims to overcome these uh, criticisms, providing a more comprehensive reading of Pashukani's theory and the relationship private and public law, which can be achieved, I think, through a dialectical reconstruction of Pashukani's work. So I want to explain what I understand for dialectical reconstruction. I mean, with this, a mode of presentation of categories that is not historical in the sense that it captures historical transformations through different stages of capitalist accumulation or different social formations, but one that captures its object in its totality in the context in which they stand logically connected. Uh, and represents an existing concrete whole. However, if the, even if this is a Hegelian type of uh, systematic presentation, it is more of a Hegelian inspiration and a creative adaptation than a rigorous following of syllogistic patterns. You will not find this sort of, of dialectical presentation here. So first, we must take Pashukani's uh, first subtitle of his book, which was Contribution to a Critique of the Fundamental Juridical Concepts, seriously. And I read this fundamentally as a critique of the general theory of law in the same uh, sense that Marx wrote a critique of political economy. Um, so this cannot be, um, it is not about a refutation of this or that specific legal current, but a refutation of the whole science of law as we know it. Um, this cannot be a, a, an empty negation. On the contrary, it implies a revolution of the whole set of categories and concepts we uh, use to address the problem the problem of law in the capitalist mode of production. So it is the task of Marxist legal theory to present the set of necessary uh, categories that constitutes its object as it is. So in my dialectical reconstruction, th three moments are of particular importance. And for a moment, I under understand here as a composition of, con of, of concepts uh, immediately connected or connected by a mediating um, concept that pertains to a determinate level of abstraction. 
as the presentation goes forward, the set of concepts uh, does not disappear, but is are preserved in a higher, more complex and concrete moment. In its simple level of abstraction, the legal subject is the point of departure. According to Pachucani's quoting, um, the analysis of the form of the subject follows directly from the analysis of the commodity form, end quote. And commodity in Marxist capital is not a mere thing, but an objective form of social uh, relations, the way in which value form appears immediately and represents the simplest form of social relation in capitalism. So capitalist relations, as you know it, are not direct because the production occurs based on a dissociated form of human sociability. And through the analysis of commodity form, Marx demonstrated how two different commodities as different use values could be united in difference in a third thing distinct from its natural form, which means that a commodity only acquires its social character when it is abstracted from every and any particular quality becoming a real abstraction. It is only under these conditions that a legal subject can emerge as the subjectivized reflection of the abstract realization of value. Precisely because the commodity is the simplest form of social relation in capitalism, the social bound between individuals can only occur in the form of the legal relation between subjects as private owners of equivalent commodities. So through exchange, man under capitalism realizes its threefold nature as free, hence equal to other subjects, and through the autonomy of will, finding private property its first condition of existence. And the further development of the commodity form reveals itself as a capital relation, so the system of exchange cannot produce a real equality or a freedom, but can only reproduce itself under these conditions. And this is a real contradiction that does not disappear as we progress to higher levels of abstraction. That is why we cannot have a genuine of Hebel in Hegel's sense of the term, but that is how we deal with real contradictions. We posit the forms in which they can move, as Marx says, in capital. Um, and so the next moment in the presentation requires the transition from the simplest moment of the legal subject to the position the legal norm occupies in the system of the legal form. And this tr transition der derives from the inadequacy of the legal subject in being the universal manifestation of the legal form as it is still assumes a form of constant disappearance being restricted to finite and particular exchange relations. So just as capitalist relations appears as monetary relations, so uh, the analysis of the legal norm, uh, so the, the legal relations appears as normative relations. So the analysis of the legal norm corresponds to the next moment of uh, dialectical presentation. That means uh, the analysis of the legal norm not only consists of investigating how the juridic relationship of the legal subject finds in the legal norm one of its necessary expression, but leads to a more complex issue, that of the dialectical relationship between the legal form and the impersonal political power, that is the state. Um, so in the field of traditional legal theory, the antithesis of the legal form mentioned by Pachucanis are logically represented by the relationship between objective and subjective law, uh, later manifesting as a problem between private and public law. And it, it is not by chance that these concepts are one of the, go the greatest challenges in the development of bourgeois legal, legal theories. In, and in opposition to the definitions of legal positivism, what Pachucani is, um, unfolds is that subjective law is rather the actual embodiment of the form of the legal subject. This is why Pachucani says that subjective law is primary as it embodies the existence of legal subjects that oppose each other in an equivalent relationship, logically preceding the presence of a third party, the political power, guaranteeing the, that relationship. So in the first level of abstraction that I was talking about, the relations between legal subjects 
are maintained by virtue of the ultimate cohesive force of capitalist sociability, that is the economic one. Objective law as the norm posited by the state pertains to a derived moment. So in its universality, uh, the state constitutes itself as a public and impersonal political power. In order to express its general will, it can only present itself as an abstract will, as an universal will. However, these attributes belong to the subject, to the personality as such, which in capitalism is none other than that of the legal subject itself. So while the, the state must externalize its will and poses posit itself as a subject, it can only truly be a legal subject whose determination necessarily involves the autonomy of private will. So how can be universal and therefore public and, and private at the same time? This is the reason why you must find this third objective and reified form, the embodiment of abstract will, in which private subjects can recognize this common property between them, but outside them, and that is the universal form of the legal norm. So although Pachucanis does not exclude the importance of analyzing the content of legal norms, since a certain form is expressed in determined uh, content, um, this task can only begin after the ana analysis of the specific form that this content must assume. So, um, we're making a comparison with Marx's capital. In the dialectic of the value form, Marx demonstrates how value is a social property, which is why one can twist and turn the, the commodity and still find no atom of value in its body. So this infinite chains between commodities, although capable of explaining the emergence of value as a social relation, is not sufficient to explain how value generalizes itself and becomes a social reality. This is only become evident when Marx introduces money. So in the object where money is represented, being material or material, there is a sort of abandonment of its concrete materiality as a used value to become the real embodiment of its uh, negation, that is, it truly becomes an abstraction. And the same role is played by the abstract and general legal norm, which as an expression of the universal, reflexively guarantees the multiplicity of legal relation uh, relations beyond individual legal subjects, even bringing the subject back to the realm of law in case of law breaking through punishment. Um, thus, it is possible to explain how law is capable of autonomizing itself in the face of legal relations of commodity exchange. And well, through the three volumes of, of Capital, Marx demonstrated how capital's inner nature is progressively obscured by its different forms of appearance. But fundamentally, they are still moments of the functioning of the capitalist mode of production. And this mystification is also found in the relation between public, public and private law. And here we move to the, the third moment, to the third moment. So a um, materialist investigation law uh, should not uh, identify its, the structure of its object with, it, with its phenomenal forms of manifestation. So this sort of approach inevitably leads to a narrow focus on the investigation of the private and public law relation within their different branches. For example, analysis of the civil law, administrative law, um, and, and so on. Um, instead, what Pashukanis asserts is that uh, the contradiction between subjective and objective norm, uh, objective law, comes up yet again in a more concrete form as a problem of public and private law. And from this, it is possible to deduce that private and public law already encompass both the category of the legal subject and the category of the legal norm. That is to say, spheres in which the fundamental forms of law have already come into being in the legal political superstructure. I only uh, call it sup superstructure because I'm, I'm telling of a, a more concrete instantiation, uh, not because I uh, agree with the structure, superstructure kind of uh, presentation. So um, the possibility 
of extracting uh, restrictive interpretations of Pashkani's work and an alleged inability to properly terrorize the public law stems in part from the foundation of the, the legal form, which indeed belongs to the domain of private relations of commodity exchange, and in part from the way Pashkanis presents this issue, which appears at different chapters in general theory of law and Marxism without a rigorous uh, systematicity. And these restri restrictive uh, interpretations primarily arise from Pashukani's assertion that the foundation of private law should be sought in the logic of commodity relations and not in the law posited by the state. Indeed, this is true, but also leads to a narrow view of legal institutionalism and a privatistic genesis of law that corresponds to the argument that private law is taken by Pashukani's as a foundational structure capable of explaining the development of the legal and political superstructure as a whole, which of course is insufficient, and that private law corresponds to the form of the legal subject and therefore is limited to the sphere of commodity exchange. As a consequence, this ends up limiting the sphere in which the legal form is determinant to contractual economic relations of exchange change and no relations that do not necessarily revolve around the private economic interests of individuals are not considered illegal but that rather belong to the realm of political convenience as if it is possible to conceive in fully developed uh, capitalist uh, relations the um, uh, a sort of space um, that is not determined by the the legal form so if private law pertains to a more concrete moment, it cannot be adequately theorized without the moment of the legal norms posited by the state, which indeed have the power to shape and even, even create re legal relations. For, for example, restricting the exercise of the autonomy of will, imposing juridical regulations through contracts and even creating cre uh, derivative figures such as the juridical person, for example and even imposing the, their form on other social relations not necessarily confined to acts of commodity e exchange. And in its turn, public law cannot be considered as a mere defective reflection of private law because pertains more closely to the irreducible field of the political. The state exerts its domination through the legal form. So as a subject, and, then, and therefore preserve the form of law, even in those rules of organizations and norms of technical content and so far, as the legal uh, norm itself uh, contains in its own form, the abstract and general character of the legal norm as such. Um, so uh, this is the case, for example, and I am I'm finished. <laughs> This is the case, for example, for example, in criminal law, a field in which the legal relationship itself detaches from the economic moment and acquires an autonomous movement, assuming its legal character in the moment of the criminal judicial uh, process. Here, the form of equivalence is established after the fact. This particular variant of the legal form arises from the fundamental role of legal norm as the presupposition of the criminal legal relation, and without that, there is no legal form. If Pashukani's argument were indeed uh, institutionally privatist, the investigation into the specificity of the legal relationship in the sphere of, of criminal law would be impossible, as it does not directly derive from the economic, uh, from the commodity exchange relations, but involves an understanding of the mediated action of the state. So I will leave everything else to say in the, the debate part. <laughs> Thank you for for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Thais, and uh, also Fernando for really interesting talks. Uh, I will uh, present an unpublished article, uh, and uh, the basic uh, point of departure of the article is 
that uh, although uh, the issue of formalism and instrumentalism always is regarded as very central to people dealing with Pashukanis, I haven't found uh, uh, systematic accounts of the differences and similarities between formalism and instrumentalism in, yeah, in the literature. Uh, so I find that often uh, the issue of formalism and instrumentalism is quite re uh, briefly tackled uh, in the literature. Uh, I also see that sometimes scholars focus exclusively on differences between formalism and instrumentalism in, and, and instrumentalism. And in other cases, uh, scholars are interested in the similarities or the um, uh, affinities between formalism and instrumentalism. Uh, and in the article, I'm not arguing that this is uh, wrong or uh, uh, problematic uh, per, per se. Uh, I do think that for certain situations, it is important to focus on the differences between formalism and instrumentalism, for, ex for example, or uh, in other uh, situations, for other purposes, it might be more interesting with similarities. Uh, it's also often not the case that you have to have a, a long discussion about formalism and instrumentalism. It depends on what's your pur what, what's the purpose of, of the intervention. Uh, but what I do argue, and that's what I'm going to try to argue here, is that if the concept of the legal form would only supersede differences between formalism and instrumentalism, it would be insufficient. If it won would only supersede or avoid similarities between formalism and instrumentalism, it would also be insufficient. Uh, so against this background, I argue that the kind of negative intervention of Pashukanis, he, he, he was the first to formulate, formulate and articulate this kind of double polemical point of departure against both formalism and instrumentalism. Uh, I think it's best understood in terms of a spectrum uh, and uh, that differences are meaningful precisely on account of substantial affinities between formalism and instrumentalism and vice versa. Uh, I will not have the time here, but uh, I also argue in the article that the, the, t the, the critique of what I call then the spectrum of formalism and instrumentalism, it, it has a very broad applicability uh, far beyond uh, issues in legal theory. I think uh, the applicability really is in social theory in general. Uh, but maybe we can discuss that in, yeah, if you have questions about that. But I, I won't be able to <laughs> to argue the, this in the talk. Um, yeah. I want to begin by mentioning that Pashukanes himself never used the term formalism and instrumentalism. Uh, he tended to argue against certain positions, saying that they were formal in character. He also used uh, uh, the term instrumental. Uh, instead, he, I mean, uh, alongside arguments against specific authors, uh, he, he he used the term uh, idealist theories. He used the term sociological theories and psychological theories. Uh, and uh, but I, I used the term formalism and instrumentalism since they are yeah most common in the literature. It's, it's an easy way out for me. Uh, and beyond this remark, uh, I have too little time here to. To, uh, to go into the rather uneven remarks that you can find in Pashukani's work uh, about formalism and instrumentalism or about idealist theories and sociological theories of law. Uh, so instead, I, <clears throat> I will jump directly to what I take to be the major differences and the major similarities between formalism and instrumentalism. Uh, and uh, then I will draw some conclusions about uh, this spectrum and, and the the character of the spectrum and the problems with the spectrum of formalism and instrumentalism. Um, yeah, in the article, I, I, I base my argument both on a reading of Pashukanis and in dialogue with yeah, the history of reception of Pashukanis. Uh, but I begin then by a reconstruction of four major differences uh, uh, between formalism and instrumentalism. So uh, the first difference has to do with form and content. Uh, of course, <laughs> the formalist uh, privilege uh, form for critique uh, for critique of society. Uh, so, 
a, a, a formalist assumption uh, presupposed that law is a measure uh, or a standard of what ought to be against which what is can be measured and criticized. Uh, the instrumentalists take the unequal origins, functions, and effects of this same form as a proof of its deficiency. So it takes this, the, the, the content, uh, the social content of various forms uh, as its point of departure and as, uh, as a privilege. So uh, that, that's a basic difference between formalism and instrumentalism. Mm -hmm. um, the formalists assume that the legal form is independent and that it's neutral. Uh, the instrumentalists assume that it is dependent and partial on them elite interests or social interests broadly or power relations. Um, thirdly, uh, in terms of the alternative to, uh, to capitalism, as Fernando also talked about, for the, formalist, for, for the formalist argument or for the formalist theories, uh, socialism can be seen as a realization of political and legal forms existing now. So social change is uh, imagined as a transformation of society to match the legal form. Uh, and, and therefore it's, it's a notion of continuity. Uh, for the instrumentalist, uh, the legal form uh, disguises or obscures a history of continuity of power. And in terms of, of, of uh, post-capitalism, it seems it is seen as a, as a rupture with the present society. So it's a difference between continuity and rupture in terms of social change. Uh, also for the formalist, and the fourth uh, difference is that uh, the formalists defend uh, liberal institutions, uh, liberal ideas. Uh, the formalists assume that it, there, there is a deep cleavage or, or, or a substantial difference between, for example, democracy and autocracy, uh, between democracy and fascism, uh, and tends to, tends to downplay similarities. Uh, for the instrumentalism, there is no, for the instrumentalist, there is no significant difference between, on the one hand, the factory and the prison, uh, education and brainwashing, uh, fascism and democracy, they all represent cases of subordination and power. So for the instrumentalist, for example, uh, might tend to see uh, a, a fascist capitalist state as not that much worse than a, a democratic capitalist state. Uh, so that's also, that's a fourth uh, difference. Uh, yeah, and I turn then to, to the similarities. Uh, so uh, I argue that both the formalist and the instrumentalist approach uh, relies on a form content dichotomy or opposition. Uh, for the formalist, of course, that's very uh, straightforward. Uh, without a distinction between form and content, uh, it would not be possible to have this distinction between what ought to be and what is, to criticize what is from an ought. Uh, the instrumentalist also needs the distinction uh, or the opposition between form and content uh, since uh, the legal form the, the legal form is always and everywhere uh, representing ideology that obscures power and, uh, and particularity or serve elite interests uh, and most importantly then uh, this form content dichotomy is naturalized and this is an argument I take from Robert Fine, as we discussed yesterday. Uh, the the uh, when when the, when the formalist bases its uh, its uh, its argument on the form or the legal form, uh, uh, it downplays historical origins, social functions, and effects uh, in order to to use. Uh, the legal form to criticize society. Uh, and then you get lost. What you get lost then is uh, historical specificity and difference and so on. Uh, less straightforwardly than the instrumentalist 
when you assume that a specific form always obscure or always serves social interests, uh, then you also implicitly realize, uh, naturalizes this uh, dichotomy between form and content. Uh, so in this regard, then, the instrumentalist is also a formalist in a sense, I argue. Uh, the second point of, of similarities has to do with neutral neutrality. Uh, so the formalist, I, I already said it, uh, assume that the legal form is neutral since they disregard uh, origins, functions, and effects. Uh, but in so far as the instrumentalist believes that this legal form in capitalism can be filled with an other content in a post-capitalist society, they also understand the legal form as neutral. So the form has no independent effects uh, in that sense. It has independent effects, according to the in instrumentalist in capitalism. <laughs> Uh, and that's the effect that it serves elite interests. Uh, but in the post-capitalist society, uh, it can be filled with another content, uh, and therefore you must also assume that there is a, a, uh, an element of neutrality. Uh, the third uh, similarity uh, I'm arguing about here is has to do with voluntarism. So. Uh, both the instrumentalists and the formalists arrive to the conclusions about independency versus dependency only after having assumed that the form of right is independent to the degree or to the extent that it is independent of the will or intentions of powerful actors. Uh, so uh, the formalist, of course, directly supposes that the political legal form is independent of the will of powerful social actors since they believe that it, it can be used for social critique without uh, uh, without a focus on its origins or effects. Uh, concerning the instrumentalists, the instrumentalists then find historically, sociologically, uh, when studying uh, different cases of, of, of uh, uh, different spe specific historical uh, sequences, uh, that uh, the legal form has been used as an instrument by uh, by powerful uh, social actors. Um, and this precludes then the proposition that the legal form may serve capital exactly as a result of being independent of the will and interest of specific social actors. Uh, and this is, of course, what Ashokan has argued. Uh, the fourth uh, similarity uh, that I... Uh, identify has to do with uh, the conditions the condition the social conditions for collective action on the one hand and also uh, uh, for uh, uh, collective action and strategy in social movements so i argue that both formalist and instrumentalist idealize homogene homogenize and level the socio-political landscape in which a social movement acts into where it collapses it into a horizontal Plane. And I think we had this in the discussion yesterday, uh, and you talked about, Rob, the differences between power relations of gender and racialization. And I do think that, uh, I mean, in, in terms of the formalist argument, as you see the legal form as a general measure, uh, measurement and the standard of critique, you tend also to collapse very, very different histories and social relations of power to inequality in general, uh, to exclusion in general, or particularity in general. Uh, and so the same thing then goes for, for the instrumentalist vantage point of the legal form as a pure distortion uh, uh, or an instrument. Uh, so it's particularity, inequality, and exclusion in general that are distorted by the form of right. Uh, in both cases, then the social content of social movements, the class composition uh, of social movements, as well as the conditions that they confront becomes both idealized and, uh, and, and uh, leveled. Uh, I'm doing quite fine with time. Yes, wonderful. Uh, all right, so uh, I have, I don't, I don't think I, I will need to, to wrap up, but on account of the four differences and the four similarities, I have an argument 
about the qualities of this spectrum. Uh, so by virtue of the differences, you can see polarization. And of course, I mean, what I'm doing in this article, uh, it's I, I'm trying to generalize theoretical or conceptual arguments. Uh, but I do think that it's very easy, straightforward and easy to see this logic between formalism and instrumentalism in various discussions and fields. Uh, myself, I've, uh, I've been studying uh, the, H the, the debates about the Haitian Revolution and, uh, and the issue of universalism and democracy. And I, I, I really think that it's possible to see that the dy dynamic uh, that I will now uh, uh, talk about is clearly visible in that debate uh, and also in other debates. Uh, so by virtue of the differences between formalism and instrumentalism, you can see a polarization uh, in various debates. And also in the way I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reconstruct uh, reconstructing uh, the spectrum. But I argue that each poll, and this might be, this is what I think is the most interesting <laughs> part of my article, but uh, each poll in itself also contains the seeds for a kind of self negating counter reaction. So the formalist, in front of an instrumentalist critique of the legal form or, or, or an argument uh, based on the legal form, uh, the formalist can always argue against the instrumentalist that even if we know that unequal origins or effects of the legal form exist, uh, it can never disprove the validity of the legal form conclusively because that would amount to uh, the genetic fallacy. Also, the, the formalist could answer the instrumentalist that, well, uh, the legal form may appear hand in hand with social power and social interest and inequality, but it doesn't mean that it will do so forever. Uh, we, we might try to make the ideal or the legal form purer. Uh, and the, the instrumentalist can then answer that in front of the invocation of the gen genetic policy or the promises of another future in which the legal form will be purer, uh, the instrumentalist can can say that, but uh, can answer by just adding supplementary sociological evidence about the dependency and partiality of the form of right. Uh, so the result here then uh, that you will only have a new round of accusations of the genetic policy and the future promises. It becomes meaningful again, and then again it achieves little more than to open the door to sociological evidence once again. Uh, so, so I'm arguing then that the formalist distinction between form and content is fought with a collapse of the distinction altogether by the instrumentalist, which invites new formalist arguments, which invites new instrumentalist arguments again. Uh, the instrumentalist collapse of the distinction between form and content not only leaves a room for a counter attack signed by the formalist, but also presupposes this distinction from the very beginning, without which it would not be meaningful to offer that kind of, of critique. So my conclusion, uh, and this is my last point, uh, is that uh, the concept of the legal form must be able to see, supersede this basic logic of the spectrum between formalism and instrumentalism, uh, instead of only trying to avoid differences uh, between formalism and, uh, and instrumentalism or similarities, uh, or a narrow focus on class instrumentalism, for example. Yeah, I'll there. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm aware I'm probably invisible behind these things. Uh, so sorry for that part of the room. Thanks very much um, for the invite. Uh, we're in Sanzil, Eva. Um, now, my disclaimer would be I'm no uh, expert in Pashukani, so I thought, how can I bring to the table something that makes sense? And what I came up with was to discuss Pashukani's with, um, in relation with strands of Marxism that I am a little more comfortable with. And as it happens, I'm a little more comfortable with um, structural Marxists. So what I will try to do today 
is um, take legal form and state form and see if we can infuse it with some of the themes of um, structural Marxism, basically um, the class struggle, but also the state understood as a material condensation of class power. So I'm gonna be discussing two things, um, these two things, uh, more in the form of questions um, rather than answers. Uh, one thing is legal form and the idea that um, legal content is subject to the class struggle, but legal form is not. And the other thing um, is the state derivation theory. And I'm going to say that um, the state form should be derived not just from the sphere of circulation, uh, but also from the sphere of production. And once we do that, we can see that the class struggle is kind of present in the state form as well. Um, now, starting with um, commodity form. Uh, I'm going to start with the withering away thesis to hopefully. <laughs> so um, now for Poshikanis, the idea, I guess, is that what we know about the law kind of always is determined exposed. There's nothing autonomous about the law. And for this reason, in a post-capitalist um, world, it will survive for a bit, but then wither away because it's not sustainable autonomously without the bourgeois state. So there's no such thing as proletarian law, basically. Uh, and for a period of time, and that's for my purposes, the important thing that Pashukani says, for a period of time, there may be surviving laws with pro-proletarian content, uh, but retain the bourgeois form, namely the commodity form. And this kind of leads to the conclusion that content is subject to class struggle, but form is not. And Pashukani's is in fact quite, I don't want to say dismissive, but in lack of a better word, I'll say dismissive now. <laughs> it's kind of dismissive of the idea of class struggle as a constitutive force um, at all. He says at some point in, in the general theory, many Marxists, he says, assume that by simply adding in the element of class struggle, and he means to their analysis of, of the law, they would attain a genuinely materialist Marxist theory of law. Yet all that follows from this is a history of economic systems with a fairly faint juridical tinge or a history of institutions, but by no means a history of law. Now, this is what Pashukani says. And now structuralists are no less suspicious or hostile towards the idea of bourgeois law, but I think they say something quite different. Um, there's this famous text by Althusser, uh, Contradiction and Overdetermination, and over there, he says, um, he basically discusses Lenin's survivals. That's, you know, the persistence of bourgeois right in communism, or more generally, the, the persistence of structures that, you know, transcend material paradigms and so on. And he discusses the possibility of supersession um, of such structures, of such survivals. And he says that to understand survivals in a truly Marxist way, he says, we need to uh, consider them in the light of um, the fact that all contradictions and all constitutive elements of society are overdetermined by one another. This means that an economic revolution would not in itself be enough um, to change the superstructure on its own at, and, you know, at one blow or whatever. So the law would most likely transcend the capitalist economy. And so far, so good. You know, there's no significant variations. But for Althusser, this transcending um, happens because superstructures like the law, while they are overdetermined by the economy, they retain sufficient of their own consistency even to actually kind of recreate themselves, reproduce themselves um, under a different economic system. Which, okay, this is, this is the relative autonomy, which I don't necessarily want to discuss, but for my purposes, the important thing is that he says that under such circumstances, it's on the new society to ensure survival or otherwise of all their elements through, for example, and I quote, replicating their forms in the new superstructures. So here I think um, what he says is that it's society, the new revolutionary subject, I suppose, that determines the maintenance or otherwise of forms including, of course, the legal form in new structures. Now, this is not necessarily to say that, you know, the form of law in capitalism will be whatever the dominant class decides or that the form is there to be filled by whatever content 
will be determined by the outcome of the class struggle. And I think that's that's one of Hashukan's most important contributions to basically say that, you know, bourgeois right is what it is, and there's no kind of working around that, and it's structured to reproduce the capitalist relation of production. It means, however, that the commodity form, as it has emerged in capitalism, does kind of not arise metaphysically, but is itself the product of, of defeat of one class by another. And this poses the question, um, how far can we go in sort of isolating form from content? Because after all, bourgeois form reflects a content and that's the commodity exchange and the social relations that are connected to it. And these social relations are the product of class struggle. Uh, they basically are class struggle themselves. So to express this in, in the way that I, that I think Pulajas would, for example, I'm gonna say that in the commodity form, the class struggle is already present. Um, you cannot assume the class struggle absent from it. Now, let me st uh, let me turn to state form. I am going to make a similar argument. Um, I think, Thais, you, you, you probably touched on a couple of the themes that I'm going to raise. Um, I'm going to be making a similar argument, but through a different route. So I'm going to focus a little more on whether it makes sense to derive forms, state form, but also the legal subject, not yeah. just from the sphere of circulation, as Pashukanis does, but also um, the sphere of production and what this would mean for our understanding of the state. Now, the question of why the capitalist state has the form that it does, which is um, the question that one of the main representatives of structural Marxism, Pulazas, probably spends most of his life sort of researching, is of course a question that we do owe to Pashukanis. And the question asks mainly why the capitalist state needs to take a form wherein it's separate from society, basically separate from the bourgeoisie, but also, you know, an impersonal public machine instead of a private machine uh, in the hands of the bourgeoisie and so on. And in the 1970s, I mean, that's long after Pashukanis has died, obviously, but we have the state derivation school of which Pashukanis is considered the intellectual father. And the central contribution of this school is the state derivation theory, which, which is to say that, you know, the state form like the law is derived from commodity circulation. And the logic is the same as with commodity form uh, of, of the law. And the starting point is Marx, you know, commodities cannot exchange themselves in the market. They require subjects to sort of recognize one another uh, as free and equal owners of commodities in the sphere of circulation. And this cannot work unless um, these commodity owners willfully recognize one another as legal subjects with the power to exchange. How does the state come into that? Because, you know, we need someone to mediate, to guarantee, uh, I don't know, supervise and force whatever, this freedom and equality without which the capitalist market cannot function. Um, and so the state cannot guarantee that and cannot reproduce capitalism unless it's separate from the economic agents. And that's, that separation is obviously, you know, capitalist reproduction 101. It's fundamental to capitalism and, and, and so far is probably agreed by all. But for the state derivation school, this specific form of the state is based exclusively on the needs imposed by the circulation of commodities. Now, I'm not sure to what extent Pashukanis would agree with that and to what extent it's kind of semi it's a semi-arbitrary reading of, um, you know, by the state derivation school. But in any case, from a structuralist point of view, this reading is a little um, problematic or we could add to it anyway. And I, and I think it's worth opening this discussion. Now, a basic problem um, with this reading is the focus on circulation rather than on the total circuit of capital. Basically, how can production be absent from uh, the derivation of forms, right? And there has been a lot of criticism on that, especially in relation to the legal form, and probably it must have been mentioned yesterday. Um, and the criticism basically being, you know, where is exploitation and surplus value extraction in all of that? Um, and I argue that even if we can rebut criticisms about legal form when it comes to its focus on the sphere of circulation only, there may still be problems with, uh, with deriving the state from the sphere of circulation. Um, now, quickly and parenthetically, do I have, do I have good time? 
Yes. For a parenthesis. Okay, just because I said that. Um, why do I say we may be able to rebut criticisms in relation to legal form? Um, Dragan Milanovic um, says that in, in, in the introduction to a 2003 edition of the General Theory of Law, and I found it convincing, so I'm going to say it since I have time. Um, he says that one of the interesting things about exploitation in the sphere of production is that it doesn't, um, that it often doesn't have formal legal expression. And so he says Pashukanis is prob probably right to narrow down derivation of legal form to circulation. An example, he says, would be exclusive ownership of means of production by capitalists, which really doesn't receive formal legal expression. I mean, rights to property are open to all and, you know, whoever has property can do whatever they want with it. Um, but also, there is no legal category which says that someone who's lucky enough to own means of production should pocket profit for something that they haven't even, um, you know, produced themselves. So a lot of what happens um, in the sphere of production actually does not acquire formal legal expression. And so Pashutan is um, probably at least partly right to derive legal form from circulation. But I'm returning to my main problem, which is the state derivation from circulation. Now, Pulazas charges this theory with basically saying that he says that by deriving the state form, namely the separation of, of state from society, from the sphere of exchange, we are basically deriving it from the practice of individualized subjects slash commodity owners who reproduce the capitalist market and the state um, through the pursuit of their own individual interests in the sphere of circulation. And here's kind of where the big problem starts, because this does not only assume class absent from reproduction, but it also leaves some gaps in relation to how we understand the legal subject. So the state derives from exchange between subjects, but how has the subject been produced? Is it enough to say that the subject is constituted as free and equal in the sphere of circulation only? Um, also, the meaning of free and equal, has this not been the product of class struggle itself? And a separate but um, very fundamental question, doesn't the production process equally constitute the legal subject as free and equal? Um, we could maybe say that, you know, by the time we reach the production process, we have already sold our labor power in the sphere of circulation, and as such, the legal subject has been concluded, but I think um, the sphere of production is, is more complicated and it induces an understanding of the state that is quite different to what the derivation theory says. So I'm going to suggest that the production process works despite the fact that it's so exploitative, uh, partly because it itself co-produces the subject as free and equal. For example, there is a standard bourgeois misrepresentation that you know division of labor is a purely technical thing and not a class laden uh, and therefore unequal um, division. And according to this, it's basically a logical necessity for labor to be divided in such and such way and for individuals to be allocated to jobs in such and such way. And I'm not sure why this attribute of the production process is less conducive um, to constituting the subject than the sphere of exchange. Or why this attribute, let's call it the social conviction that division of labor is purely technical. Why this social conviction does not retain logical priority in constituting the subject over the conviction of the worker that you know he or she must honor their free contract uh, or that the exchange of money for their labor is, is an equal and free exchange. So here, the subject is also constituted as free and equal in the sphere of production, which is like the par excellence field of class struggle. So I argue that both the state and the class struggle are already present in the constitution of the subject in the sphere of production. Um, to say that the state form is derived from exchange between legal subjects, at least as, as I see it, um, involves a logical leap because the moment we have reached the circulation process, the state in its particular form as separate from society must be assumed already present. It is present in the sphere of production and it is also present in the constitution of the subject, which is not exclusive um, to the sphere of circulation, but is co-constituted in production. 
So I think it makes sense to um, study the state in relation to the complete circuit of capital and reproduction of capitalism and not to lose sight of its class dimension because otherwise it also becomes a little difficult to explain transformations of the capitalist state historically. I'm wrapping up. Form is essential to understanding law and the state, but so is class struggle. And I have tried to say that um, struggles are present in forms and are, are present in a way that can be transformative how far these transformations go in capitalism, I am not sure, but to say that there are socioeconomic configurations of any kind that are prior to the class struggle, I think involves a reductionism that is not helpful because legal form, you know, as a theory has enormous value and stripping it off the element of, 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 of class and of class struggle maybe weakens it. Um, okay, I'm gonna finish here. And I'm going to leave these as open questions rather than conclusions. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions already? We don't have that much time for questions, um, but please. Yes. Um, should I come around or do you want to go first? Thanks very much. Um, so I have a question for uh, Tice, first of all. Um, I'm just wondering, I thought it was a really interesting exploration of the public-private distinction. Um, and but what I took you to be saying is that it like um, underestimates the extent to which there is a role for the state in like creating and shaping legal norms that kind of support the economy and stimulate commodity exchange. And then I wondered then if there was a distinction there, going back to that uh, technical legal distinction, between uh, unity of purpose and, and division of interest of whether when the state takes on more of a role than that, say the social democratic state or China now, for example, is that starting to drift into the kind of thing that Pashikanis was talking about as public law, which is um, kind of kind of is a corruption of, of, of the legal form because it is imposing a purpose when the only end for the legal system is commodity circulation, according to Pashikanis. And a quick one for, um, Maria on class struggle. Uh, I think class struggle is interesting, but again, the, the the production exchange distinction I think is interesting because I think class struggle can happen in exchange. And I think that's what the, the Houthis are doing right now, right? They're like uh, blocking the circuits of capital by stopping ships going through the Red Sea. And that is also an interesting place for exchange. And I think that's why Pashikanis and thinking about um, circuits of capital in a broader sense beyond the point of production is, is interesting to think about class struggle. Thanks. Right cool. Um, so I've got a few questions. I'll try and be brief. So Fernando, I, I firstly wanted you a little bit, this is a basic banal question, but I think it's worth saying, to just to, to specify when you say post-capitalism, do you mean like communism or do you mean socialism? Let, let's put it that way. Are we talking about the transition or immediately after the transition? I partly say that because one of the things that I think is interesting and came up in what you said, and I'd love to hear more about it is in some ways, there's a tension between kind of Pashikhanis's and the Marxist general conception of the withering away with the idea that this might be a normative or a goal that you would actively try to achieve, right? Because if it's a withering away, it's like, who cares? It's going to happen. But if it's something you want to achieve, a different question comes up. And I think that's important because in the context of transitions, that can be an object of, of the class struggle within a kind of within the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? So the idea that there are contradictory tendencies in a transition, one of them will be about a juridical restoration, one of them might be about something else, and that's been the object of political struggle. Um, and then I was wondering, might a kind of argument that Patrick Harness would make about the Kant thing, it's not necessarily that he's um, collapsing ethics into Kant, but to think about ethics as a specific kind of alienated social form is something specific to capitalism, and would it be ethics in the context of a, of a different kind of society? And that kind of segue with something like Lenin at certain points is, well, there'll be no democracy under co communism because democracy is a form of state and therefore actually we won't talk about democracy. So it's a little bit on that. Ties, I, I mean, I have a lot to talk to you about really and it's difficult to address, but one thing I wanted to hear a little bit more about is actually the relationship between law and money as a particular form of universal abstraction. Because an interesting thing in at least some volumes of capital is Marx is like, well, the reason that money can operate as the kind of store of value that becomes universal is because law has to arbitrarily say this much currency is worth this value. So I was, I was wondering a little about that. Carl, very quick question, actually. And I, this, this is going to sound annoying, but I want to hear it. It's like, 
can you tell me specifically who you're thinking of as formalists and instrumentalists and like what kind of figures they're in because I'm trying to navigate exactly how I think this maps politically and I wanted to hear that and so then finally Maria and again I think this is this is a big conversation to have at a certain point I think that um what a kind of Pashikhanis or like that tradition of Marxism would push back on is that capitalist production is only specifically capitalist because of exchange. So the worker is exploited in a specifically capitalist way only because the reproduction of the worker's own material existence can be separated from what the worker produces. So in that context, the specific mode of producing surplus value under capitalism needs exchange because without it, it would just be a generic form of pumping out surplus value as all class societies do. And so the argument then would be, no, no, by talking about exchange, we're necessarily already talking about production and class struggle on that basis. So for me, I would push back against that, um, the, that, that distinction in that way as the specifically capitalist mode of the extraction of surplus value. Thank you very thought provoking presentations tomorrow as well. Uh, my question is to Fernando. Um, it's regarding the um, technical uh, rules. Um, as you mentioned, Pashukanis approached them as quite state centric. Isn't that a strong indication that uh, Pashukanis consider the technical rules as uh, a social regulation of socialism rather than communism? And another broader comment or question to everyone is. I think we focus a lot on the state or on the um, uh, sphere of the state. And of course, we live in a globalized world now when the commodity production and circulation is going on uh, the whole global sphere. And the question is, uh, can we transcend law uh, only in one state? I mean, this is a very broad question, I know, but it seems that we have a panel for international law later, but I think this is a question that needs to be answered uh, together. Like, the domestic and international are quite abstract divisions. And if we want to go to the concrete, as Fernando mentioned, we need to interrogate the way only one state can move to socialism and thus uh, transcend uh, the form of law and move to another social regulation. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the panel now. Who would like to start? Would you like to start? Yeah, I can start. I, uh... I have to use this thing, eh? yeah. okay. <laughs> um, to to Rob and Andy, basically, um, this, I I guess the answer is kind of um, uh, affected by the brain damage that happens to someone when they have read too much structural Marxism and not much outside of it. But the the way in which um, I understand it is that the relation of production presupposes the existence of, of specific uh, juridical relations in the in the superstructure, and also that you know um, um, maybe that the secondary contradictions in the superstructure are essential to the existence of the of the primary contradiction in the relation of production. But so. So far, I think we are on the same page, but um, you know the idea of overdetermination, which basically is reciprocal action. This means that while, in my head at least, <laughs> uh, while the secondary contradiction overdetermines the relation of production, at at the same time the relation of production has already determined the secondary contradiction, and this is how it kind of plays out in my head. And obviously, I, I, I don't know if I'm expressing it uh, very effectively or, you know, um, yeah. Uh, now on, on, on the question whether we can transcend law only in one state, uh, I, I don't think so, but I, I would like uh, someone else to answer this for me. I think it's too difficult a question to deal with. So I'm gonna pass this on to... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Rob, for the question. <clears throat> I mean, it, uh, in the article, I'm trying to uh, identify the required conceptual requirements for 
formalism and instrumentalism and so on. But of course, the uh, the basic question is who is the formalist and who is the instrumentalist? And uh, as I said, I, I think this logic of the formalism in instrumentalism spectrum can be seen in various debates. I mean, the, the debate that I have mo has most cl uh, closely at hand is is the debate about the Haitian Revolution and and democracy. And you know this debate as well. <clears throat> so. Uh, in the 90s, uh, you had a, an interpretation of the Haitian Revolution saying that it, uh, it, it represented the abolition of slavery uh, by Haitian revolutionaries represented a realization of unfulfilled promises found in the French Revolution and in, in the Enlightenment. Uh, and this interpretation got a, a, really a great traction. So you, uh, if you're familiar with the Haitian Revolution, you had uh, like... Um, uh, Laurent Dubois, you had uh, uh, Robin Blackburn, a Marxist, saying exactly the same thing, uh, Lynn Hunt, uh, and all of them, I think, can be related to a much broader genealogy of formalist arguments about rights and modernity and rights and social inequality. So I think they are fully dependent on Claude Lefort's uh, theorization of the indeterminateness of, of rights. Uh, and the tendency of, of rights to expand. Uh, uh, and I think they came to uh, most directly to this notion uh, via Etienne Balibar. I do think that Claude Lefort, the genealogy goes back to Jean Jaurès, the socialist, French socialist, uh, uh, which in turn was inspired by Alexis de Tocqueville. And Alexis de Tocqueville was, of course, extremely skeptical of this internal logic of rights to expand. Uh, and to see it as a realization of, of, of uh, he, but he theorized it. Uh, on the other hand, in the uh, reception of the Haitian Revolution, you have instrumentalists, and they are they can be social historians, uh, saying that well, the Haitian Revolution, uh, we find evidence in the archive, slaves were violent, they were authoritarian, uh, they never articulated an argument about fulfilling the French the promises of the French Revolution, but you also have in the same field, philosophical instrumentalist arguments, building on Foucault, uh, power throughout history, uh, uh, a, uh, a reduction of very diff uh, a, a reduction of form to content. Uh, you have uh, Agam uh, you can see Georgia Agamben's work in in this field as well, and of course Nietzschean arguments uh, about rights, etc. So uh, they are they are instrumentalists. <laughs> uh, Yes, one last thing. Of course, an argument can be fully informed by formalism and instrumentalism. More interestingly, I think, is whether an argument is vulnerable in front of either critique, instrumentalist critique, or, or formalist critique. And I think to, 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 to get the, the negative point of departure right is crucial as we theorize the legal form, because otherwise the proposals will be vulnerable in front of instrumentalist objections or formalist objections. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, one uh, thing I could raise. Uh, I'd, really interesting talk, uh, Maria. Uh, I do think, I, I mean, Polanzas also have a double polemical uh, point of departure, but he his point of departure is a critique of subjectivism and, ob and objectivism. Uh, he, al he also has this uh, critique of Vyshinsky versus Pashukhanis uh, earlier in his work. And I, I do think that the concept of relative autonomy is directly dependent on the way in which he theorizes subjectivism and objectivism. Uh, and then we can have a debate about uh, yeah, what's more plausible or how they can be combined. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Marcel. Um, so I will start with your question. I think you're correct. Um, uh, when Pashukanis explains technical rules, it's a state-centered explanation, and therefore um, it could be interpreted as a transitional form proper to socialism rather than to communism. Um, and if that is the case, then he did not envisage an alternative for a communist society, which may not be the problem if we take Lenin's uh, insight of uh, that's not a problem because there will not be any form of government. I am skeptical of that explanation because um, I think uh, in the 21st century, like after the 20th century, we need to give concrete answers when defending communism because otherwise people would just fill the gap in with the 20th century experience, which is, I think, not a desirable thing. 
um, about Rob's question uh, in why am I why am I using the term post capitalist? It's just to avoid saying communism <laughs> in adverse contexts. I should have known that this was not an adverse context, uh, <laughs> but it's the force of the habit, you know. Um, behind that joke, there is one concrete point. Um, when you say that there is a tension, uh, because the concept of the wheeling away uh, suggests a spontaneous development, right? Like a mere corollary of the economic transformation. But um, I would say that is not, at least in my understanding, that cannot be the explanation because um, legality is not a mere epiphenomenon. It is a concrete social form. And uh, legality tends to self-reproduction in the same way as bureaucracy tends to self-reproduction. So social forms for a transitional process must be thought having uh, the objective of destroying the legal form as an explicit thing. And um, that is what I think uh, explains why I find attractive the idea of communal forms, because it's like a, a, a mixture of political form and normative form, uh, which I think uh, tends to avoid that problem of self-reproduction. It has other problems, of course, but um, I tried to address some of them in my presentation. And about Kant and ethics, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with your uh, explanation of because, um, well, first, because Pashukanis explicitly says that Kant is the highest form of ethics, and therefore transcending it would require destroying ethics as a form altogether. Um, I understand that his criticism is more directed to the idea of this reified concept of ethic as a distinct form that Kant puts Kant puts forward, um, and I would say that um, I like the discussions uh, on on alienation inspired by Marx, like the discussions by Lukacs, for instance, who uh, wrote his last big book, The Ontology of Social Being, as an attempt to substantiate a Marxist ethics. And I do believe that uh, now I will say it: a communist society would be. Uh, would require a strong ethical basis. And without that ethical basis, I think it would not work. So uh, other than having the destruction of the legal form as an explicit objective of a process of social transformation, um, the construction of a new ethical, ethically informed society, I think goes hand in hand with the destruction of the legal form. OK, so first I will start with your question about the, the role of technical norms. Um, first of all, I think that the technical uh, uh, rules uh, should be comprehended in, in two dimensions. Uh, first, in the dimension in which they appear as a, a proposition to uh, the transition to socialism and, and so on. But I think that the technical rule must be comprehended inside a fully developed capitalism as well, because they, they uh, are very present in the fields in which the, the the state extend its regulations to norms that don't are even based on uh, opposition of interests between subjects and um, this is very interesting because the 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 comprehension of uh, private and public law being uh, like um, um, remodeled in another type of systematic um, dialectical presentation, we can demonstrate how uh, the legal form can autonomize itself face of uh, um, evidently and immediately um, exchange relations. So uh, when we analyze Marx's capital, for example, Marx demonstrated how things that are not even products of labor can be exchanged as if they were commodities. For example, um, use values com uh, that comes from nature and even the difference between labor and labor power itself has this, this kind of, of uh, logic, you know? So uh, labor power is not a product of labor, but is exchanged as if uh, they were commodities. That's why um, we can have uh, prices that are not even grounded in value, for example, and in, in the same way, we can have legal norms whose content are not even 
immediately grounded in uh, a position of, of interest. So we can uh, analyze how a technical rule can be determined by the, the legal form, even if in its content we don't find uh, this immediate, immediately um, opposition of, of interests. So, um, and, and this sort of inversion and mystification is a dimension of fetishism, right? So when we move to how um, cap capitalist relations appears immediately to ordinary consciousness, it, it, it seems that the, the law of value is not valid. Is not empirically valid, so that's how that's what Marx demonstrates in his uh, in, in his capital. So I uh, you answer uh, Rob's question now. Actually, I I got a hint about this relation between money and the legal norm by an article wrote by uh, Blank Jurgens and Kastendik. Um, they are from the state debate, uh, the re the revision debate. Um, they uh, demonstrate how the action of the state, the state, he needs to to present itself as an impersonal power. So it need it needs to present itself as an impersonal person. So that's why there is no separation between political state and juridical state. The political st state needs to appear as a, a, a juridical state at the same time. So it cannot act. Uh, on civil society directly, but uh, in its uh, forms of mediation, one of the uh, one of them is money, and the other is the the legal norm through which it can present itself as a as a legal person. And even though Marx uh, don't uh, introduce the state when he presents the category of money, he cannot go forward without uh, um, saying how uh, money can be uh, this sort of real abstraction that can, can only be posited um, by the state. Okay, so that's it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, uh, if we can take our seats and we can begin the uh, second panel. Um, okay, so welcome to the uh, second panel of day two on Pashakanis and international law. Um, I'll introduce each speaker before they speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. I'll assume 20 minutes and I'll give you like a five minute um a uh, reminder before the end and we'll go in the appear that they uh, the order that they appear on the program so we'll have rob uh yonit and then uh, andrew andy okay so um firstly uh rob um i obviously introduced him yesterday at the plenary so this will be a slightly more truncated introduction rob is a senior lecturer at the university of uh, liverpool prior to uh, and, and completed his phd thesis at the lse He's a member of the editorial boards of Historical Materialism and the London Review of International Law, and he's written a number of texts charting the place of Marxist tradition within legal theory and international legal theory and mapped out the role of Marxism within other theoretical traditions. And many of us have cited uh, Rob's work throughout the uh, two days, which I think is testament to Rob's progenitor status and his kind of revival of uh, Marxism and Pashakarnis uh, that we've seen in the last couple of years. So over to you, Rob. You still do it for the for the sake of like uh, proper behavior. All right, thanks, Hansel. Um, hi everyone, it's me again. I'm sure you'll be sick of me if you're not already by the end of this. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is the crime of eco side and the way in which the crime of eco side has become increasingly invoked politically by certain people, and offer what I think are a set of reflections through Pashikarnis discussing some of the stuff that I discussed um, yesterday 
to think about some of the deeper problems of the invocation of ecocide as a crime and the problems of doing that in terms of thinking about defending or kind of combating like crimes against the environment crimes. So although I guess it's a little bit kind of taken back now because of the, the significance of the situation in Gaza, I think it's fair to say that if we look around at some of the more recent appeals that people have made to international law, this crime of ecocide has been really a very significant one. We see kind of activist groups, we see people on the left, we see governments, and we see a, a whole host of actors appealing to the idea that particularly significantly destructive forms of environmental harm could be best combated through the creation at the International Criminal Court of a crime of ecocide. And quite famously, or whatever, like um, this kind of Stop Ecocide Foundation has gone together and coined a legal definition of ecocide. And the idea is, is that insofar as that legal definition can be coined, it will be possible to hold corporate and other actors to account for their particularly destructive actions of, of, of against like the, the environment. And obviously that will then act as some kind of deterrent. So I came to this in part as part of a project with Ignacio over there and um, Dave, who isn't with us right now. And we're kind of working on a series of kind of interventions on ecocide and the kind of possible limitations and, and potentials of that. And so one thing that's very obvious to say is that we can use the kind of Pashikhanist arguments and the arguments from the legal form to flag up a number of problems with a tactic of pursuing ecocide as a way of dealing with, with environmental destruction. In particular, right, one of the motivating and core factors that I think people have for turning to a legal definition and a criminal definition is they see it as a shortcut away from political struggle. The idea is, is that if you have a kind of legal account of something, if you can criminalize something, you can short circuit and avoid the kind of messy, complicated political discussions and quite quickly move to kind of enact social transformation. And of course, what Pashikhanis, as well as the wider kind of critical legal studies community tells us is that account is based on a flawed idea about the relationship between law and politics. And in fact, as Pashikhanis would put it, we can say it this way, law will always be a specific form of politics in this kind of way. And that legal form, tied as it is structurally to capitalism, will ultimately limit the scope of action and the kind of actions that can be taken. So we're going to take that a little bit for granted in the context of this discussion and this conversation. But obviously, that is a large part that we might use to criticize the formulation of a crime of, of ecocide. And that applies more broadly to various attempts to harness the power of international criminal law specifically in order to achieve social change or to kind of prevent social actions. But beyond that, a very significant criticism that has arisen, right, is in the choice of the International Criminal Court as the forum through which this kind of crime of ecocide could be articulated and, um, and pursued. And of course, one criticism that we very frequently see from people in that respect is the ICC is, without wanting to be too polemic about it, kind of a racist court, which has significantly really primarily focused on racialized non-Europeans and then occasionally has in recent years in the context of Ukraine, gone after the kind of like Russian high command in relation to that war. So the sense would be on this basis, right? Look, if we're thinking about kind of combating ecological destruction, the racialized nature of the International Criminal Court is gonna be a problem and an obstruction. And usually when people are talking about this, right? What they will point to is the kind of structural and financial dependence of the International Criminal Court specifically on kind of European powers in terms of its donor base, the necessity of keeping them sweet in various ways, and the sense of avoiding getting involved in controversial political situations. And of course, there is something to that, and that's a significant issue. But beyond that, in terms of thinking about race and racism in the context of the ICC, I want to argue that on the basis of thinking about the legal form, we can say there's something a little bit deeper going on here. And that depth is important on its own terms, but also to help explain why it is that the International Criminal Court and the wider architecture of international criminal law can be particularly problematic. And I want to talk about that specifically in the context of environmental destruction and the role that law, the legal form, 
and dot discourses of racialization and racism have played in the kind of legal expansion of questions of environmental issues, right? So I think it's important to begin, and I think this is the thing we ought to always bear in mind when we're talking about law, with trying to, to some degree, disaggregate what we can call a social phenomenon of ecocide from a kind of juridical definition of it, and think about how those two things interrelate. Because very frequently, people will appeal to ecocide as this kind of just general social phenomenon, referring to the systematic destruction of the planet, particularly by capitalist social relations and the expansion of capitalism and industrial capitalism in particular. That is a kind of freestanding sense of the destruct destructive capabilities of contemporary society outside of then a juridical attempt to capture and kind of codify that. Now, actually, in many respects, that's kind of weird because the term ecocide is primarily, at least initially, a legal one. But it's also clearly true that when people speak about ecocide, they're not always automatically referring to that legal definition. So why is that important? Well, it's important, right? Because what we know if we think about ecocide in this broader social sense, that actually we have to ask questions about capitalism, accumulation, and imperialism when we're thinking about ecocide. To put it very bluntly, right? The history of capitalism has been a history of the transformation of nature into inputs into processes of production, the commodification of nature, and the expansive transformation of the world, which has frequently involved forms of ecological destruction. Given capitalism's kind of insatiable drive to accumulate and to profit, and given the kind of uneven and unequal way in which that happens, the nature of the capitalist mode of production is at best, at best, to be indifferent to nature, but actually very frequently it will be destructive to nature because the drive will be to accumulate and transform. So the question then is when we're thinking about this and we're thinking about the role that capitalist social relations play in this systemic destruction and degradation of nature, what do we do with law and how does that come in again? And obviously we can immediately think, right, of what, what we might say in the context of thinking about Pachacanis, which is that we know that law as a social form is a mystified form of capitalist social relations. And in so far as capitalist social relations are responsible for those forms of environmental destruction and ecological destruction, law is absolutely in there. And we can see this on a very basic level by looking at the history of like capitalist accumulation and expansion and how that has related back to nature, right? So what we know is the process through which the commodification of nature occurs and the process through which nature is made cheap to be inputted into capitalist production processes is mediated through law and the legal form. Insofar as nature is made into capitalist property, that is necessarily about the extension of capitalist social relations through juridical processes. But more deeply than that, right, we know that the kind of undergirding set of expansion in terms of imperialism and colonialism were articulated in very specifically legal terms. And those legal terms, through the language of civilization, through the language of terra nullius, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, enabled and articulated forms of social transformation via the means of law, which ultimately become in this sense, ecocidal. So a point of immediate departure that we need to think about is that the very processes through which nature has been rendered this kind of object that has been placed into this eco ecocidal set of relations is mediated through law and the legal form. Now, building again on what I said last night, oh so long ago, I have also argued at various points, and I won't necessarily go through this in, in too much detail in terms of the theoretical detail, but this is also necessarily a racialized process. Because insofar as we understand the ways in which this capitalist expansion and transformation occurred, it was also continually done through the language of racialization. Very frequently, as we know, the manner through which kind of nature could be appropriated involved dispossessing people of their land who were not engaged in the kind of industrial and production processes that capitalists wanted. And the crucial point was in order to allow kind of natural resources to enter into circuits of production, it was first necessary in various ways to dispossess peoples of that land. And that was frequently done, again, as we know, through the language of racialization. In part, that was through positing that certain peoples were incapable of holding property 
and therefore could be dispossessed, or that they had taken some action that was aggressive or breached the law in various ways, which meant that a response was possible. So, again, building on what we said previously, this is also a moment in which law and racism come together very specifically. It's through a set of juridical doctrines and transformations through which themselves mediated forms of racism through which people in the non-European world could be dispossessed of the land that they on which they dwelled. And that land and those resources could then become part and parcel of the systemic relations and processes of, of capitalist social relations, right? So we have on this basis, this kind of connection already between these juridical relations, environmental dispossession, and forms of racialization. Now, a really important thing to pick up on, and this is the way in which we can then think about this in terms of contemporary terms, is that this wasn't simply a kind of accidental connection. Very frequently, the one of the arguments which is used to dispossess racialized people is itself a kind of cod pseudo-environmentalist or ecological argument, which essentially says, part of the racial inferiority of pre-capitalist peoples is that they are incapable of properly stewarding their natural resources. So it wasn't simply that the ecolog ecological thing here was an accidental kind of consequence. Instead, often the argument went, part of the way in which racialization occurred was to, to posit certain peoples as being unable to properly manage the environment and capitalist social transformation and the expansion of the European world being understood as a way of properly ordering nature and therefore more effectively stewarding and guarding nature. So what we get in this context through that particular historical abstraction of the law is a racializing language of dispossession, which posited itself through that racializing language as itself upholding and defending an idea of a rationally ordered environment and therefore, um, you know, a kind of a, a, an environmental stewardship. So actually, if we think, for instance, in the context of um, of Palestine, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that, is it, you know that documentary, The Law in These Parts, where they relied on an older kind of set of legal claims which said uncultivated and wasted land could become like, could become like repossessed. And that's one of the arguments from the Ottoman legal discourse that the Israeli state relied upon to kind of justify its land expansion, land grabs, et cetera. So what we have actually then in the, the historical structure of thinking about law and, and its relationship to ecology and racism is a structure built quite deeply into the law through which forms of racialized dispossession were justified in terms of defending the environment, right? So that's kind of point and moment one. And we're gonna come back to what that might mean significantly. Now, the second point to make when we're thinking about kind of um, international um, crimes is the second strand of history, which is the kind of strand of history of international, like the laws of war, essentially being enmeshed very deeply in the kind of language of the rationalization of imperial war, uh, of imperial war and how that is connected to issues of race and racialization. So very frequently, people tend to think of the kind of humanitarian law, laws of war, as being humanitarian impositions on kind of otherwise out of control imperial expansion. But actually, when we look to the, the history of how this goes, there are two key features. The first is that very frequently, what those like, what those kind of criminal sanctions and rules were understood as was made modes of rationalizing and making more efficient the use of military force. The protection here was not just undergirded by a kind of humanitarian impulse, but very specifically a language of military efficiency, military necessity, etc, etc, etc. This was not a straightforwardly protective language. And very often that nature of kind of efficiency was ultimately articulated in racialized terms. If we take, for instance, kind of things around proportionality and the prohibition of certain kind of weapons, and I've mentioned this yesterday, I think, we have a very strange situation where weapons which will otherwise be fairly undestructive, like the use of unmanned rockets, will be automatically understood as breaching international humanitarian law in some sense, but the use of more sophisticated weaponry with higher killing potentials instead becomes, because of its kind of more sophisticated nature, captured in languages of, oh, well, military efficiency, military necessity, could you have killed less people? And in this sense, right, that again embeds a kind of racialized imperial calculus about the way in which efficient warfare can be undergone. Yeah. So 
taking those two strands together, right, helps us think a little bit and looking specifically at the kind of definition about how contemporary language about the crime of ecocide may reproduce that racialized logic. May, I think, does. The first thing, very obviously, is the degree to which this, on in its basic structure, ends up repeating a very common pattern, which is that inter juridical interventions, primarily happening in the non-European world, are legitimized and justified through a language of like, ecological transformation. Now, if you actually then go to look at the specific definition of the crime of ecocide, we can very much see how this plays out. Now, the first thing to know, and this is really important, again, as people will be pretty much aware, is that the crime of ecocide is not itself conter concerned with the kind of quotidian or normal or like everyday forms of structural violence or structural ecological destruction created by capitalist social relations. For instance, it would not cover climate change. Instead, it envisages these kind of particularly exceptional acts, wanton, I mean, I'll, I'll get up the definition now, I should have done that before, but essentially it's talking about like what they call wanton acts, which kind of cause severe and long-term damage to the environment. Now, that sounds nice and sounds good, but it's important to say that what it doesn't capture is the everyday normal actions of capitalists, like capitalists engaging in capitalist social practices. In other words, largely the kind of normal actions of European capital are entirely backgrounded and held backwards. Instead, what's focused on is the specific kind of exceptional actions. But those specific exceptional actions are also undergirded by, and this is very important, a specific claim about the necessity of having knowledge that these actions will occur. Now, it's not you don't have to know that it's going to be bad, but you have to have actual knowledge of the possibility of this happening. Now, what that suggests very immediately is that if you are one of these corporate actors, what you will do is design structures in such a way as to insulate yourself from having that knowledge. And in that context, very frequently, the people that will be captured through this offense will be kind of people in local subsidiaries engaged in these kind of exceptional practices, which, again, given the nature of the IC and its history, are likely to be racialized local capital, agents of local capital who can then be held into account, right? The second point is the degree to which in the proportionality test of this uh, wonderful crime, you have to compare the ecological harm to economic and social benefit. So alongside this sense in which it's about exceptional things that happen outside of the European world, you have to also evaluate that according to the specific logic of capital and its efficiency. Now, taking these two things together, along with the broader kind of definition, what we can see is beyond the simple kind of selectivity of the ICC, we have a kind of taking in and reproduction through the modes of intervention and interaction of that similar deep racialized logic in the crime of ecocide, which both specifies and kind of like spectacularizes those forms of violence, locates them very often outside of the European core and subjects them again to the same kind of economic rationality of something like civilization. So on that basis, right, it's not simply then that this is going to be a kind of politically limited thing, but rather in many respects, because of the kind of articulation of capital's racializing logic and commodifying logic, it will ultimately reproduce that same set of social practices at a different level in a different form. That's bad. I'm done. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, we have uh, Yonit uh, Percival. Am I saying? Yonit. Yeah, Yonit Percival. Yonit is a scholar at SOAS who specializes in the interface between law, society, and corporations within the framework of the global political economy with a focus on the People's Republic of China. Previously, she practiced as a solicitor in the city of London and Shanghai, specializing in international investment and trade law with an emphasis on Chinese corporations in relation to their overseas activities. She's an arbitrator on the panel of the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, 
and uh, in fact completed her PhD research in international investment protection law here at Queen Mary University of London. And her title, her paper rather, is titled uh, titled "Bits of Harmony: China's Paradigm in Times of International Investment Agreements." Over to you. you. Thank you, Tanzil. Um, in a way, um, having listened to the morning session, this is almost like a case study of what was discussed um, in the morning. And I'm going to speak in um, three main parts. So in the first part, I will introduce foreign investment protection as a legal regime that is structured around a number of exceptions to principles of customary international law. Uh, this exceptionalism of international investment protection is important because through it, uh, through this exception, the um, property owner's domination in the capitalist social relations is revealed. In the interface between the objective legal norms and subjective power structure of which Pashukani speaks, this iteration of the legal form sheds off the guise of symmetry and the purported equality of free exchanges. In so doing, it unmasks the unequal dispensation of privileges and obligations behind uh, juridical thoughts about equality, objectivity, public private distinction, and so forth. The other effect is the incursion of the private into the public through the privatization of the state. In the second part, I will examine the Chinese paradigm of a harmonious world. Um, this is a, a, a China's vision of lasting peace and common prosperity. Uh, and vision of the world order, specifically in its global, globalized iteration. In the third part, I will look at potential for inconsistencies between the country's vision and its participation in the protection of foreign investment. Why does it matter? Uh, because um, by now, uh, uh, the PRC has become, sorry, the PRC has become um, a leading international player that is actively working towards the implementation of what promised to be historical changes in the world order. Uh, yet China is an active participant in an investment protection regime, which gives legal form to imperialist unequal economic exchanges. And I'll just say briefly, because we don't have time, that China's um, China sort of has three generation of bilateral, bilateral investment treaties. And you can see within these three a progression from what used to be a progression towards sort of the, the Western or the global North, or I call it the, uh, uh, the um, global minorities, uh, program of investment pro projection. And uh, I'll afterwards I'll add to you know to, to qualify this a bit. So at least on the face of it, this points towards assimilation. And this is underpinned by China's emphasis of its commitment to the rule of law domestically and international law exter externally. Now this development is relatively new, which highlights special Kani's understanding of legal form as specific to as, as particular to specific social relationship uh, social relation because historically in Confucian's political phil philosophy philosophy morality and ethical incursions uh, and sorry uh, ethical instruction are primary whilst legal disputes are the last resort prevalence of legal dis of the legal dispute is an indication of ethical and societal societal degeneration that during china's revolutionary period law existed but it did not rule 
um, it was structurally, it was, it formed part of, it was inter integral to the to party and the state structures. And in terms of contact, it was subjugated to policy. So the concept, we see the, the, the arrival of the concept of the rule of law um, it, uh, with the opening up of the country uh, to foreign investment. Now, just two short comments. First of all, um, this is a perspective of an outsider. Um, and so it has to be taken in this context. I mean, I do think that outsider perspectives have a value um, in and of themselves, uh, additional to, to complement um, those of, of the insiders. The second one is that it is not my aim to criticize. I have a lot of time for China. I know it's not very, um, it's not very um, fashionable, but I do have, and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from its achievement and the way it manages its affairs. Um, but so my aim is not to criticize, but to provoke a discussion and through it to better understand and engage with the country, given it is its importance. Okay. Um, the contemporary regime of international foreign investment. So, what it is is when we is is a is a is a web, is a network of international investment agreements that we talk about as IIAs. They comprise regional and bilateral investment agreements. Bilateral investment agreements are known as BITs, bilateral investment treaties. Um, the claim that they constitute juridified global governance is underpinned by how spread, widespread they are. There are now 2,828 signed BITs and 451 treaties with investment provisions, of which 2,219 and 371 respectively are in force. Through this network, capitalist globalization acquires institutional permanence, stability, certainty, and uniformity, the rule of law. It guarantees that the arteries through which capital flows, by which I mean multinational enterprises, circulate um, at, without getting obstructed. Capital more or less knows what to expect when it crosses state borders. More, moreover, it can access pecuniary remedies when its expect, expectations are frustrated. So who are the protagonists? So the protagonists are three. We have two states. Uh, the states are the parties to the treaty. Each either imports um, and host investment. We call it the host state. Uh, and the other uh, exports investment, we call it the home state, which I have issues with this term, but in any event. But the point to make is rarely you get a, uh, a, an investment agreement in which one party, one state is both, uh, is both an, uh, 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 a home and a host state. This is important in terms of power structures, as we shall see. The second protagonist is an indeterminate uh, group of future foreign investors, and primarily it is multinational enterprises. Uh, the emphasis on indeterminate and future. Uh, so, so this protagonist, the m &E, is not a signatory to the treaty, but it's silent beneficiary. States set the scene, of emanies to come center stage as claimants when a sovereign act allegedly injures the, their private property abstracted as investment. So here we have important exception to international law created through the mechanism of a treaty. First, emanies acquire the standing to claim against a state. This is an exception to the foundational international principle of equal sovereignty. This pr principle dictates that only states can claim, can sue states. Um, the mechanism of dispute resolution is, is international investment arbitration, 
known as an investor state dispute settlement or ISDS. The foreign property owner's ability to exit the state jurisdiction and claim at the international level, invoking inter alia international law, notwithstanding what is the governing law of the contract, is, a, is again exceptional. It is a departure from the very important rule of exhaustion of local remedies, which was the importance of which was highlighted by the ICJ in the ELSI case. The way the arbitral mechanism is formed is also exceptional. Uh, it has to do with the way consent is given. We won't go into it, we don't have the space, but that's another exception. And in some, the state and MNEs are obstructed as legal subjects facing each other as if they are equal parties to a private transaction. So what is bilateral investment treaty? It is a treaty entered between two states. Each state promises to treat investors from the other state in accordance with prescribed standards of treatment. The question we ask is what is the exchange? What is the bargain? What are the com commodities that are being exchanged? And that the, what we get is state sovereignty exchange for the possibility of investment. Not, it's not in exchange for investment. It's in exchange for the possibility of investment by some future corporations, investors. And so the equivalent to be negotiated between is between self-imposed restrictions on the host state sovereignty and potential investment from the home state. Um, in other words, we're looking at restriction for a maybe investment. And indeed, there is very little uh, empirical support for the proposition that you know states ought to add, enter into by, into investment treaties in order to get investment. It doesn't follow. Um, so here we say, I uh, get the, the question: Who gets to be exceptional? The property owner, in her exchanges with the state, gets to be exceptional. Um, and at the crucial moment of dispute the moment at which the legal form crystallizes, the state is not an enforcing authority, but a privatized respondent. Okay, let us see some, some of, of the features which this uh, gives rights to. So the first one is equality and reciprocity. Um, so first of all, the the, 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 if you like, the narrative around international investment protection law is the need to equalize the power differentials between the private in investors and the state. Um, in other words, the investor is conceptualized as legal subject that is vulnerable to the overwhelming legal power of the state. Um, and its ability, its uh, ability to legislate and to change uh, the legal scene. And so the, the, if you like, the foreign investment it, investor become exceptionally dominant in the name of equality. So you have inequality created for the purpose of equality. So, um, Second, second, the investment is yet to materialize on the issue of equality. The investment is, is yet to materialize, if at all, so that the value being negotiated is unknown if there is a value, if it brings value to the host state. And on this, reduced sovereignty curbs the state's ability to change course and harness foreign investment to ensure that it correlates and adds value to changing national needs, not to speak of the fact that um, the effect of this treaty is to liberalize the repatriation of surplus value. All of them have a provision for free transfer. So uh, you can take the money back home. 
Uh, second, notwithstanding the language of reciprocity, in most treaties, all the obligations are borne exclusively by the whole state. Overall, this remains the case despite re recent changes to the pattern of foreign investment flows and reformative attempts. In this regard, IIAs are rem re rem reminiscent of the unequal treaties of colonial times. Third, Domestic investors do not enjoy the exceptional privilege of being able to exit the state jurisdiction to have their dispute adjudicated at the inter international level. This is the reserve of foreign invest investment. Oh no. <laughs> is it negotiable? Um, yeah, yeah, keep keep. keep. Okay, so <laughs> um, fourth, um, so added to this, so so force that th this is important that only, I mean, if you talk about the legal form, conceptualize inequality, in ISDS only the claim only the, the investors can bring a claim. The state is a perennial respondent, and it's very rare for it to even to bring a counterclaim. Um, so, and added to this is the, the hierarchical and imperialist nature of capitalist interstate system. Um, all too often, host state, particularly uh, Global South, indebted ones who, or with a World Bank or IMF gun to their heads, are compelled to sign a BIT and or agree to home state model BIT. Okay, so, and then additional features, we have the university uniformity, whereby concrete a characteristic um, of uh, abstracted and flattened uh, to create a uniform system because a uniform system, uniformity serves the needs of capital, which legally we talk about predictability, uh, certainty and so forth. Um, uh, then we have the blurring of the public private. Uh, the public private is fused and state are abstracted as a private juridical person. Then you have the sovereignty and intervention and I would argue that the investment protection legal regime is a form of intervention. Um, on the face of it, it seems to split uh, political from economic sovereignty, uh, making economic sovereignty more manageable or more amenable to intervention. First of all, this is really a solution to decolonialization. And second is also the fact is that the economic and the political one reverberates within the other. And uh, disputes are the pinnacle of protection. You know, it is the mother of all protection is the ability to claim against the state. And populations are the elephant that is not in the room because you hardly ever see mention of population in a treaty. They're absent, not only they're absent, the regulatory chill which the threat of a claim imposes on on the um, imposes on the state because we are talking about vast 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 amount of money we're talking about millions and billions in claims um really deprives population from policies which may be which may be um for their benefit and in accordance with the state responsibility for the welfare of its population Okay, harmonious world. So uh, China's vision of a harmonious world was first launched in 2005 by the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao leadership. It became a central plank of China's projection of its worldview. He summarized it in eight characters, meaning lasting peace and common prosperity. There are three premises that we can tease out. One is, Countries and people share common values. They are the common right, the collective right to common prosperity, the right to subsistence from which all other rights derive, and a shared desire for peace. 
So peace is both a prerequisite for and the outcome of common prosperity. The other theme is the coexistence of uh, differences. Within the framework of share, shared values, diversification and national permutation will continue to operate also as a matter of right. This is the right of the people of each state to freely choose their social system and their path of development without external intervention. Um, the third one, the world order is permanently in, pro in process. So the change is inevitable. Uh, nations are mutually transformative and contingencies accommodated through flexibility, flexibly, fle flexibility within which progressive adjustment can take place. In some, we have a multiple world that is collaborative, diverse, fluid, and adjustable. Uh, globalization that is differently managed um, and departs. So while China supports opening up, supports international investment, supports international trade, supports interdependency, it, it takes issue with the way globalization is managed and the inequality in access to resources and to the wealth that it cre is created worldwide and to institutions as well. Um, do I have time? No, but you can take a few more minutes. Not really, it's very important. It's almost like almost, I almost have time. Okay, okay, I'll go quickly. I'll just say harmonious, I do need only a few minutes. Uh, um, so the, the, you, can, the, you know the China idea of unity without uniformity um, derives from what uh, has been described as harmonious dialect, dialectics. And briefly, uh, briefly, it, it has three again, three, three constituents, and one is harmony, the he. Um, the premise is that any two opposites, opposites in a process are fundamentally non-conflicting contradictions can be solved through complementary interaction before a new synthesis is born. So it, um, the second one is situational disposition. This is the shu. Um, and that is the premise uh, that any, sorry, that it referred to disposition that it's almost, it moves between the static and the dynamic. Um, and thus the only proposition that does not change is that everything else is subject to change. There is ongoing spontaneous transformation that is independent of external intervention, yet calls for corresponding action. This is important because it also articulates China's current view of the transition to socialism. Um, and the third one is becoming actors as an institution transform and are transformed as part of their interactive identity formation and in line with situational disposition. So now are we looking at the same bed, people at the same bed in different dreams? Uh, so here's quickly the comparison, the inconsistency on equality and reciprocity, equalized prosperity uh, is inconsistent with global global minority, uh, which is my term for, it's not mine, it's a borrowed term for the global North, prosperity, uh, so, so for, uh, you know, and value extraction. Sovereignty and intervention equal and true sovereignty v the intervention and reduced sovereignty of, of, of international investment agreement. You, on university, uh, uniformity, we see here a call for diversity, peaceful coexistence of differences between the pool to, uniform, uh, to uniformity in, in the um, in investment protection, um, cons uh, conciliatory resolution of contradiction, as opposed to the centrality of disputes and populations. Uh, I'll just say briefly, that if you, you look at the language used in the context uh, is really the language of people. It's people of the country. So populations and their welfare and the common prosperity is sort of at the for forefront 
of the paradigm. Thank you and sorry to take him too long. <clears throat> Thank you, Yunits. Uh, finally, we have Andrew Woodhouse. Uh, Andrew is a lecturer at the University of Liverpool and director of the law at Liverpool Public Law Unit. He's currently researching EU climate law using Marxist and critical approaches to law with a particular focus on political economy. Andy has held visiting positions at the University of Antwerp, uh, was a grocious research scholar at the University of Michigan, and was a visiting fellow at the Amsterdam Centre for European Law and Governance at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and this paper is titled Pashukanis in Luxembourg, Integration Through Law in the European Union. Over to you. It's got a new title. It isn't called that any longer, <laughs> but he'll, he's going to tell us. I'm still talking about the European Union, so that's a good start. Okay, um, thanks everyone. Thanks to all the organisers, everyone who's made this happen. It's been a, it's been a really good uh, discussion. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the European Union, EU climate law, and um, how the European Union transitioned from social democracy to neoliberalism, and the extent to which this is um, reflected in its in its environmental policy. So, um, a bit of context. Firstly, um, this is a paper I'm writing for a special issue on law constituting the economy. Um, it's a kind of law and political economy-ish crowd, something that hasn't been mentioned today, but I think we should probably be aware of as Pashikanites uh, or just Marxists generally, as this is kind of the dominant approach to um, leftists who want to use the law to address social inequality in some way or another. And I think it's important um, to use Pashikanis as a corrective against some of these ideas, because they do tend to believe that we can just, you know, grasp hold of legal institutions and institute social change um, in a kind of instrumental way. And I, I, I don't think that's right. And, and uh, this paper uh, is, is part of an attempt to, to correct that. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things today. First, I'm going to look at some uh, EU environmental documents, first from the 1970s and then the 1980s, and track this shift to neoliberalism. Second, I'm going to talk about the role of the EU more generally in that shift from the social democratic to the neoliberal state. And in the third part of the talk, I'm going to try and link this to Pashikarnas' commodity form theory and think about the legal form and the state and its interactions in, in different regimes of, of capital accumulation. So firstly, then, um, to begin with, the early EU environmental policy begins in the 1970s, and it generally has this kind of social democratic bent, which um, sees the environment as a, as a social objective to be protected. Uh, and you'll find some quite some language that you might not expect from, from what we know of the European Union these days as a, as a very market focused organization. Uh, the early environmental uh, policies talk about the harmful effects of growth on the environment, the increase in production and consumption leading to, to damage to our natural resources and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, we tend to get the, the sense then uh, in this early environmental policy that the EU needs to step in and protect the environment from too much economic action. Or economic expansion is not an end in itself. We need to protect the environment from the economy in some way as part of ensuring the living standards of uh, people. Um, so in these early policies then we see a role for economic planning uh, to manage the economy, to ensure that these social objectives are met, to tame the natural forces of, of the market, uh, and to sp put the spontaneous forces of growth at the service of social objectives. Uh, there is some talk of economic competition in these documents as well, but it tends to be uh, when pursuing the environmental policy, we do need to bear in mind uh, economic competition internally, so ensuring it doesn't damage cross-border trade by creating new barriers. And externally, uh, the conditions of international competition need to be borne in mind. So overall then, in this 1970s documentation of, of the EU, um, there is this idea of, of uh, the state playing an important role in, in protecting social objectives. It's worth bearing in mind as well uh, that in the 1970s, the EU is much weaker. We're talking much more about the, the EU kind of coordinating nation state action uh, in, in this era to protect social objectives. We have a scepticism of economic growth and we have this idea that we need to be aware of the conditions of competition uh, and, and manage them. So there's a, there's a huge shift that then takes place in the 1980s with this move to, to neoliberalism. Um, instead of protecting the environment from economic growth, we have this idea 
uh, in the 1980s that environmental policy needs to contribute to economic growth. Uh, and mainly this is conceived of as environmental policy can help to boost the competitiveness of Europe, European industry uh, in, in a number of different ways. And by boosting competitiveness, we'll be boosting our economic growth. Uh, so this happens, this is conceptualized in terms of resource rationalization. So if we use environmental policy to make sure we're using, you know, every, every last scrap of material, uh, we'll be super efficient, we'll be more competitive on the global market. Uh, we have this idea that, you know, we'll create high quality, sustainable goods, and this will be our niche on the global market um, in Europe. And also that um, we will be more innovative and we can have these, we'll have the first mover advantage when creating this, this important new green technology. Um, so competition becomes kind of infused with environmental policy. Environmental policy is to contribute to the competitiveness of the EU. And central to this shift then is this move towards uh, market-based measures. Instead of the EU intervening in the economy um, to protect the environment from the economy, uh, everything is to be protected through the economy. We have market-based measures to uh, sensitize producers and consumers, to ensure we have the internalization of environmental costs. How do we deal with environmental problems? We put a price on environmental harms and we ensure that those prices are paid through the market. The market will fix it. Um, we need to get the prices right uh, to ensure environmentally friendly goods are at a market disadvantage. And instead of protecting society, instead of improving living standards, uh, what we need to do is make sure our individuals, our citizens are informed consumers so that you can make the free market operate in an environmentally rational way. So we see a huge shift in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, instead of protecting the environment from economic growth, the environment is contributing to economic growth. Uh, instead of bearing in mind competitive uh, competition when we're creating environmental policy, we have the environmental policy contributing to competitiveness. And instead of ensuring the social objective of the environment uh, for the living standards of our citizens, we have our citizens need to help us uh, as consumers to ensure that environmental products are competitive. And uh, this is my, uh, my favorite quote, which is worth its own slide. This is from a 1993 document, uh, which just shows the extent to which the EU has become captured by economic rationality. So just as sound business enterprise endeavors to maintain and increase, increase its capital value in investing facilities, so also planet Earth requires certain types of investments in order to maintain itself as a healthy ecosystem. If we don't make these investments, ultimately whole regions and ultimately civilization itself could go out of business. So the earth itself is conceptualized as like a, a multinational company. Um, the only game in town is economic rationality. This is a perfect encapsulation of, of where the EU lands by the mid 1990s. So how do we understand this then? How do we understand the shift in environmental policy? Well, it's best to understand it as um, the changing nature of the state in relation to uh, a different regime of capital accumulation. So the social democratic state broadly conceived uh, and fairly consistently across Europe at this time was a state which stabilized capitalism in response to a very strong labor movement through guaranteeing certain social objectives. And uh, as the 1970s and 1980s emerges, we have this shift in what the state is towards simply a, a guarantor of market relations in, in a globally competitive system. So there's a number of features of social democracy um, that we can, we can think about. There tends to be corporate structures which incorporate a role for labor in decision-making. Um, there's a key role for economic planning to intervene in the market to ensure social objectives. There tends to be a strong welfare state, which I think again, ensures that certain social objectives are met. And uh, importantly, um, all of this relies on kind of super profits which are being extracted from the global south at the time. So yes, the living standards of Europeans are, are being raised at the time, but we can't think of this as a, as a globalizable uh, economic system. It, it wasn't sustainable in that way. Um, and uh, to, to think about this in terms of a, a bargain between capital and labor, I think is, is very important. And the role that economic growth played here in the early social democracy era um, was as, as a principle of consensus between capital and labor. So we have a growth in the economy, which allows for capitalist profits, but also that 
uh, labor will be in a strong enough position that it can demand certain uh, living standards to be um, to be extracted as, uh, at the same time as well. So this was always an unstable compromise between capital and labor, emerging from, from a very specific uh, conjuncture after World War II. And it was challenged in a number of ways. It was challenged from the left uh, in, in, the, in the late 60s with the, the 1968 protests. But uh, more than anything, I think really challenged by the, the underlying contradictions of capitalism, in particular, the change in uh, global relations, uh, growing national independence movements in, in the global south, of course, uh, this leads us to the 1970s crises, which kind of bring to bear um, the kind of power of the global south, notably through the, through the oil crisis. Um, and this shatters the class compromise. And as kind of profit rates begin to fall and the uh, labor doesn't get the share of profits that it once was able to do, we then have this move to dismantle the, to the social democratic state to, to crush organized labor. Um, and to move away from, from corporate structures and, and to, to shift the idea of what the state is. The state is no longer a guarantor of social objectives like uh, protecting a good environment for everyone. Uh, instead, it's a guarantor of market relations. And there's an absolutely essential role for the European Union in this process as well. The European Union of the 1970s is, is not particularly powerful. The capital labor compromise that I've discussed is really organized on the national level of the, of the Western Euro European states that, that are in the European Union at the time. And so in the 1980s and 1990s, we begin to see that the real growth of the European Union, uh, deepening the internal market, deepening economic and, and monetary union, uh, with an overall effect of creating market protecting structures that dismantle uh, electoral and popular control over the economy. Uh, so the EU is playing an essential role in this shift from a social democratic to a neoliberal uh, state. So overall then to summarize part two, um, the environmental policy referred to, uh, the shift that takes place from social democ democracy to neoliberal state, sees a state going from a stabilizing force mediating conflict between capital and labor and guaranteeing certain social uh, standards to a neoliberal state, which is merely a guarantor of market relations and uh, essentially says, you know, the role for us as a state is to make our state competitive on the global market and is to equip you all as individuals to, to fight it out on the market as best as you possibly can. So a, a real shift there, which is exemplified in the earlier environmental policy documents I referred to. Now to the difficult bit, I'm going to try and apply this through uh, Pashikarnas' theory of, of law. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the stuff. I realize this is probably a mistake, but I'm, the slides are the slides now. So I'm going to skip over some of the basics of, of Pashikarnian law in the hope that they've kind of been covered elsewhere today. And just try and think about the, the relationship of the social democratic state and the neoliberal state to the legal form and thinking about um, how Pashikarnis might have imagined this. Because one of the things we mentioned yesterday is that Pashikarnis is writing uh, in what he imagines to be, he hopes to be, the, the end of law, right? Um, he hopes that the, the Soviet Union is, is the first of, of the global revolution um, and doesn't anticipate that law will develop, that states will develop new ways to stabilize capitalism. And so I think it's uh, incumbent on us then to, to apply, um, as many others have done, uh, his theory of law to social democracy and then to then to neoliberalism. So Pashikarnas' view of the state has been mentioned many times uh, today uh, as, as deriving from the legal form, as stabilizing the exchange relation. Uh, the state authority introdu introduces clarity and stability into the structure of law, but does not create the premises for it. They're rooted in the material relations of production. But importantly, and uh, kind of as I've discussed in the presentation so far, Political power can regulate um, the material race relations of production in, in, in very diverse manners. There can be many different forms of state, all of which we could call capitalist, but they can uh, uh, regulate in, in, in very diverse manners. So one thing, um, going back to Tice's presentation earlier, uh, which said some of these things in a much more sophisticated way, um, Pashikarnis sees private law as the core of the law. The legal relation is at the center and private law is at its core a clash of different legal claims, my right against your right and, and, and counterclaims. 
And Pashikani sees public law, the law of the state, directly as, as, as a mere reflection of private law, uh, of private law. In the general theory of law and Marxism, he describes the constitutional state as, as a mirage, uh, one which suits the bourgeoisie uh, very well. And so I was reflecting on this and uh, how to link this to the shift from a social democratic to uh, a neoliberal state. Uh, and importantly then, again, another key distinction from Pashkanis, which has also been raised already today, is a distinction between technical and legal regulation. So legal regulation stems from our division into private interests. We're all individualized, egoistic um, legal subjects, and we uh, must, by, by, by nature of living in a commodity society, uh, engage with each other as such. And by contrast, uh, post-legal regulation, communist regulation, will be closer to a technical form of regulation, which has a unity of purpose. And what I'm trying to do in this paper, then, is link this idea of, of unity of purpose to the fact that the social democratic state aimed to, to discipline the economy, to discipline capital, to create certain, certain social objectives, and therefore was less legal than the neoliberal state. Thanks. Uh, so public law is, is closer to technical regulation. Um, Pashikanis describes um, some of the things that, that government, governments might do as nothing whatsoever to do with the legal form. If you have unconditional subjection, un unconditional subjection to an external norm-setting authority, then that is not the legal form, according to Pashikanis. But that is what we might understand governments to be doing sometimes, right? To, to, to simply um, be forcing subjection to an external norm-setting authority. So let's think about that in the context then of, of neoliberalism. So neoliberalism, right, we think of has been conceptualized in the literature as a more juridical form of, of government. And I think there's an overlap here, one which has been noted by uh, Rob in the past, uh, between Pashikanis' view of law and a kind of neoliberal view of law, Hayekian view of law. Uh, for Pashikanis, the only end in itself for the legal system is commodity circulation. There are no purposes to commodity circulation. Why? Because under commodity circulation, we're all divided into private interests, right? We all pursue our private interests on the market by exchanging commodities. That's where the purpose comes from. And that's the, that's the only purpose that can exist for a legal system in its logically pure form. So law has no social purpose. And this also lines up with Hayek's desired, like what, what Pashikanis um, describes Hayek desires, right? Um, Hayek says the state should not set goals for economic production. All the state should do is uh, create market relations and let people, let individuals pursue their values within that. So I think there's something to be said here about the, the neoliberal state. Uh, its lack of goals, its, its desire simply to stabilize capitalism and guarantee market relations as closer to a, to a purer um, legal form as conceptualized by Pashikanis. And by contrast, then, social democracy did set purposes for the economy, set purposes for economic production in a way that we can't say neoliberalism quite does in the same way. Um, and this is obviously linked to the fact that uh, the different conjuncture of social democracy was it, with strong labor movements, uh, able to force certain social objectives to be achieved by the state. And we can note there that as, as many in the literature have done, that social democracy does have greater power for representative and corporate institutions, and neoliberalism tends towards more non-majoritarian, juridical, uh, and legal institutions. Um, so there's, there's, there's some overlap here, kind of fitting all the pieces together as, as, as I speak, to be honest. All right, so in conclusion then, um, in the first part of the paper, I showed that there is this clear shift in the EU documentation from the EU protecting the environment um, from the economy to protecting the environment through the economy. And the best way to understand this is a shifting role of the state based on different regimes of capital accumulation. Um, social democracy governs with, uh, well, sorry, um, with, yeah, less, less recourse to capital accumulation. So we need to understand this based on the difference between social democracy and neoliberalism. So trying to integrate Pashkanis into this argument, social democracy governs with, with less recourse to the the legal form, and I think this can be linked to Pashkanis' distinction between technical and legal regulation, and the fact that legal regulation is uh, has is lacking purpose by its very nature. Uh, and also, in this, we can see 
three and two should have been swapped around, so I'm going to skip three. Please, please forgive me. Uh, to link this as well to the, to the present day, so I, 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 for the purposes of kind of um, circumscribing the paper, I kind of stick to the 70s and 80s, but obviously in the conclusion, I'll, I'll try and reflect a little bit on uh, where this points us going forward. The EU of today is is barely better than that quote that I, uh, I, I quoted from 1993 earlier, um, about imagining the, the planet as, as a business. Uh, the, the primary way that the EU is conceptualizing we will solve the um, climate crisis is through an emissions trading system, which seeks to put a price on uh, carbon primarily to uh, force the true cost to be paid and therefore to decarbonize through the market. Um, so it's still deeply, deeply wedded to to the commodity form, a long, long way, even from social democracy, uh, with with all its faults. Um, so it, it it doesn't give us hope then, if if as 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 we ought to believe, not least based on on the things that uh, Rob was saying, um, we need this move away from the legal form uh, as our only hope to contend with with the uh, capital. I've got the last word wrong. It's, this is the environment, not the economy. Capital is destroying the environment, and our only hope of uh, stopping it from doing so is, is to move away from the legal form. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so we'll try. We'll have at least one round of questions. Um, who would like to go? Okay, so we've got a few over here. So, Gritia, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. It's very good to have some papers um, specifically focusing on, uh, in a, zooming in on the economy and using fresh canvas there. Um, as, um, I had a question for Rob. Um, as you, of course, know, I re wrote a book about uh, specifically the um, why we, why um, I spent uh, with a past kind of analysis of why um, international criminal law is not a suitable tool for corporate um, crimes against the environment and also against um, you know uh, um, those crimes that we um, are involved in um, poverty and inequality around the world and so on and so forth. So I wondered if you uh, could uh, maybe elaborate a little bit on what the specificity is of um, of this particular um, project, uh, this particular piece of work, and, and where maybe it differs or builds on, or um, perhaps per, perhaps in the um, because what my work sometimes been um, criticized on is on the um, on a sort of perhaps an in, imperfect uh, Pashkana analysis of criminal law, which I can talk about. But that I wondered if perhaps you had a different analysis or. What, in other words, is is I know that obviously your um, focus and increased um, emphasis on on the racialization aspect is 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 definitely a thing that um, is very welcome. But I just wondered if there's anything else. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Unit. First of all, thank you very much for this fascinating presentation. To be honest, I was quite disappointed yesterday because nobody talked about China. We, we did have a China meal well yesterday, but nobody talked about China. I'm from China. And uh, I just want, want to add one thing about the International Investment Treaty, because as far as I know, most of the foreign investment in China were conducted by state-owned corporations, which means these decisions are made in people's name and benefit people. And it is kind of formed to fulfill China's concept of a global community of shared future for all humankind. And this is a concept from Marxism, according to Chinese government, that's one thing. And the second thing is about sovereignty, because I noticed you said that uh, host countries exchange sovereignty for the opportunities of investment in international investment treaties. I fully agree with you, directly speaking, but I feel like sovereignty has two sides from the positive side, sovereignty could be the concept for decolonization in late in the last centuries. But from the bad side, sovereignty is also a new creature of international law, a membership to join the international society, and could also be 
uh, criticized as a creature of capitalism and the liberalism. So I wonder if it is applicable to use sovereignty to, to do like a Marxist research, especially considering China claim themselves as a sovereignty, sorry, as a uh, socialist country. Yeah, I just come up with an idea like, would you say the USSR um, intervened sovereignty because they also did millions of financial support and military support for countries in Latin America and Africa for their decolonization movement, right? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks uh, to all three speakers. Uh, my question is for Andy. And uh, you mentioned the LPE and uh, I think methodologically, that law constitutes the economy stands quite opposite to what we're discussing here since yesterday. Uh, so Pasukanis' approach to law and the legal form. And I think my main concern, I mean, to pose this in the form of the question, is there a danger from your presentation and you know from your argument of idealizing social democracy? Um, because, I mean, you mentioned that uh, social democracy perhaps signifies a move away from the pure legal form. I'm not sure I'm convinced because the unity of purpose that you discuss is not an actual unity of purpose. I mean, the purposes that are set by social democracy are purposes that uh, uh, reflect uh, a specific, let's say, uh, historical conjuncture and uh, a specific historical situation uh, that gave rise to this uh, form of, of state and legal regulation. Uh, and the new challenges to the process of capital accumulation, the new needs uh, of capital gave rise to a different form. I'm not sure that the former, the social democratic form and the welfare state model uh, posed any limits to the legal form, at least as described by uh, Pashukanis. I'm going to take one more question uh, over here. Um, and then if we've got round, uh, time for another round. Oh, so... No, no, no. You, you, okay. okay, so my question is addressed to, to Andrew because, well, the, it, uh, he is a um, researcher uh, in a certain way, converses with my own. So it's very interesting when you put the, how the relation uh, between the state regulation and uh, nature changes when we think about social democracy to neoliberalism and and the uh, um, 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 can I say Latin America, for instance, we didn't have uh, social democracy and neoliberalism transition uh, because we didn't even had a, a social democracy. So it's interesting how uh, nature was incorporated um, in capitalist uh, expansion, like a sort of uh, primitive accumulation or originary accumulation uh, process. And in um, and all of these uh, discussions about sustainability and ESG, you know, and is is almost like the type of uh, rationality that we encounter with the necessary reproduction of the labor power, because nature and labor power it's the the only two things that are not produced by capitalist relations but are necessary to value valorization, and there and that are capable of um, renovating, you know, appearing another day with, um, you know, a capacity to, to produce more, more value. But I want to talk about the private-public uh, relation and my questions about that. So one of the critiques addressed by Tony Negri to Pashukanis in rereading Pashukanis um, is that uh, his theory was privatistic and was not capable of explaining how public law um, developed through state regulation in order uh, and, and now most of the legal regulations we have nowadays um, pertains to the realm of public law. And I always like to see this kind of word that is uh, the reflection. So public law is a reflection ref reflection of private law because uh, we don't have like a dialectical 
simply opposition, but a, a contradiction. One cannot exist without the other, but we, we still maintain like a certain type of essence logic relations where you have a sort of a underlying essence and that is private law. And the question is empirically, I cannot establish a bridge between par private and public law. And you are working with a concrete dimension, right? And I want to know what do you have to say about it? And did you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I do agree with you the sovereignty uh, is very much um, associated with uh, colonial times. And the sovereignty was gifted to colonized territories uh, in exchange for being civilized. Being civilized, being civilized on European terms, and particularly the rule of law. Um, and I'm, when we talk about it, we really talk about state sovereignty. I just wanted to make the point that sovereignty can be also people's sovereignty. Uh, but we're talking about state sovereignty and in the capitalist, if you like, system, uh, the sovereignty of people is, the, is can only be transported through uh, state sovereignty. Now, I also agree with you, and I, I myself struggle with this. What is, uh, how does this um, um, deification of sovereignty as sort of, you know, what you really want to achieve, and you see it now, and Palestinians are, ki are dying for it. How does it uh, sit with intervention? Because intervention, as you say, can be a positive thing. So that really the issue, I mean, I don't know the answer is something that I'm struggling with, but it seems to me the issue is not one of processes, but one of substantive content. I, you know, it's not about not intervening or non-intervening, -interve but for me is what kind of intervention intervention for what or what purpose so i mean i would very much like to see intervention in israel's sovereignty you know i think that will be a good thing other forms of intervention you know and you have for regime change all that i think you know it's a bad thing so i think it has to do with distinguishing between processes and norms and um which is something that actually, you know, from the Chinese perspective, I'm not clear how it is actually reconciled. Well, China intervenes in its own way, you know, like silently. <laughs> it's nobody knowing. Um, thanks, Peter. I mean, and I'll probably just mm -hmm. take a stab at other people's questions as well. So I, I think basically I would just endorse a lot of your argument and indeed so what, what I said right at the beginning which is that there are a series of arguments which I think militate against a particular sense of juridification or criminalization as a way of, of dealing with social problems and I mean I partly take them as read and partly have you know 20 minutes to have a conversation but within that context I do think that in some ways so I guess I'll make an intellectual point but I'll also make I'll first make a kind of like academic production point which is that like we could just be like, hey, it's all shit. But then unfortunately, I won't be able to write anything. Um, and so there's a sense in which, like, actually, although we very often will know the broad kind of points about, like, structurally why this isn't going to work, it's also incumbent upon us just to be able to write stuff, to be able to outline that. But it's also, I think, politically important to be able to do that. Firstly, to talk to different audiences of different peoples and in different kind of inflections. And secondly, because actually, so from my perspective, like thinking about the role of, of racialization in that context is important and isn't something that someone that people have explored so much, but also because actually when you listen to the discussion about racism and racialization in relation to ICL, it's often quite a kind of contingent like thing, which is a kind of like 
relatively vulgar thing. And I think it is, and it is therefore worth pointing out, look, on this level too, there are these structural reasons because it helps you to build a kind of better political and um, and theoretical intervention. So I, I think it, in part, it's simply about thinking about the different dimensions and facets of how these things come out. But of course, like the stuff that you say, I just agree with. I mean, I also am, whatever, a little, I mean, I, I, I think your account of criminalization is where, where I would be at. I think sometimes people get a little bit whatever about that. I wanted to quickly partly just respond to what you said to me, just because I think, I think a thing that is that is worth saying in the spirit of being a, a bit critical of Pachikanis and where I would back you up is that I, I actually just think that Pachikanis' description of technical regulation is largely bullshit and you just don't need it. I mean, the man chooses the example of a train timetable and you're like, let me tell you, some trains have done some pretty bad things to people. And like, actually, that is not necessarily a point in which there, are, there is unity of interest. So I actually, I kind of reject that position politically but what i think is the case and where we can get something from it in that respect right it's important to say that patrick Connors doesn't say law appears where there's a conflict of interest he says when it's private interest so he's talking about those differences as being articulated in a specific form which makes them irreconcilable in a very particular kind of way and i think that's crucial because i don't think you have to say oh it's either conflict of interests and therefore law or no conflict of interest and therefore regulation. It's, it's the conflict of private interests with interests articulated in a very specific way in a kind of exclusionary way versus a conflict of interest could be regulated differently. So there's an, in, you know, one of the interesting like Soviet experiments and Cuban experiments are like people's courts or comrades courts where it would be like, okay, there's a conflict of interest over this land, but if this land is not private property, then there are ways that you can intervene that will resolve the conflict of interest because you don't have to say this land belongs to this person or that person. But that still could be a conflict of interest and it still can be politically conflictual. So I'm a little bit on that front, like, but that's also where I can agree with you because that can then become itself a political technique of class power, right? Because, you know, in the context of the, the Soviet transition, it was like, well, no, there was class struggle here. So actually this technical regulation would also have been a form of political contestation. You know what I mean? So I think I think that we can actually firstly not have to have that language in relation to Pashkanis. I just don't think it's necessary for him. But you can still use that particular framing to understand different modalities of regulation, providing you don't go too far and doing a kind of weird fake harmony point. And I just also quickly wanted to say, I think the thing about sovereignty, by the way, I think there are two things which are important just to back up with. One thing is we should also remember that sovereignty is also a mode of legitimating intervention. I always say like, okay, well, the reason for the 1991 invasion of Iraq was because they were protecting Kuwaiti sovereignty. The so sovereignty can also be a mode of legitimating forms of imperial intervention. It's not a, it's not a mono-dominant concept. It has like lots of different dimensions to it, depending on it. But I think what we can say, and I think this is just very much in the context of Pajkanis, is like this is the contradictory thing about like becoming a rights bearer in some kind of way. Like it's always contradictory. It's inclusion and inclusion is important, but it's inclusion in what and on what terms and on what basis. And in that sense, you can just, you have to think of it, I think is transitional and incomplete in the same way as, you know what, you know what's better than being, you know what's worse than being a wage slave, being an actual slave, but you can still be like, just getting juridical rights doesn't, isn't the end of it and will legitimate other forms of, of exploitation in that kind of way. So I'm always like, that's the complication you have to think through with, with sovereignty. And the problem is just, I think in the contemporary world order, in the absence of a sustained challenge to global capitalism, sovereignty is reified and fetishized as this kind of absolute thing, as the thing that you would use in an anti-imperialist context, as opposed to destroying global capitalism, <laughs> of which sovereignty is itself a contradictory product. Uh, and thanks for the questions. Um... Yeah, so I'll start with Tice. Um, I, I like that um, point you made about the kind of state regulation of nature and this comparison of um, the kind of minimum subsistence needed for the labor to reproduce in the same way with nature. I think that's, that could be quite a fruitful comparison. Um, so I think, and then I'll get to uh, Dimitri's question with this. I think, see, I've not read this uh, Negri critique, but I, I think this idea, it seems to be, this idea that um, 
it's uh, Pashkanis is too privatist and that um, the legal realm of public law is, is now the main form of regulation. I, I think I'm, I'm without realizing it, trying, trying to rescue that distinction between public and private law by saying that that's still private law regulation. And then maybe there's, there's something here about, um, I, I don't know if this is sustainable, but I will pursue it as a theoretical project, I guess. Um, cause there's something there about going up against the, the kind of basics of, of commodity circulation, uh, which, which I'm claiming differs in these different regimes of, of capital accumulation, which brings me on to Dimitri. Um, I'm not idealizing social democracy. You don't have to worry about that. It's okay. Um, I don't like it, but, uh, I, I do think we shouldn't collapse the two things The the, um, the labor movement in, in the social democratic era was much stronger. Uh, there was much more social provision in, in, in Western Europe at this time. And that wasn't like a gift of capital that it was doing for fun. It was forced, right? It was class struggle that forced these social objectives and it wasn't sufficient and it wasn't revolutionary, but it was something and it was pushing against to some extent um, the demands of, of, uh, of capital accumulation. And I think this is interesting to, to, to again, come back to, to Tice and that question of, um, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm wrong to be trying to use the public-private distinction to do this, but I think I'm, I'm trying to find a link there between when it comes to the crisis of, of the 1970s, and this is something me and Rob have discussed in the past, and the, the moment arrives when there is this crisis of capitalism and there is a social democratic state and there is it, it can go either way, it can go towards neoliberalism, but there are some people who are saying, well, now that there are these profitability crises, we need to go further uh, in 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 the direction of collectivization beyond capitalist planning towards socialism and then communism. I think that there is something there about, um, we, I, I think we might be able to use Pashikanis and his distinction between public and, public and private there um, because his conception of public law then becomes uh, anti-capitalist almost like in, in a way or at least anti-legal form. And uh, if that's what we're looking to do, like push against the logic of commodity circulation beyond the legal form, beyond commodity exchange, then I don't know, I wonder if we could use Pashikanis in this way. Maybe not. I don't know. I'd like to try. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to end uh, uh, things up and give a round of applause to our panel. Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with the final panel. Um, if I can ask you to please take your seats. Uh, my name's Sarah Keenan. Um, I'm not a Pashakanis scholar, but um, I do share with you all an interest in the relationship between law and materiality, um, and perhaps more generally, the role of law as a mediator between the symbolic and the real. Um, and I've enjoyed being here with you over these past two days, and I'm very happy to be chairing this final panel on um, thinking gender and legal form. So today we have um, three speakers and uh, I'll just uh, introduce them briefly now. Um, so Susanna Gertschman is a PhD student at uh, the law school at City University, where she's one of the directors of the Center for Law and Social Change. Um, Ruth Fletcher, you met yesterday, um, but just briefly, Ruth is a, a reader here in medical law at Queen Mary. Um, she's done a lot of academic and activist work around reproductive justice and most recently completed a Leverhulme Fellowship examining the role of time in the governance of pregnant people. Um, and finally, Leila Ulrich is an Associate Professor of Criminology at Oxford, uh, where she researches various aspects of international criminal justice, including how global cr criminal justice institutions create gendered and racialized subjects. Um, so I'll hand over to um, Susanna first. Um, do you want to come up here? Or you can sit down? Okay. Yeah. Oh yes, there is. That's right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Okay. So thank you, Sarah, for the presentation, and thank you uh, to the organizing organizers, uh, Tanzo, Eva, Rob, and Fernando for making this event happen. Uh, I'm very honored to present my research today, and I will present one chapter of my PhD dissertation. Um, it is a work in progress, uh, and I appreciate any feedback you can give me, uh, and in which I start with Pashukanis to understand legal subjectivity. Uh, before that, I will give you a brief outline of my research topic, and then I will follow with more details of this chapter. 
So uh, in this slide, you can see Julie, who is a woman I created as an anecdote to explain my research topic. And you also have a series of examples in which she faces different prices than men for the same products and services. And Julie is not alone, as research has confirmed that gender pricing, uh, that women face extra prices when shopping for the same products and services as men in the UK, the US, Germany, France, uh, United Arab Emirates, France, Canada, uh, Brazil, India, among others. And so in my research, I explored the gender constitution of the legal subject as a consumer, focusing on the relationship between law, gender, and capital, and the role of law or the limits of law in liberation. And to address the entanglement between, uh, between law and capital in the construction, imposition, and maintenance of gender identities, I take gender pricing as my case study. But why did I choose this topic? Um, less explored than other financial hurdles women face, such as the gender wage gap and uh, unpaid housework, gender pricing is the practice of charging consumers differently for the same products and services based on gender. And the higher prices are more frequent in the products and services market for women, in which, in which case gender pricing is also known as pink tax. And when, until now, what we see in legal scholarship is the analysis of the pink tax under a doctrinal and liberal scope that qualifies it uh, as sex discrimination, claiming, claiming regulation as an efficient way to abolish these practices. And I wonder whether anti-discrimination regulation was the answer leading us to our emancipation. In my perspective, mainstream scholarship overlooks the structural causes of gender oppression and women's experiences in capitalist societies. And for its nuances, gender pricing works as an analytical tool to delineate the different aspects of gender subjectivity, including the construction of the gender self, the economic burdens, and the struggle for emancipation. So when I turn to gender pricing, I am interested in mapping the sites of intersection between law, gender, and capital, and how they are interlocked in a system that not only gives rights, but also constructs subjective subjectivities. Sorry. And instead of presenting legal reform as a solution, I shift the logic used so far and take this case study to understand what, what role law plays in our deliberation or what its intrinsic limitations. And uh, one last detail, this is a legal theory project, is not a th uh, an empirical one. Therefore, my research doesn't have a comparative analysis of jurisdictions and gender pricing as a goal. The aim is to construct a theoretical framework to perform a critique providing the basis to address the central points until now overlooked by mainstream scholarship. So to address these points, I organized my, my thesis into six chapters, each one with a question to be answered. Uh, as you can see there, I won't go into every one of them with this respect of the time, but this is just to situate the chapter I want to discuss with you, which is the second one about legal gender subjectivity. Uh, and now that I have given you an overview of my research, I'd like to deepen some aspects of my second chapter in which I pose uh, the following question. Is a gender identity something that is reflecting law or does law have an active role in the creation and imposition of it? Uh, and as I said, I decided to present this chapter because my analysis starts with Pashukani's theory, which is essential to delineate how the interrelationship between law and capitalism uh, shapes legal subjects with different rights and possibilities. And in this chapter, uh, I am to elucidate how gender is not a natural feature, but rather a characteristic that was built according to imperialism and the capitalist mode of production. And I seek to comprehend how norms and appearance and appearance roles in gender identities are rather unavoidable as aspects of recognition, protection, <laughs> and state, uh, state organization. So, and then I take this framework presented here uh, to analyze my case study. So I start with the analysis of legal subjects' uh, historical origins and how the social legal structures that sustain different legal subjectivities were built and what maintains them upright until today. And in the first part of the chapter, uh, I examine the theoretical construction of the legal subject first as an universal bearer of rights, as we see in Pashukoni's work, situating the origins of law as historically coincident with the emergence of capitalism, demonstrating their interdependence. And here I draw from the commodity form theory of law to understand the legal subject as an abstract and universal bearer of rights and a commodity guard. 
However, uh, as uh, Rob uh, has shown us, um, capitalism is not only an exchange society, but also one that is grounded on the exploitation of labor power. And in capitalism expansion, expansion, race played a central role, enabling these states to enforce racial hierarchy, stratifying the natives and creating a mass of laborers to be exploited. And the link between race and the production of legal, legal subjectivity can be perceived in the analysis of private property. But besides commodity exchange and race, the study of the emergence of the legal form was considered the patriarchy. And here I analyze gender drawing from Marxist feminism, uh, particularly social reproduction theory and also uh, the colonial scholarship. These two theoret these theoretical frames are essential. Uh, firstly, Marxist feminism and uh, social reproduction theory because the scholarship uh, focuses focus on the silences in Marxist theory to show that the people who produce the commodities are themselves produced outside of the ambit of the formal economy. And Ruth's work here was uh, incredibly valuable uh, to my analysis, as she demonstrates how Pashukani's uh, focus on the legal form of exchange relations neglected other uh, social rela relations, including the, those involving women. Uh, yet, Pashukani's analysis uh, can be a resource for feminist theory as she shows us, uh, beyond analyzing women's subjectivity according to their absence of ownership, uh, Ruth show, shows us that the reproductive rights and respons responsibilities uh, and how the legal forms task is to come up with a mechanism to facilitate social reproduction. However, this facilitation, uh, this access to social reproduction was not destined to everyone. Uh, some women were denied um, motherhood and consequently a gender status as orphan spillers and others have demonstrated. Uh, and to analyze gender and its relevance to the imperial and capitalist project, I draw from feminist, uh, decolonial feminists. In that sense, Maria Lugones shows us that the colonial methodology had gender as one classificatory aspect in that the native peoples were non-humans. Uh, they were classified according to their sex as male or female. And this was used to decide who was outside, outside the boundaries of traditional gender symbols and should be considered a different social subject. And these categories were created to justify domination and were not traceable in nature. Something was needed to le legitimize them and law was part of that answer. So part of the capitalist structure, uh, law gives social relations a specific form, um, which is historically determinant. And in that sense, I explore law's ideological function and its individualized character. So here, uh, we, putting it briefly, uh, the same regime that shaped the legal subjects, giving them rights, was used to exclude the other by deprivation practices. And in that sense, law helped to construct the idea of sex and gender. Here I work with, uh, with examples of how law regulated gender in decolonization, particularly from the Yoruba society, as well as legal aspects of families, marriage, motherhood, reproduction, rape, and property. And for that, as Cheryl's, Cheryl Harris argued, law carries the dominant expression of rights and power, giving the idea that the consequence of social selection, the consequences of social se selection are inevitable. Legal subjectivity and different categories relate to power deploying in law to include, exclude, and determine who will be considered human, subhuman, or non-human. And gender works in, as an organizing principle, shaping bodies and lives, families and social relations, rights and exclusions. And one, one way people can fit these categories and be recognized as a gender subject is through appearance, which is the focus of the part two. So here I analyze the empirical and material aspects of these subjectivities and how they are constructed and how they affect people's lives. And in glancing at gender materialization, I built from Monique Wittig's theory. Uh, for Wittig, the category of gender sex is not antecedent to society. It was created to justify dominance. It was civilization, not nature, that created the feminine creature. Consequently, in the case of women, once they are seen as women, they, they are women, but first, they are women, I'm sorry, uh, but first they had to be made that way. And as the proper bourgeois women, the fragile angel in the house was the result of a combination of powers involving class, race, gender, 
age and citizenship, among others, the natural woman is nothing but a natural. And to look like a natural woman and thus be recognized one as one will require some labor. And depending on how well executed this labor is, it will impact the distribution of rights, protection, or exclusion, shaping one's recognition as a legal subject. Therefore, appearance is more than self-expression, but a reflection of the enforcement of specific norms and their connection with rights, opportunities, and outcomes. And to demonstrate that, I look at trans people's experiences and trans Marxist scholarship. Um, in the sense that passing or blending uh, means that the closer a trans person meets society's expectations of how a man or a woman should look and behave, the higher the probability of this person uh, finding a, a job or and the lower the chances of being harassed. And accordingly, uh, Giles compares the act of transition to the labor that continues gives birth uh, to gender and delivers livable gendered lives, even under unbearable circumstances. It requires shopping, medication, and hours before deliver to achieve an accepted and coherent gender appearance. And as coherent gender identity is necessary to survive in so capitalist societies, and as this, as I just said, there is no natural meaning of being a woman, all women to a higher or lesser degree need to labor to be a woman, be seen as a woman, and thus be recognized as such. And in the labor of becoming a woman, some tools in the form of almost, of almost unavoidable products and services are offered in the market. And these products and services are affected by the pink tax and include toys, clothes, personal and health products, hairstyles, and laundry for children and adults. And concerning uh, gender subjectivities, pink tax products and services are divided following the gender binary. And although gender, gender neutral options are a trend, uh, as I showed you at the beginning, gender pricing remains, remains a relevant problem, not yet solved, even in places with specific regulations. So through the framework presented here, it was possible to analyze gender pricing products and services as playing re relevant roles, reinforcing the constructed gender patterns and the coherence to cis heteronormativity. In toys, and toys, uh, in toys and clothes, this division impacts children's experiences, limiting them to preconceptions about gender, possibly impacting their career interests and contributing to the imposition of family roles and the division of labor. And in that sense, gender pricing is not an, an exception, rather it exemplifies the interaction between capital law and gender that contributes to maintaining women in an economically subordinated position. Moreover, the products and services cost more for women who earn less and share the greatest load of unpaid housework. And above that, they are paying more for the necessary tools to give birth to gender using uh, Giles' exp expression, allowing them to be recognized by society, employers, and administrative systems. So until now, a li liberal legalist framework has misunderstood many of these details about gender pricing and oversimplified the solution, focusing on anti-discrimination regulation and individualized measures. But with new, uh, a new theoretical framework as lenses, it is possible to see how gender pricing is significantly related to the construction and imposition of gender and connected to different sources of oppression and ex exploitation. Among the sources is economic dependence, the ultimate form of control over women, as Silvia Federici has written. The analysis of pink tax products and services allows me to hypothesize a link between consumption, economic violence, and gender subjectivity imposed through law and sustained through consumption and financial burdens in everyday practices of exploitation. Thank you. Oh, that was, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, where is that slideshow? Is that it? Yeah. Great, thanks so much, Susanna. That's amazing. Um, and so I'm, yeah, just going to talk to you today about current work I, I'm doing, as Sarah said. And so I'm very. What happened there? This one? This one. Sorry? No. Me too. 
Oh, somebody else's. Yep. And then you have to share screen. Yeah. Oh. Yes. This one? Uh, Here, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, I, uh, time. So, oh, is this working down there? Moving on. This slide is up, so I think that's. I know, but it's not moving to the next slide for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, as I said, um, this is current work I'm doing, and it comes out of participation, as Sarah was saying, in struggles over reproductive rights. So I'm still down in the reeds of historical struggle, right? I'm trying to think about abstraction and the significance of some of these legal changes. Um, so five years of legal abortion in Ireland, very significant struggle that we are still celebrating. And while people are exhausted at the same time at all the local uh, popular activity that gave rise to that. So thinking about that while uh, looking at the product of it and the legal regime that has come out of it. So I'm thinking about abortion law then as a site of sociobiological reproduction, looking at the push and pull of global abortion laws as evidence of contradiction, tension, and movement in relations of reproductive labor under capitalism. So typically the analysis of crisis of care that results from capitalism's destructive reliance, I'm thinking of Nancy Fraser and lots of other people, capitalism's destructive reliance on social reproduction, it tends to focus on the kind of body work that is care of others, actually existing human beings, right? Whereas we haven't seen that much social reproduction analysis of the work of social reproduction that is the growing of new human beings internally inside in the body. So I'm trying to think about what can we learn about laws of social reproduction then by thinking through abortion law. Um, and basically, I'm noticing, uh, in particular, what I'm focusing on with, with the, the focus on time and temporality is noticing the ways that more abstract time limits have come to play a key role in uh, justifying lawfulness of abortion and in pushing back against criminalization and freeing reproducers. OK, so that's the kind of thing I'm noticing in Ireland. It was very uh, prominent in the debate and, you know, persuading people that acceptance of the 12 week time limit for abortion was the main tactic for pushing for um, against uh, criminalization. So that's what I'm focusing on. And but we can think about that, that as, you know, overlapping, obviously, with lots of the other forms, partial criminalization and um, par partial recognition of rights. Um, so trying to think about the emergence of that, give it a bit more scrutiny in the context of global uneven pushback and, and recriminalization as well and the freeing of reproducers. So it, it, we tend to see then three different kinds of ways in which legal space for uh, reproductive freedoms has been carved out within a kind of coercive criminalized context. One is the therapeutic or socioeconomic exception, typically using you know, necessity or self-defense under criminal law. And so the British Abortion Act is a key example of this. And so from a social reproduction perspective, you know, we can think about the exceptions then, these bodily exceptions to criminalization. We can think about them as allowing repair of the re pregnant person, right? So it's a, there is a certain amount of repair of the depleted reproductive body that is given legal form through these exceptions to criminalization. Then we can also see ways in which rights then, right? Human rights discourse, obviously, rights to autonomy, rights to bodily um, sovereignty. Um, you know, so there's lots of literature, obviously, talking about a kind of ownership model that underpins that. We see that used to explicitly then in South Africa and Canada, you know, not informing often struggles, but not actually translated often explicitly into recognition. But but that is there then, that, that rights conception, and that does allow then for withdrawal from pregnancy as the reproduces freedom, right? So that's the, the strongest legal sort of form of protection of that. And then there's a debate obviously about the uneven public support that that gets. Sometimes it's a negative right, but it could be a positive right. And so what I'm trying to focus on then is ways in which 
Overlapping with that, we see a new sort of compromise strategy that's usually talked about in the literature, but it's, it's, I think there's something significant about the, the regulation of reproductive labour time here. And so in, in the Republic of Ireland, in the North of Ireland, Argentina, India, Mozambique, did lots of different examples of ways in which the time limit, um, a 12-week time limit in, the, in, in Ireland, 14 time a week time limit in Argentina, 20 in India, uh, 12 in Mozambique, that that was the, uh, a key legal strategy for, um, uh, for bringing about the lawfulness of abortion. And the way it looks then is there's no explicit rights protection here. It's a removal of the restriction and it's a kind of more proceduralist um, uh, time limited framework for, uh, for allowing abortion. So what does that look like in practice then? Um, so, you know, those are three different analytical distinctions to think about the differences that freedom, reproductive freedom gets carved out, but they overlap in practice. And so to focus on the Irish example then after repeal to the eighth, the way that has come to look, I think, is that that abstract time, um, the, the calendar time of the 12 week time limit, it what it ends up doing is um, it's not distinguishing between lawful and unlawful abortion anymore, but between generally lawful abortion up to 12 weeks and exceptionally lawful abortion after that. So you get this you, exceptionalism then is pushed um, uh, and it's the scrutiny under that that generates new vulnerabilities um, it, when people are trying to exit gestation. That overlaps with partial decriminalization, right? So again, it's very similar to what we've seen in, in freedom and decriminalization in, in context of sex, uh, sex work, right? This partial decriminalization. So in Ireland, that plays out with women and pregnant people being exempt from criminal liability, but providers and assisters are still criminally liable. So you have that sort of individual responsabilization happening, but you're not allowed help. You see it overlapping uh, with free local provision in Ireland, integration into the public maternity service, not the public health service, interestingly, but bordering uh, creates exceptions there. And it's, you know, there's a category of ordinary residences needed in order to access the fee free. You have consent-based decision-making, again, creates a set of groups of differentiation and exceptions for, for teenagers, immature minors, um, or those lacking legal capacity. Right, so we can see lots of differentiation within the categories as well as the time and uh, the time one coming out more generally. So what the, the conceptions that I'm trying to develop then, calendaring, punctuating time and anticipating temporality, these are categories then that I'm trying to develop in terms of thinking about the legal forms as regulating unwaged reproductive labor time how how do we see this reproductive gestational labor time how do we see it managed by the legal form but in a way that doesn't go through commodification okay so there's something going on in abortion law that i think helps us see that and so basically what we're seeing then is we see that general the generally lawful uh, pathway uh, pre-12 weeks that uh, mobilizes abstract calendar time but you know, very quickly it comes up against material content of pregnancy and actually the legal mechanisms end up using concrete time, menstrual time, because they have to map out the start of the 12 week period, right? So you do see ab abstract calendar time used, but it, it, it's even in the statute is translated, it has to work with concrete time as well. So there's a the calendaring then is a is 12 week period of pregnancy where abortion is lawful. And then after 12 weeks, it's another period of pregnancy where it's only exceptionally lawful. But within the first 12 weeks, you know, we see menstrual time as starting pregnancy. Right. This is different from sexual conception or technological conception being the starting point. It is a historical difference then in seeing menstrual time as the, the beginning time of pregnancy. That could be unconscious time for the pregnant person. And then the exceptional pathways the 12 week uh, time limit then becomes a very concrete deadline that in practice becomes the starting point of the exceptional pathways, that its lack of access to the other generates the vulnerability, which means that you have to rely on exceptional pathways. So this just to give you a picture of how calendaring is mobilizing these different um, material um, abstract and concrete moments. 
out of that then, right, the, the calendar distinction between 12 weeks, using 12 weeks, um, out of that, we see new legal norms of timeliness then be generated that sit alongside health, you know, improvement and autonomy, right? So we're seeing norms of timeliness emerge. And the first key one then um, is an earliness one. So timeliness becomes early intervention in through abortion into pregnancy. Um, earliness then emerges as a way to measure timeliness that grants the lawfulness of abortion subjected to this general time limit. It allows us to see other categories that are typically talked about, you know, through a liberal framework as a risk to health or the therapeutic exception. It allows us time, the time temporality and reproductive time perspective allows us to see repair then, reparation of the pregnant person at the individual level but obviously in, in situated in their environment and in their community, um, repair as the pregnant person is the second legal norm then, it's an exceptional legal norm that is allowing the replenishing of reproductive labor time, but typically according to someone else's, uh, the doctor's criteria or, or in ways that the threshold becomes very difficult to access. But it is there, that idea of reparative, backward looking repair time. The, the, this allows us to see other exceptional access categories, which typically are about fetal centric grounds and you know, the risk of fetal anomaly. It allows us to see these as speculative um, pathways from a time perspective. And that comes into view through this framework then, because what's, what's happening then about the prognosis of fetal abnormality or fetal death in the Irish case is that the failed reproductive future is allowed to justify access to abortion. And then we see the old crisis ground, which has typically been used um, throughout pushbacks against criminalization is still there, but very underused um, as the immediate intervention um, and the threat, uh, the threat requiring a crisis intervention. So those are the four sort of normative um, sort of new earliness is new, I think, as a, as a kind of reproductive timeliness. Um, but the others are kind of adaptations in light of the abstract calendar use um, adaptations of these pre-existing grounds that we now see. The third sort of dimension then that I think we can theorize with is ways in which then the felt temporality um, is managed by the legal form as well. And so you can see ways in which the time limit becomes a deadline, right? There is, there you are, uh, subjected to poor, the exceptional pathways if you don't meet the time limit. So that time limit becomes weighty and anxiety provoking. And so there's a way in which, you know, what the, the felt temporality of criminalization, the chill and threat of criminalization is being displaced then by an anxiety generated by, you know, the, the problem of missing their deadline and having to be more scrutinized under uh, an exceptionality sort of framework. So, so we have a shift kind of there in terms of the felt temporalities of, of the different legal forms in this context. But what the, and, and sort of the more positive thing, I suppose, is that there is the possibility of routine relief from gestational labor then if you can access within the 12 weeks. So the kind of relief from uh, pregnancy that activists would have provided through you know, all sorts of activities around the law and outside of the law has been brought within the legal framework. Um, so that routine relief is there, but then it generates new vulnerabilities through when you don't meet that time limit and anxiety over missing the deadline is there is is obviously an effect of missing the deadline but there's all sorts of ways in practice in which the time limit is is, is generated as a very sharp cutoff point when it would be possible to implement it in lots of other ways so 12 weeks is interpreted as, as 12 weeks plus zero days even though in normal reproductive health care practice 12 weeks is counted usually as 12 weeks plus six days and there's no uh you know way to to at the moment to interpret um interruption of the timelines um and you also see accelerated pressure then to access within the deadline 
through um, hospital access being more difficult. You see uh, decelerated access with imposition, you know, of the slow violence of mandatory waiting periods. And, you know, all of that is under the threat then, not of criminalization of pregnant people, but through being scrutinized for the access to the exceptional routes. Okay, great. So basically, um, time limit abortion laws then, the, what I'm working with is this idea that they bring into being a legal form that's publicly administered of unwaged gestational labor time. That's the significance of them. So I'm kind of, you know, thinking about this at the moment through social reproduction theory and wondering if it's generating uh, material to bring back to, to uh, Pashikanis and legal form. And so we see that then with the mixture of abstract and concrete moments generate a so, the generation of movement and contradictions um, in that way through the pull of abstraction and then that um, um, coming up against concrete pregnant moments. We see it through the generation of legal forms for constituting subjectivity then as uh, pregnant people are freed from unwaged gestational labor time, but there's the generate, except when that's untimely, right? So the timeliness distinction becomes key. And then one of the reasons I'm interested in this, or think this is a useful way for uh, understanding differentiation is because obviously untimeliness is generated in, in lived uh, experience then through um, racialized, classed, sexualized, gendered, all sorts of different ways in which that differentiation makes one more likely to be untimely in accessing abortion. Um, and then, so basically though, at the, for, in terms of thinking about perspectives for looking at, you know, again, it's like a lot of the work on abortion law is still in a feminist context, still um, approached through uh, more liberal lenses. Um, we have a lot of work around reproductive justice, which is challenging that, but I think we can turn to social reproduction to help us understand then why it's so uneven and why it, you know, the current crisis is producing recriminalization in the States, in Poland, at the same time in the world as we have um, opening up of access um, in Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, but that also gives us potential, I think, for further theorizing of time limited legal forms. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm interested, you know, not just for the context of abortion and reproductive justice, but thinking about then the, the time limited form allows us to, to think about that time can be non-commodified reproductive labor time, right? So we can think about time as money and ways in which reproductive labor time it gets turned, get, is commodified, that can be included in it, but it allows us to theorize then how value is generated through the exploitation of unpaid reproductive labor time, as well as through the, the exploitation of paid uh, reproductive labor time. Okay, that's it, thanks. Uh, I'll let you. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for staying for the last panel. Um, in my paper today, I seek to develop a Marxist feminist reading of the victim subject in international criminal justice. And I'm drawing here on my forthcoming book called The Blame Cascade, Victims and the Labor of Justice at the International Criminal Court. Um, and just as a backdrop, the ICC is basically the first international criminal justice institution that provides victims with rather extensive rights to participate in the proceedings and to receive reparations and assistance. And in the book, I'm trying to explore what the purpose of that victim's rights regime is, what it actually does. And broadly speaking, we can distill two perspectives on the court's victim's rights regime in the existing literature, sort of on the one hand, the sort of more liberal legalist perspective, and on the other hand, the critical perspective. Uh, so the legal literature on the one hand very much interprets victim participation in international criminal justice as a procedural problem. It's the problem of how to balance 
the victim's rights to participate in the trial against the defendant's rights to a fair trial. And legal scholars usually conclude that the defendant's rights trump the victim's rights and that international criminal legal procedure only allows for very limited and token forms of victim participation and that the ICC in fact um, has been over promising to victims and needs to become much more modest and realistic. Uh, critical scholars, on the other hand, are less worried about the procedural implications of victim participation because they think they are rather limited. They see the victim's role in international criminal justice as primarily ideological. Indeed, uh, while the court has progressively limited victim participation in the courtroom through the juridical regulation of victimhood, imposing tons of uh, conditions on victims, it gener generously mobilizes all victims, dead or alive, past, present, future, all victims are sort of mobilized through this rhetorical figure of the victims in whose name the court speaks and on whose behalf it renders justice. So for critical scholars, victim participation really functions more like a spectacle, which is created for audiences in the global north, um, which sort of renders um, certain forms of violence, international crimes, hyper-visible while rendering other forms of violence slow violence, structural violence, colonial violence, basically invisible. And of course, African victims, especially women and children, feature very prominently in the spectacle as sort of the kind of passive innocent victims who need to be rescued, but they're not, they're not usually seen as important subjects of international criminal justice in their own right. And, and this is precisely the perspective that I'm challenging um, in my book, because I think it neglects how productive victim participation is as a method of creating capitalist subjects in the global south. Um, my challenge to begin with is a methodological challenge because um, both the legal and the critical literature um, tend to either focus on the role of victims in the courtroom or on the sort of more discursive and um, visual representation of victims, um, but they, they don't really sort of look beyond the courtroom. So of course, if we look at um, the courtroom, um, we see the victim's lawyer somewhere squeezed between the prosecution and the registry. There are no victims. Uh, so indeed, the role of victims looks rather limited. But this very much overlooks all the things that the court does in its situation countries, for example, in Kenya and Uganda, where I've conducted fieldwork between 2014 and 2019. Uh, indeed, if we look at the kind of uh, figures the court publishes to sort of show its accomplishments in the year 2023, um, we see that when it comes to victims, much more happens outside the courtroom than in the courtroom. So you see the first four figures here, uh, they all relate to sort of trial proceedings, and these are rather modest figures. And then suddenly the figures start exploding, 16,000 victims participate in the proceedings, 1,600 victims receive reparations, 17,000 victims benefit from assistance, over 400 outreach meetings with affected communities and over 30 million people reached in 16 situations. Indeed, victim participation at the court really looks more like this. Um, it's really, it really happens in the field um, when victims' lawyers and their field assistants um, meet victims on a regular basis in their villages um, and they sort of update them on the trial, they listen to their stories and they answer um, their questions and concerns. The ICC also has rather extensive outreach programs um, in, in 16 situation countries, mainly in Africa. This is a photo taken in Northern Uganda, where the court sort of very regularly organizes trial screenings um, in, in over 30 villages in, in Northern Uganda. And the court also goes into schools. The court's outreach officers go into schools, into universities. They train lawyers, they, tra they, they train journalists. And so I guess my question was, what's the purpose of all these activities? Is this just window dressing? And um, what's interesting is that the court itself describes sort of the, the purpose of its outreach mission as building bonds every day. Uh, so I got kind of interested in this, in this idea and was wondering what, what are the kind of bonds that the court is forging there on the ground, sort of hidden a bit from the visibility of the courtroom in The Hague, and, and to find out, I, I interviewed the court's local staff and outreach officers and intermediaries who do the bulk of the court's victim engagement on the ground 
either for free or in a rather unpaid or underpaid form. And so talking to these actors, they often talked about the challenges that they face facilitating victim participation on the ground. Uh, so one field assistant in, in, in Uganda, for example, told me they, the victims, still don't understand fully how it works and even what is expected of them. At the beginning, we had clients who were telling us that they are tired of attending meetings. But one would expect that this is something that someone who has chosen to participate would understand. This is the expectation. This is their duty. So this is something we had to go through over and over again and tell them step by step. Do you remember when you came in to apply? This is what participation means. This is what is expected of you to share your views. The trial cannot go on without you giving us your views. It becomes pointless if we are to work without you. We only work with what you've told us. It took time. So here we see the rather disciplinary quality of victim participation. You've agreed to participate. Now you must share your views. Um, so as victims are sort of slowly roped into the court's processes, we see how victim participation morphs from a legal form or a democratic form where it's all about victims' rights and victim, victims having sort of their voices heard to a labor form where victims sort of start working for the court largely for free. Indeed, by engaging in the court's processes, people not only become victims, they also are trained to become productive and reproductive capitalist subjects. And I think this sort of metamorphosis becomes more evident when we look at the kind of reparation and outreach work that the ICC does on the ground. And just to give an example, uh, the ICC's Trust Fund for Victims um, supports village savings and loan associations, which are basically microcredit schemes where victims, especially women victims, are effectively turned into indebted subjects. So they, they become really sort of capitalist subjects par excellence, where they take out debt and they police each other in the, in the collection of debt. And one victim of sexual and gender-based violence, who was very grateful for this, this type of assistance she received, uh, she said, the microcredit was the biggest benefit I received. It gave me dignity and made me respectable. I can even afford to make myself beautiful. Without that, I couldn't have found a husband. Nobody wants to marry a woman who was raped, but he finds me beautiful because I can take care of myself. Um, so I argue that once we shift our focus from victim representation in the courtroom to victim engagement in the court situation countries, we discover that hidden behind the victim represented in the courtroom or the kind of victims looming as the sort of big rhetorical figure that the court uses, there is a third victim, a sort of more flesh and blood subject in the field who is interpolated as the court's champion, so they have to support the court, but they're also recruited as a working subject in a double sense, first working for the court, participating in a trial, attending trial viewings and mobilizing other victims, and thus reproducing the court as a living and working institution on the ground, and then second, working for capitalism, taking up their position at the bottom of the global division of labor. So in other words, I argue that the court's victim engagement is not just mere window dressing. It's not only directed sort of towards audiences in the global north, distracting them from colonial and capitalist violence. It's also about victims in the global south. They are important subjects of this whole thing. It's about producing them as a certain type of capitalist subjects. And, and what kind of subjects are, am I talking about here? And I think here sort of a, a Marxist feminist um, rereading of Pashukani's commodity theory of law is quite helpful. And I'm drawing here on a chapter that I co-wrote with Eva Nanopoulos. Hi, Eva. <laughs> um, on Marxist feminist approaches to international law which will be published with the Oxford Handbook on Women in International Law. And, and Ruth, of course, also talked about this. So a Marxist feminist reading suggests that women cannot only be produced as Pashukani's formally equal legal subject. They have to be produced as a double subject. So on the one hand, as workers and producers of value, feminized subjects must be integrated into the logic of capital and the legal form. And on the other hand, as devalued laborers or reproducers, feminized subjects always need to be differentiated, subject to different rights and responsibilities. So in other words, they're at the same time Pashukani's abstract legal subject and a gender differentiated unequal subject. Now, what does it have to do with victims, if anything? <laughs> um, 
the victim category, I argue, uh, helps to create and manage the contradictions of that double subject in the current moment of neoliberal global capitalism. Indeed, emerging from war, newly freed of their land, Victims in the global south, and the ICC usually works in the sort of more peripheral sites in Africa, in, in villages and towns that are sort of at the at the sort of margin of, of the capitalist system. Um, these subjects are ripe for capitalist integration. So in other words, the victim subject is not just a merely sort of a, an ideological fiction or distraction, but it solves a real problem, which is the problem of how to integrate people in the global south into global capitalist relationships in ways that both sort of render them formally equal commodity owners, as well as unequal, differentiated, racialized, and gendered subjects who must accept their place at the bottom of the global division of labor and whose labor is usually denied, actually, um, which then sort of makes them appear as kind of surplus to the whole system and not really as, as workers in their own right. And indeed, the victim category um, arguably does very similar work to the witches and the housewife category that sort of Marxist feminists talk about in invisibilizing what victims actually do. They work both for the court, for international institutions like the court, and for global capitalism. Unlike criminal law, however, international criminal law creates workers not through criminalization, but through victimization. So victimization becomes a key method of, of creating these types of devalued workers. So the court first turns people who suffered harm into victims, and then in the second step, transforms them into devalued workers. So inequality is very much baked into the victim subject. And I argue that blame is a key method of regulating victimhood to ensure their continued subordination and subjugation. And um, I call this process, which effectively ties people into victimhood, which keeps them in victimhood. I call this process the blame cascade. And I argue that it is a key organizing principle of international criminal law. Um, now, international criminal law doesn't only rely on the kind of sort of the, the, the normal story we hear is that international criminal law is all about the production of individual black evil perpetrators who sort of absorb all the blame for genocide or, or crimes against humanity. Um, for example, Bars uh, drawing on Pashukani's calls this commodified morality. So the idea that punishment emerges as an equivalent which mediates the harm done to the victim. Uh, but I think that's only one part of the story. I think what the blame cascade tries to unveil is how this visible legal process of attributing and apportioning blame to the defendant in the courtroom is accompanied by another process, an invisible institutional process, whereby blame cascades down through the mundane, everyday, racialized, and gender devaluation of labor. Now, when you, I did lots of sort of feed work at the court, and when you talk to people, you see this kind of blaming discourse, right? So. The judges in The Hague blame the victims' lawyers in Kenya and Uganda because they're incompetent and sort of selfish. In Kenya and Uganda, in Nairobi or, or Kampala, the victims' lawyers, sort of who are metropolitan, then blame the intermediaries in the field who are, again, incompetent or, or sort of self-serving. And then when you are in the field, the intermediaries are suddenly sort of the local professional class, you know, and they blame the victims for being lazy. And so you see that sort of cascading process so in other words, the kind of dirty work of blaming victims is not done by the judges in The Hague, but it's mainly done by intermediaries in the field uh, who are often victims themselves. So they're often, they're just like representing other victims. And indeed what I found interesting interviewing intermediaries in Northern Uganda, ranging from NGO workers, social workers, teachers, um, and cultural leaders, I was quite struck by how Uniformly, they insisted that the problem in northern Uganda is that victims have become lazy after decades of war and displacement, and the victims have to stop crying and go back and toil um, in the field. And in fact, in northern Uganda, local intermediaries have very much recalibrated the ICC to really fit into this local agenda of, um, of disciplining what they see as an unruly population towards productive and reproductive work. So just to provide some quotes, 
uh, one culture leader said, come easy is not possible. You have to work hard. You must go and emulate what your fathers do. You've got a dick. You have to plan something. Uh, one NGO worker was really outraged by the idea that people should just get free stuff. He was like, people should be forced to work. The principle, nothing for nothing should be introduced. And of course, there was a lot of focus on the kind of reproductive roles of victims. Mothers don't know how to bring up their children. The girls are into prostitution. They're jumping from one nightlife place to another. And so just to conclude in the book, I mean, this is now kind of a bit very broad, but I'm just going to leave it like this. Uh, in the book, I basically try to argue that the ICC is ultimately more about victims than perpetrators, more about the global south than the global north, more about capitalist inclusion than juridical exclusion, more about discipline and punishment, more about work and depth than about norms and accountability. And I think international criminal law therefore not only kind of normalizes capitalist violence or marketizes victims, which is sort of the kind of usual story we get from uh, critical scholarship, but it also operates as an important medium through which the unequal productive and reproductive relations of global capitalism are constituted. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes, that's on. Um, thanks so much for three um, fantastic papers. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, shall I put it both hands or would you? Thanks. Um, thanks so much for them. They were all really, really fascinating. Um, I've got a very sort of vague question, um, but I've just been thinking a lot recently, like kind of I'm starting to think about um, the relationship between, well, the role of abstraction in both gender and the legal form, sort of the legal form as it appears in fascist and then like thinking about gender and the construction of gender through that like double abstraction and I just yeah you all kind of touched on that so I just wondered if any of you wanted to have any, anything to say to make any more on that. So, so did you have that um just because you're here rather than going back okay. to make you run to the other side of the room I don't actually need this as you can hear um, so I think this is my question for Lola, but I'm thinking about also your point, Ruth, which is this category of the victim. And I'm sure you address this fully in your book, but I'm very mindful that the construction of the category of the victim in ICL is highly differentiated. So, for example, if we think about questions of sexual violence and who gets to be a victim in the first place, then the work you're describing is actually incredibly complex. So I agree with you about its constitutive nature, but my question would be the construction of the category itself, not just its membership and the complexity of the work that that does. So being mindful of that problem. Uh, thanks everyone. Those were like uh, great papers. I'm uh, my brain is slowly melting out of my ears because it's been a long day. But um, so I had a couple of kind of like uh questions which I'd just be interested in, in hearing like general reflections on in part, but then some specific things. So firstly, to Ruth, and I acknowledge this. I'm not sure if this is a good question or not, but I think there's something interesting in thinking about the specific shift to the time model as you're talking about, I think particularly in the Irish context, and I was wondering how much you could reflect on that, that obviously prior to the eighth being repealed, the, the fetus was like, like juridified as having a set of rights in a way that I think is quite interesting for thinking that in terms of the legal form. And if there's, if there's anything that, you know, you could reflect on, on that. And I think that's a vague question, but I'm kind of interested in, in, in thinking that through. Um, but everyone, in a way, I think one of the things that I'm also interested in hearing a little bit about is often we think of socially reproductive labor 
as this kind of unpaid labor, but obviously it is also sometimes paid labor as well. And that's true even in terms of, you know, gestational labor, in terms of um, surrogates and, and in all of these instances. And I was wondering to what, what does that do to some of the equation for thinking through the relationship between um, social reproductive labor and legal forms when it can be both paid and unpaid, right? And equally, I was wondering um, if we think about then just in relation to the way in which surplus value is redistributed and, and, and the idea of a social wage, how that might um, feed into it. And I think I had a third question, but it went. So <laughs> I'll, I might come back to it. Um, yeah, okay, so think, yeah, the, I'm thinking about the what work is abstraction doing, not just in the context of legal form, but in the context of gender differentiation, was that the question? Yeah, 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 no, it's a, it, it's a rooting kind of challenge, isn't it? Um, yeah, because I guess we've been thinking very much about yeah the the way that legal form um, uh, in Patrick Hannison's terms yeah it, it has to work kind of in this abstract way and then there's how we put that into uh, conversation with other aspects of of social relations. So yeah, um, so I suppose a lot of the form content work I have been doing is about working the abstraction um, and trying to use the legal form to make certain things visible right um but and i suppose one of the things i'd want to you know definitely keep alive is the dynamic you know the dynamic movement between you know logic and struggle as we talked about yesterday or that what, what work does the abstraction do and um you know and how does that obviously shift depending on the social content of the social relations and so 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 you know, there's a, dyna dy a dynamic with the abstraction as well, right? Um, and I think, you know, Marie was talking about that, I guess, earlier in the way in which she was talking about the way that class struggle can come to the commodity form or wanting to capture that. So I guess that's one of the problems then, right? Uh, that we're worrying about in the context of how we use legal form and is it, you know, keeping that, keeping that question um, in terms of the form content sort of distinction. That distinction allowing us to do the, the work of seeing how abstractions can change as well as do. So, and then with gender differentiation, yeah, I guess it's trying to think about the the way the abstraction of gender um, and patriarchy, maybe in another sense, is is generated by you know differential extraction of value from different kinds of labor processes, right? So. So the so social reproduction is helping us to see, um, you know, is working with that, with gender in that sort of abstract way, and and then it kind of links, I guess, to Rob's question about, so we can see that pregnancy does get commodified, right? But the gender differentiation, the the social reproduction way in which is that's working abstraction helps us to see um, the non-commodified part. So I think it's really interesting, right, that it is the surrogacy, the commodified surrogacy relations and the use of embryonic materials for paid, even if it's poorly paid, clinical research. That's the sort of uh, paid social reproduction of pregnancy that gets theorized. But ordinary unpaid pregnancy, that's about, you know, production of people at the end of it um, and doesn't get it hasn't uh, typically there's a few new pieces out recently um Jana Bryson and stuff right so so yeah so I suppose I'm wanting to work that abstraction around uh, the the differentiation that uh, the the reproduction of the worker brings to social reproduction but yeah and then yeah there's a tension then is between how that gets mobilized when we when we're looking at different types of sexual reproduction. Um, so 
uh, I wouldn't have many to, to add uh, uh, about abstraction. I think one way to think about it is the same kind of um, rational Rob used to race, it, as in the sense that uh, as race, gender also abstracts people uh, from their social realities. And, in, and when we have a gender subjectivity, it will impose like a, a, a specific form to, to be filled uh, with many, many aspects. As for social reproduction and the payment uh, we see and the commodification of reproduction, um, this is far from my uh, expertise, but I keep thinking about uh, Brazil uh, where we have some examples of uh, some regulation about uh, surrogacy and well, it, it cannot be paid. Uh, people, uh, women need can can only accept to be reimbursed uh, about um, some uh, expenses they have during the process. And what is interesting to see in Brazil is how they are using this to somehow compensate women, not for uh, the expensive uh, expenses, but expenses, sorry, uh, but for the work they are doing uh, in reproducing. But even so, uh, it is used in the uh, complete uh, opposite way, right? To see, well, they are, they are commodifying children, and this is not fair, and using as an artifice to, and, and as an argument to impose uh, very traditional gender forms of reproduction and family. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, no, absolutely. The the victim concept or the category is a very problematic category in international criminal law. And if you talk to practitioners, that they would always point out how complex victimhood is and how you know we have to look at victims' very complex and different needs, and every form of victimization is different, and so on and so forth. But then I do, I do think that there is a particular type of victim subject that is produced, which is a gendered and racialized subject. And I think especially sort of the victim of sexual and gender based violence is often sort of the, the, the sort of the key victim that especially the reparation and assistance work of the court um, focuses on. So I think there is a there is sort of um, the complexity discourse also hides a bit the sort of shared or common features of, of that victim which is being produced. And I think what's quite interesting about the court is that, of course, because the victim concept is so problematic, I don't know whether it's the same in other languages, but a German victim is basically, you, you use it as a slur for loser, right? You say, oh, you're such a victim. It means like you're such a loser. So there is a certain, certain idea of, of blame and sort of weakness. Um, built into the concept, which obviously makes the concept very problematic. And so in what, so, and that's obviously something that international criminal law recognizes. And therefore they often, the, the trust fund for victims, for example, often uses this idea of victim survivor. So they have this concept, the sort of victim survivor concept, where victim and survivor become part of one concept, which I think then really means that, that people are caught into this sort of your, you know, you, you sort of in, into this kind of capitalist progress narrative, right? Where you have to somehow pull yourself out of victimhood and become a survivor. And of course, the only way to do so is by becoming a productive and reproductive capitalist subject. And here are all the kind of technologies that the court engages in, in terms of being on time and um, engaging in activities and, you know, taking out microcredit, all these kind of activities that then sort of push people into survivorhood. So, so there's either, and if you don't manage that, if you don't succeed in becoming a survivor, then you kind of only have yourself to blame. So there is a sort of, there is sort of a weird way in which the victim survivor continuum very much, yeah, it very much sort of um, means that they, they become caught into that sort of binary thing where either they make it and then it means that they're productive and reproductive capitalist subjects or they don't make it and then they're just like losers you know and that's anyway how they're constructed to be because that's their role in the global capitalist system
Yeah, thanks everyone for such a rich panel. It's really a joy to listen to the three of you. Um, um, I have a general question for all three of you, but also when you're just talking, uh, Leila, um, a question occurred to me about the word uh, victim in, in Dutch. It is slachtoffer, and I think in German it's opfer, right? So which is also word, the word for sacrifice or like, in Dutch, we, uh, the literal translation in English would be um, uh, the the um, the sacrificial, the sacrifice of slaughter, kind of. And I wondered if that, um, you know, if if that is sort of um, triggered any any kind of uh, thoughts that you could work with in that sort of uh, context. Uh, my more general question for the three of you was like. Um, I was thinking that uh, I'm more familiar with the US context in, in abortion than the Irish, um, but I did see that in the in the US, we've seen uh, in the last few years an enormous development of like mutual aid networks, like doula, uh, abortion doulas, even I've seen like recipes for abortion pills appear online and I've seen like mail outs of like ab uh, abortion um medication that you can use like uh put on like lsd on like drops and papers and it can just be mailed across the country and like even like um the recipes for it being like um dropped in pharmacies uh amongst the sort of uh pregnancy tests like on little pieces of paper that people are like and i think in a way because we've been talking a lot about like um, we are all doing this because we eventually want a different world in which we don't have a state providing those things. So to what extent um, do you see in your field research like um, already like that different world, that world emerging or that resistance or that like alternative practice like happening and emerging? I'd be really excited to learn more about that. Um, so I will address a question to the three of you, but it's, uh, specifically Leila, I want to talk about the judicial uh, process. And, and I am interested, in, fa in fact, in the discussion about the double dimension or double character of the subject. So we have a, a one dimension that is the legal subject abstracted from all the, the concrete um, uh, uh, qualifications. And on the, on the other hand, you have a subject that pertains to a determinate um, uh, gender, race, and, and the class determinations. But um, if you think about it, if the, the legal subject derives from the commodity form and we analyze how the commodity form is determined, it, it also has this double dimension within its own concept. So it's not just a value, but a use value as well. And the, use va the dimension of the use value is of particular import importance for production because it is the consumption of a specific use value that uh, value valorization valorization can occur, therefore capital uh, relations can occur. So I would say that uh, the, the category of the legal subject already encompass this the dimension, the concrete subject and the, the um, abstract subject. And it only happens that in, in circulation and the point of departure, this uh, double character is implicit and not explicit. And when you think about the judicial ju judicial process, we have a very interesting um, part in Pashukani's test that when he says that in judicial process, the legal form autonomizes um, itself and reveals its true um, nature. Uh, and it is interesting because you you presented how in the judicial process this double dimension in a certain way they uh, appears explicitly, but um, they appear uh, explicitly. But even so, the the concrete dimension of the the subject are still like a support for the realization of its opposite. Um, I don't know. I want to hear uh, about what you three have to say about this this question.
Thank you. Um, so this is for Ruth mostly. Um, I was interested when you said kind of criminalization as a carving out of freedom. Um, and what happens if we look at it in a sense more as a continuity than a discontinuity? So a continuity in regulating um, bodies in a particular way. So in that sense, it's similar to regulations surrounding labor, where uh, a person can give birth, um, who has to be present, what kind of medication is available. In a similar sense with abortion, it becomes a practice that's not actually free. It's like very highly regulated, what medication is available, um, when it can be done. So even when it's legal, it's not access to bodily autonomy. It's like a very regulated practice. Um, and so to me, that kind of reads as a clash between an abstract subject or what the law says it's doing versus a lived experience, which is actually very highly regulated. And I was wondering if that contradiction comes through um, in field work. Will I start? Uh, maybe if I've. Um, fabulous questions, gosh. Um, uh, so, Gretchen, yeah, thanks so much for that because absolutely, like, the, um, all the work, you know, I mean, abortion pills came into being as abortion pills, right, through the repurposing of medication for ulcers and, you know, it was like feminists in Brazil who made that happen. And so, so many different networks, yeah, that are about, um, getting access to abortion um, yeah, outside of any official uh, provision, right? And so for me, there's a way in which thinking about all that labor of making um, exit from gestational labor possible, that, that, that all that alternate practice, um, you know, to me, it's kind of parallel with Federici's, you know, gardens and soup kitchens and ways of organizing. Uh, social reproduction that doesn't have to go through pro uh, proletarianization, right? So, so that's so I think there's a really interesting way in which, yeah, people are getting on with making abortion available, and yeah, all these in inventive ways that they're doing that, and then you see sometimes that does get or have you know get turned into a charity that's regulated, then, right? But there's lots of um, direct work reproductive labor that is going on in organizing that on a communal level and yeah the evidence of that yeah so it's lovely doing work like that and um, it's really important um, you know the presence of that as the as you know as to which we would hold any legal structural accountable right that's the community of activist labor that holds um, anything to account basically um yeah, so and then just trying to think about um the the double character, yeah, of the abstract and concrete subject and the way the movement between implicit and explicit. That's such a lovely way of putting it. And yeah, absolutely. I think that's what I'm struggling with, definitely, is that shift. So in, in everything, right? In, in in ways in which the exceptionalism is implicit. Um, um, you know, but but it's by tracing the struggle between like there is a, a reproductive subject that's being generated um, and so there's a making of that subject unfree in the in free in very limited terms right but absolutely we're trying to put we're trying to show how regulated that freedom is by um, looking at all the conditions of it right so I think yeah so I think that's how um, so definitely yeah there's a, a, it, it's trying to do the work right it's very like trying to do the work of giving adequate weight and uh, attention to all the sort of micro ways in which um freedom is carved out but that's all in very yeah very contingent and but there's a multi-dimensionality to it right that i want to kind of flesh out that uh, that is moving at the same time as we recognize yeah there's always a, a double kind of movement with the unfreedom of that at the same time. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to start with your question. I mean, I'm still fairly new to legal form thinking, so I, I you just have to, I don't know whether that makes sense, but um, so is the double subject already contained in the legal form? So I was wondering about this, but I think my understanding was the idea of the double, the, the idea of the legal form is this tension between the abstract and the concrete subject or this kind of movement between abstract and concrete but then 
when it comes to racialized and gendered subjects, this is just a different form of abstraction, right? It's not that we're talking about concrete people here, right? They are, they are abstracted through gender and race, you know, like it creates a different type of racialized gendered and, and sort of, uh, and racialized and gendered subject, which has an differential rights and responsibilities, not as individuals or concrete subjects, but as part of that sort of category. At least sort of that's that sort of was my understanding that I, I'm not sure the legal form and the sort of concrete versus abstract already contains what 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 we're talking about. But but as I said, I'm I'm new to this. Um in terms of the the juridical process, um I mean I think what's interesting about so I I, I just I just read more on Pashukanis and criminal law just in the last few days and as I understand it, the idea is that in criminal law, punishment is sort of an equivalent, you know, so that punishment, the idea is that punishment is supposed to restore the contract, right? Like an individual, the, the defendant, the criminal has broken the contract and a punishment is supposed to then restore that contract by sort of functioning as an equivalent to the crime committed. So punishment for Pashukanis is not about, um, you know, uh, reforming the criminal or sort of protecting society, but it's about the sort of restoration of the contract. Um, and, and so that's why punishment is about the severe, severity of the crime. Now, international criminal law is weird because, you know, what's the equivalent to genocide? You know, how much can you punish an individual who is, like, you can see how it works for, like, a theft, you know, like, yeah, I, I stole something, and then sort of the judge works out how that translates into, you know, uh, loss of freedom or whatever sort of the capitalist measure is, you know, but I think for international criminal law that becomes very tricky because the crimes are just so big, you can't really pin them on an individual. And I think that's why also the victim blaming comes in because you need to morally, you need another moral avenue to recycle basically. So I think both victims and perpetrators have to be blamed in international criminal law because it's just not feasible to pin it all. Like there must be something wrong with these people in the global South. They're all kind of violent and uncivilized and so on and so forth. And, and so, yeah, I think, I think for international criminal law, victimization plays an important role there, not just criminalization. Um, then there was um, the question around resistance. Um, yeah, I, I think the question around resistance in international criminal law, I've struggled with this a little bit because I, I think my book is a lot about how victims are produced as ideological subjects and capitalist subjects, and then it's very little about resistance. But I think there is, especially when you look at ideological subject creation, there are funny little ways in which resistance happens. So, for example, when I sort of observe the victims' meetings on the ground, it was funny how, for example, victims always come late to the meetings. Always, it takes like an hour or two before the meeting starts because people, they are subsistence farmers, right? So they have to look after their garden in the morning. So they just can't be on time, you know? And, and so you have these little, like coming late is like a form of resistance against this kind of production of capitalist subjects. Or like one of the things that victims lawyers always complain is that people always forget what they were taught last time. So they, they, they taught them about reparations and what are the legal preconditions for reparations. And then next time again, victims ask, but why don't we receive reparations? And the lawyers say, oh, but we explained this already last time. So people always forget. And I think forgetting again is a form of, of resistance. So there are little forms in which constantly people in the everyday undo these forms of ideological interpolation um, and then Victims always are really frustrated because, you know, victims are really bad students and they don't really learn. So, this, so I think there's a lot of that happening, even if it's not the kind of grand resistance where, you know, people don't show up or something like this. Um, victims as sacrificial lamb. Yeah, I think that's it's the same in German. Actually, it has the same connotation, and and I think there's something to it. But I think there's also, like, I also, I think what what was for me more striking was I think that victims and also just they're just they're also being made active you know they're not just sacrificed like i think all these activities are also about sort of producing a subject that has to play a certain role in this world you know and i think um obviously in some ways there are surplus populations but especially if you look at a more reproductive socially reproductive perspective you also see how they you know reproduce migrant labor caring labor you know i think you know, I think these people fulfill an important role. Or, for example, if you look at debt, you know, like 
I think victims in the global south through debt actually fulfill an important part of, of the global capitalist economy. So I don't want to think of them purely as sort of the kind of sacrifice, bare life sort of thing, like they're surplus, they don't play a role. I think they play an important role and that's what this is partly about. Um, so thank you for the questions. I'll start with Thais, uh, which somehow uh, connects with uh, Breach's question. So focusing on um, the judicial aspects or administrative, com uh, administrative complaints about fintechs, it says a lot about uh, the, the, the legal form and legal subjectivity and how women are constructed because most complaints we found, they are men's. Like uh, when they decided to charge women less for football tickets, we have a lot of complaints uh, in the European Union because men said, well, that's unfair. Uh, we have uh, one case about uh, car insurance in which women usually paid less uh, than men uh, due to some um, calculation uh, and anyways. So the complaint was from men and they assess uh, the tribunals and had like a change that implied, well, uh, uh, men are not paying less, women are just paying more to pay the same as men in, uh, in terms of insurance. So if it shows how the subjects are constructed, it, it shows, well, men can assess easily these uh, um, institutions to complain about price and women somehow are finding other ways to to deal with this and resistance would be i guess one of the answers because the whole pink texting it, it gained uh notoriety with uh or women posting on the internet on blogs uh the different prices they found every day and it's ridiculous uh you have um uh, helmets, uh, pens, and, and the list goes forever. And this started to put some pressure. Well, this this is not just to fill pencils. Uh, it's a lot, especially when we, find, uh, when we go to services, and particularly services is where women cannot pick to, to choose to buy the, the men's uh, item. If the hairdresser says, well, you are a woman, you have to pay more for to, to cut your hair or even to dry clean your cotton white shirt, it will be this. So not only resistance uh, within exposing these kinds of practices, but small businesses like uh, hairdressers charging the same for men and women. Uh, I won't say that brands uh, saying, well, we abolish the pink tax as a form of resistance is more like pink washing the pink tax, but we have hopefully good examples of it, of resistance. Thank you. Great. I think um, that's pretty much time unless there's a really burning question. So yeah, thanks so much to all of our panelists and to the organizers for these two days. Um, okay um i won't keep you much longer first of all thank you so much uh for attending over the past two days to all of you that have attended to our speakers to our chairs um as we mentioned this is going to be the first hopefully of several events there'll be a call for papers for um another event uh at lund and um, that call will come in the next couple of weeks and that um conference will be uh, sometime in in late september 20 26, 27, um, and then we'll advertise details for the closing conference in Sao Paulo. If you did register, we'll add you to our mailing list so we can keep you update with keep you up to date with everything that we're doing. Um, and there's also a blog on the uh, also a page on the Legal Farm blog where you can keep up to date with uh, everything that we're doing with the Pasha Council at Long Ranges. So thank you very much. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Rob, Fernando. We'll be going for drinks and everyone is invited. So if you want to go for a drink, please follow them. 
Um, and yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. <clears throat> Good one.